Hello, good morning. Um, I think we should uh, get started. So if you would please take a seat and I will... Uh... Good, so um, welcome to this uh, conference hosted by uh, the Fine Art Network Project. Uh, the first, of course, uh, on-site event that this uh, network is hosting, which has been uh, active for over a year. Um, we have uh, a very interesting program uh, to uh, follow today. But uh, before I say anything more, I want to ask uh, Jon Atli Bendison, rector of this university, to come up here and open the conference. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Jon, for introducing me. It's a great pleasure to be with you here today. And, uh, I remember back in 2019 when it was announced that three colleagues from the University of Iceland, uh, Jón, Björn and uh, Benedikt, uh, were participating in this project. Uh, I was delighted to see that. And uh, myself, um, I'm in a different field, but I have uh, experienced uh, uh, obtaining Marie Curie grants and know, I know they are excellent. And uh, I know here you have 11 <coughs> PhD students involved. And uh, for them, it is extremely important to participate in the Marie Curie grants and uh, the network created by here four partner institutions and seven associate partners, if I understand this correctly, will be invaluable for the students. I know COVID has been difficult for all of us, uh, but we are fighting through it. And I know it has been extremely difficult for um, the students going from one institution to another during COVID. But uh, I think in a few years, we will just remember the good things. But I think that's important. But um, I would like to welcome you also to the University of Iceland. And the University of Iceland is now celebrating 110 years this, uh, this school year. And uh, just to give you a brief history, very, very brief, uh, the university started uh, in 1911 prior to Iceland gaining sovereignty. So it was in many ways to establish a university here an important vehicle in the independence uh, struggle for the University of Iceland. For, the Iceland. for Iceland, I should say, but not for the University of Iceland. But um, uh, the university at the beginning was uh, located in the house of the parliament, downtown Reykjavik. It's a beautiful building. It was in the first floor, four faculties, uh, theology, medicine, law, and philosophy. And at that time, the university had only had 45 students, 44 males, uh, one female. Uh, and uh, uh, we can say it was very limited. And in the opening speech, the inaugural speech from the first rector of the university, Björn M. Olsen, he stated, this is perhaps the tiniest university in the world, but we strive to become a player in the world in the university to be on the university map in the world and we can say that uh, we have achieved that for example by participating in this network to be a player to uh, connect to people all over the world to work with universities all over the world and um, we I can point another step in the history of the university in 1940 the university moved here and this was the building. This was supposed to be the building for the university to host, house everything here for the university. And uh, now, this is 1940, now it's uh, 
2022, we have more than 30 buildings. So we have spread. And currently, the University of Iceland has about 16,000 students, uh, two-thirds are female, one-third male. Uh, we have about 2,000 faculty and staff. We collaborate with universities all over the world. And I would like to say that international collaboration is key for the University of Iceland. We serve Icelandic society, but we also serve the world. And without international collaboration, we would not be doing, doing very well. So this is very important. And to participate in projects like this, it is very important for the university. And I would like to say, when we talk about the art, we have uh, uh, our art collection uh, here, we are very proud of. But we are also engaging more with society here in Iceland. And um, for example, yesterday we had this terrific rock concert here in this hall. This is the ceremonial hall, very sacred, but we are changing this. And this is open to everyone. You can find it on the internet, Hauskola Tonlekar, University Concerts. And the group Solstavir was here. And uh, we have a terrific team that records these concerts and we have participation from all over the world. But uh, for the project, I, I very much congratulate you on the project. And uh, I'm very proud of this. And I see the colors of Wolverhampton Wanderers. Uh, it's important um, for me. I'm a, I have been following English uh, football for many, many years. But I will not tell you which team I support. You might not like it. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's very nice. And um, my final point here is that uh, I know that two of the universities, two of the partners here, are uh, from the UK. And uh, I'm a strong supporter of Stick to Science, that uh, we want to have the European research area for everyone. We need collaboration with UK universities. I'm currently the president of Aurora, the Aurora University Network, which has at the moment, two UK universities, East Anglia and Aberdeen. And uh, we, f we see with the U European University Initiative and so forth, and with, our, with Brexit, uh, the UK universities are not as involved as before, but we need them. So uh, I hope things will settle. So thank you very much. Have a great conference. Um, I, I know you have a terrific uh, program ahead, so thank you. Thank you, Jon Atli. Um, <clears throat> so let me now introduce our first speaker, um, uh, Fatin Farhat. <clears throat> uh, has for a number of years, number of years, been active on the. Palestinian cultural scene, in <clears throat> cultural development, cultural policy, and in, in management of, of cultural and artistic programs. Uh, she has also served as the director of the Ramallah Cultural Department. She is currently uh, a PhD researcher uh, in cultural policy at the University of Hildesheim in Germany, uh, and she is involved in many kinds of cultural research through foundations such as the Young Arab Theatre Fund, the European Cultural Foundation and UNESCO. We will uh, uh, have respondents come up and briefly respond to all of the talks. And uh, Fatin's respondent is Claude Nassar, who is like the other respondents, one of our PhD students, who I should actually call ECRs to follow the, uh, the, uh, the vocabulary of the project, which means early career researcher. So, so Claude is, is one of the four early career researchers who will be respondents today. I'm not going to introduce you specifically, so you just come up once Fatin has finished her talk. And then I hope we'll have some time for discussion and questions after your response. So Fatin, please. I do this with my laptop. Okay. Um, let me just, yeah. 
Good morning, and uh, I have to say that this is the first time I stand in front of a public since before the pandemic. So if I'm, I'm a bit nervous, uh, bear with me. I want to start my presentation today uh, by paying tribute to my sister Lubna. She's up on the screen. Uh, Lubna is leading a coalition of all leftist parties in Palestine today to the Ramallah municipality elections. Uh, voting started at 7 o'clock. It will end uh, at 7 in the evening. She's only 39. She's an interpreter who is in love with languages and what comes along, the culture that comes along with languages. She's a mother of two girls, a social leader who has been all her life affiliated with a local dance company. So yes, although art does not solve the world's problems, uh, it can contribute to, to transforming individuals' lives. I've seen this throughout my career, and I did see this with my sister, Lubna. Um, also, as you probably know, I was not in intended <laughs> to give the first presentation to be the keynote speaker. And I thought to myself when I received Ellen's email and proposal yesterday when I was in Frankfurt the day before, if I can bring three girls all the way from Palestine to Iceland to see the Northern Lights, I could probably go first. So, <laughs> And one last disclaimer, uh, I'm not an academic. I was humbled yesterday to be among uh, the brilliant minds of academics. But I'm an art practitioner, manager, researcher, who works on the ground. I spent all of my life working with social, cultural, uh, artistic movements on the ground, not only in Palestine, but across the Arab region. I do research to inform my practice and that of my colleagues and to enhance our tools. So uh, this is very important um, point to start with. So this presentation, Syrian artists outside Syria, conflicts, challenges, and possibilities, um, comes in the context of my ongoing research, artistic research practice, which examines the conditions, realities, social and political contexts that affect displaced artists, art, art initiatives and collectives immediately post -dis displacement and in the years that follow, in the few years that follow. This interest developed as a result of almost 25 years of professional experience working in the cultural field in Palestine and in neighboring Arab countries, confronting questions of creativity, displacement, uh, during politically un, um, turbulent times, out of a necessity flowing from the Israeli occupation of Palestine. I said it yesterday and I say it today. I've only worked in a cultural sector in an unstable environment. I don't know how, <laughs> how it works in stable environments. The only experience I have is working in politically um, uh, um, charged areas. Um, so this essay takes Syrian artists and initiatives as its main subject of investigation, drawing parallels, synergies, and contracts between the three art projects that I will talk about in, in, in this presentation. And finally, as you all know, um, the world is no longer occupied with Syria. Um, political politics changes so fast. Now the war against Ukraine is taking the front page stage for right and obvious reasons. But I think that my presentation today might in fact raise some issues and themes that could be relevant to the different parallel conversations that we're having now, also in Europe, on the issue of the role of artists in, in, in times of conflict. So I will go back to a little bit of history to refresh our memories. I'm sure that most of you know it. But in March 2011, anti-government protests swept across many Arab countries in what later became known as the Arab Spring. It was you know, the, the moment of joy and, and happiness in the Arab region. Syrians started a peaceful protest demanding political change after decades of oppressive rule. After the kidnapping, torture, and killing of boys in Dara, a small village in Syria, for anti-government graffiti writing, the protest expanded and, and spread across all of Syria. A few days into the demonstration, Syrian President Bashar al-Assad ordered the military to attack the protesters, and the violence escalated. Since the onset of the 2011 Syrian revolution, years of armed conflict have left hundreds of thousands dead and wounded. Moreover, of the estimated 22 million <coughs> Syrians living in the country in 2011, more than five 0.5 million have become refugees in Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey, and neighboring other countries 
ultimately the whole world. Um, in addition, six more million were displaced within the country itself, inside Syria. So the destruction of Syria's cultural infrastructure, which resulted as a result of the conflict, the dispersal of thousands of emerging and established artists, and the increased censorship, have all negatively affected the, the cultural ecosystem in the country, forcing yet more artists to flee. The fear caused by the control of the Islamic State, which was born a few years after the revolution, uh, and other political Islamist movements, um, cannot be underestimated because it kind of polarized society and even the Arab uh, world as a whole, as if we had two options, either to stand with dictatorship or to align with Islamists, as if there were, it was made to, to appear as if there was not a third path for, for us as Arabs to choose. Syrian cities went, that, went, uh, that underwent heavy shelling have lost many of their cultural facilities as well as their architectural and archaeological sites. The impact of the resulting migration of artists and initiatives is significant in Syrian cities. There are, there are as of now, yet no statistics, exact statistics, for the number of Syrian artists, writers, cultural managers, and producers who left Syria between 2011 and, and until now. However, it must be very high if one looks at the vast number of Syrian plays, films, publications, and concerts that have been produced, organized, and showcased outside Syria since 2011. Unbelievable, every day. Um, initially, Syrian artists took refuge in neighboring Arab countries, such as Jordan and Lebanon, Egypt, and also uh, Turkey, assuming that their departure was temporary. Everybody thought that uh, Syria will follow the suit of Tunisia and uh, Egypt, and Bashar al-Assad will finally um, deserve, gets what he deserves. Uh, sorry, for me, this is very emotional. Um, yet, this did not happen. And Syrian artists found themselves being unable to return to their countries. Due to the limited work opportunities in these countries, the Arab countries that they've had to displace to, and sometimes with long-term residency plans in place, many Syrian artists dispersed around the rest of the world, including Europe. If you go to Berlin now, um, as I think Berlin is the city that hosts most of the Syrian artists um, in exile. My friend and researcher and curator, Jumana al Yassiri, um, who contributed to this research, had eloquently um, described the challenges of Syrian artists outside Syria. Geographical distance from Syria and events ranging, uh, rage, raging within, the stigma of helplessness in the wake of a disaster, a complete restructuring of social and professional dynamic to which they were accustomed, bureaucratic complexities to receive permanent residences and work, permits, foreign languages and different backgrounds and many more were among the challenges that had to face Syrian artists post the revolution. <clears throat> So while the dispersal of Syrian artists outside the country has repositioned Syria in the international art scene, I think prior to um, 2011, little knowledge was known about Syrian artists. It also exposed the art, these artists to significant vulnerabilities separated from their usual networks and work environments. And the artists had to rebuild their tools and their uh, networks to be able to work again. It should be noted that there is an intense debate on the terminology used to describe the events of what happened in Syria from 2011 until now. So we hear terms like revolution, crisis, civil war, conflict, and others that are used uh, by politicians, artists, researchers, and civilians depending on their political views. I choose to use the word revolution uh, because I think that, for me, this is the truth. Uh, so. So I'm going to tell you the story of, uh, I'm going to talk about some themes and some uh, issues that characterize uh, the work of Syrian artists post-2011 through three different case studies. Okay? Um, let me go to the case studies so that I don't take a lot of... Uh... The three projects chosen to anchor this presentation offer compelling points of departure with which to understand the trajectories of Syrian art practice since 2011. 
Rooted in distinct but often interconnected artistic disciplines and practices, the projects represent um, different responses to a shared context of dispersal and displacement. As they adopted to new living and working conditions, the practitioners driving these projects um, have piloted new forms of collaborations, productions, and artistic practices, in turn, in, 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 in turn generating new narratives, frameworks, and forms of community involvement and, um, and new publics. So, I'll talk at the beginning about Masrah Ensemble. Masrah Ensemble is a Beirut-based nonprofit theater organization that also fosters critical discourse and research around theater with a particular focus on the Arab region. It was established in 2009 by a Syrian, but before the revolution. And it brings together uh, a mix of professionals and amateur um, young people from the community of diverse backgrounds to work together. Um, Masrah Ensemble's audience are generally very diverse, performing for citizens, youth, refugees, migrant workers, that Ensemble aims to, ch to challenge prevailing ideas of what theater should be, where it should take place, and to whom it should belong. So it's more of a community theater that is based on professional uh, experience. Launched in 2015, the Family Tijan project was specifically designed to encourage social cohesion between refugee and immigrant youth at, and Beirut society at large. From the onset, this is, um, these are some photos uh, from the project. Uh, from the outset, the ensemble's idea was to create a theat a theat a theatrical adaptation in which refugee and immigrant youth could join and cast as actors and perform in public settings throughout Beirut. Based on a Western Indian folktale about brothers who seek to empower the devil, the classic Tijan and his brothers was chosen for how strongly in its themes uh, of political adversity, survival, and resistance resonate with the reality of the people in Beirut. Um, not only uh, uh, Syrian refugees, but also Palestinian refugees and minorities working uh, in Beirut. Collaboration with the residents of Shatila, uh, refugee camp was central to the development of the production. Shatila is a Palestinian, I, I, I guess most of you know the Sabran Shatila massacres. Um, it's a refugee camp, it's one of the biggest refugee camps outside Palestine, and it does not only host Palestinian refugees, but now also Syrian refugees and other po uh, poor minorities uh, uh, who live in uh, in Lebanon, established in, two, in 1948 in the aftermath of the Palestinian Nakba, the camp is currently home to Palestinian refugees, poor Lebanese and Syrian immigrants, as well as other immigrants from uh, the Middle East and South Asia. Okay, so these are some photos from the from this project. The other project that I'm basing my analysis on is Page's uh, Bookshop Cafe which took place or happened in two cities, Istanbul and in Amsterdam. So Pages is an independent cultural institution committed to publishing theater, cinema, music, children's literature, education. It was founded by Syrian publisher Samir Qadiri, who had directed a small publishing house in Syria uh, before the revolution. Uh, the project was implemented in two phases, first in Istanbul from 2013 until 2017, and then in Amsterdam from 2017 until 2018. Um, the bookshop and cafe also operated as publishing houses, introducing novels by young Syrian and Arab writers, all, um, yeah. The project was born uh, and shaped, as I said, by Qadiri. Um, and th the story of how the project was developed is really interesting, because in 2012, Qadiri was in Abu Dhabi attending a book fair when he learned that the uh, Ba'ath authorities raided his house and threatened that if he would come back, he would be arrested. So what he had to do is move to Amman. And from Amman, his family, his wife and his two daughters were um, helped to get out of Syria. They spent a few um, months in Amman, and then they moved to Istanbul. Uh, and there, uh, it was when he started the, the project with the collaboration of friends and supporters. So within two years of working in Istanbul, Pages organized more than 150 art workshops for children and more uh, than 200 musical events. The space also had its own theater called uh, Tabashir, 
where visitors were uh, taught to write and produce plays, also in Arabic, guitar and oud classes were provided uh, to young people, and more than 60 um, literary events were organized and so on. And the public was um, Syrian refugees as well as tourists and the people of Istanbul. The Amsterdam branch was opened in 2017, and yet again as a result of a catastrophe that happened in, to the artist's family. So in 2016, uh, Qadiri was uh, invited by the Prince Klaus to attend uh, the award in uh, ceremony in Amsterdam. And then he was denied when he was there, as he tried to go back to Turkey, he was denied entry back to Turkey. And his wife was arrested by the Turks and imprisoned. And then <clears throat> after months, he managed to, um, to apply for political asylum in the Netherlands and he was granted refugee status, and they managed to get his family again from Istanbul uh, to Amsterdam. And in the context of his research, I was doing um, some research in Istanbul, and then I went to Amsterdam to meet Sa uh, Samer. I transported with me the last of his family's luggage, um, because you know he had left at Russia and he needed some help. So this is the second project uh, that we will be talking about, I'll be talking about. The third, these are images from pages in Istanbul. The third is the Visual Arts uh, Festival Damascus, which is a festival that was implemented in three editions in three different cities between 2010 and 2011. It was launched in Damascus in 2010 to provide a platform for meeting and debate and was intended to encourage uh, and facilitate exchange between young artists, uh, Syrian artists, um, and Arab artists and international artists, which was a very rare opportunity because at the time, uh, the, the cultural sector was completely dominated by the government. So there were only small initiatives that, um, that were uh, representing the independent art scene. And then, of course, the festival became nomadic in 2011, and uh, it was hosted in 2012 by the International Film Festival Rotterdam as part of the Power Cut Middle East convening. And in 2013, uh, the edition, an edition was hosted in Istanbul, a program of exhibitions, screenings, talks, uh, as you can see, uh, was chosen to host the festival uh, for several, and, and Istanbul was used for several reasons, one of which is the physical proximity to Damascus and also the, the, the desire to raise awareness about Syrian culture in, in, in Turkey, where the number of Syrian refugees was, uh, was uh, increasing. Again, the interesting thing about this case as well is that when the festival was supposed to convene in Turkey, it was a few days before the opening protest had erupted throughout Turkey in response to the government's plan to replace a uh, park in Taksim with a shopping mall. <laughs> so suddenly there was a revolution that was taking place at the main venue of the festival, which in a way um, impacted the program, of course, the flow of the program, but created another momentum. Again, the issue of revolution was brought again into the festival that was trying to escape revolution per se. Um, so. This leads us to the concept of revolution uh, in these, um, that uh, one of the themes that Syrian artists until now, even 12 years after the revolution, are constantly uh, discovering. Uh, let me show you some photos also from, the, from Istanbul. So the concept of revolution flooded the Visual Arts Festival Damascus. To be sure, all pieces that were presented by Syrian artists dealt with the revolution and displacement. Although the festival cur curators did not, uh, uh, had not chosen a specific theme to the festival, yeah, the artists themselves presented works that, revo the, that uh, were centered around the theme of revolution. Madonna Adib's love um, his, her piece, Love in Time and War, was presented as a revolt, in her own words, against fear, anger, alarm, and the presence of death, the heavy presence of death. Another example is Masaset Metti, uh, who showed uh, their group, collective, who were working online, who showed episodes from the Top Gun Diaries, a web-based series of finger puppet theater. The episodes expressed the collective's criticism of the Syrian regime and the violence towards the population. 
Um, so again, it's, it's interesting. The curators never imposed any theme, but mo all the artworks that came from Syrian artists were about the revolution. Uh, and as said before, the, the revolution also made its way into the fabric of the festival itself as the Istanbul ri ri riots exploded. Uh, just as the festival was about to open, immediately the Turkish artists who were involved in the project uh, took the streets and the Syrian artists and Arab artists who were actually participating uh, also joined them. The Pages Bookstore Cafe project is slightly different in its approach to the revolution, as the project was implemented over two different time frames in two different cities, uh, one closer to Damascus, one, Damascus, one more, uh, more distant. The project's evolution illustrates a shift of how the revolution was viewed. Um, when the project was opened in 2013, the revolution was still underway and it was consuming the founders' thoughts and results and concerns. And there was a sense of urgency in the initial artistic program. Uh, the multiple artworks that uh, were showcased, uh, roundtables and so on to celebrate the revolution per se. Later in Amsterdam in 2017, the founders were already fit fatigued anyway from the amount of hassle they had to endure to get to Amsterdam. And the audiences changed, and as a result, um, uh, the, 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 the focus of the program a bit changed. Um, and while it remained uh, focused on Syria, the program also involved artists from non-Syrian backgrounds working on a variety of themes. So the revolution was less present as it was present in Damascus. Um, the program in Amsterdam tried to be more inclusive and assuming that the public had little knowledge or less knowledge than the public in Istanbul about the situation. Another theme that was present, that is present until now in many of uh, Syrian artistic works and initiatives is trauma and loss, of course. On the other right, uh, on the other side of spectrum, of the spectrum of revolution are trauma and loss. Artists have depicted the trauma that still haunts them in several ways, both through the visual art and theater. Some have collected stories of survival, while others have chosen to address war, destruction, and loss directly. Regardless of the means used for artists, these works represent a channel of reflection on the painful lived experience. What happened in Syria in a very short amount of time uh, with, with the... With the, with the unbelievable amount of violence was used. Um, until now, I feel that my Syrian artist friends are still unstable and, and not still ready to even address their own emotions of, of trauma and loss. And this is very much reflected in a lot of their artwork. The Family Tijan project mobilized participants, again, around a text uh, that dealt with life experience. The children who were invited to participate in the theatrical uh, play uh, Palestinian and Syrian and Lebanese and other were encouraged to contemplate questions such, uh, such as what is the story about for you as a person? Some of the main themes that emerged were the love of a mother for her children and the experience of forced displacement. Like the characters of the Tijan family, some of the actors had been confronted with the loss of their own homes, um, family members and country with exile, violence and the loss of hope. The project, uh, when I interviewed the kids, worked a bit with the kids, to them it created a safe space in which they could deal for the first time with these painful memories. Kids refrained from talking about their emotions in front of their families uh, because they knew that their families were suffering. So this project created a safe space at least for kids to cry and to share experiences and, uh, and so on. Again, the bad luck of <laughs> Syrians and perhaps the projects that I work on um, as the project was developing uh, and rehearsals were underway, Ala Eddin Muhammad Muhammad, um, the 24-year-old production manager from Syria, drowned in the Sea of Babylon. <laughs> um, and this actually uh, was really difficult for the whole group that was actually addressing the issue of trauma and loss. And uh, and again, the people who were in charge of the project had to create mechanisms 
for the kids to share emotions. Again, instead of, you know, as they were on the way of successfully of creating some safe spaces, they were faced again with this issue of trauma and loss. And um, so, Pages Book Store Cafe's artistic pre uh, um, program, again, um, aimed to create community that would collectively help Syrian refugees beyond presenting Syrian culture and also to try to give a space for reconciliation with the past for Syrian audiences, whether in Amsterdam or in Istanbul. This was always in the background of the founders. Uh, one of the ways that the, the, the cafe did this was by creating, as I said before, a theater group for youth, teaching them professional um, acting techniques, but also helping them deal with this issue of trauma and loss that are suppressed and, again, are not shared by family. Um, another theme that is very relevant uh, in the Syrian context is home and alienation. Places, spaces, and their stories emerge as core elements in most of the artworks reviewed for this research. Masrah Ensemble chose to work with the text in recognition of these themes with its focus on family stories. The play could help the participating community of artists to articulate their own definitions of home, both physical uh, space and, sim uh, and symbolic spaces. One of the exercises that, um, that the kids had to, um, to draw uh, for in the context of this, uh, of this project was to draw an image of, uh, of the perfect houses, and most of them, like 90% of them, drew windows because living in refugee camps, they had, you know, crammed in small houses. And their own memory of what a house uh, is uh, was a window. Um, okay. And the concept of home was also vivid in the artistic program of the Visual Arts Festival Damascus. In the distance between an old home and a new home, stories of conflict, nostalgia, and adaptation are born. Su'dud Kadan, I don't know if you know her, but she's a famous uh, Kurdish, uh, she's a, she's a female Kurdish Syrian uh, filmmaker, described this conflict of dealing with home in the following way. She's a filmmaker and she was producing a film on Syria. And she said to me, as a filmmaker, my main occupation remains Syria, uh, now lost to me. How do, you, how do you do a project on Damascus when you no longer have access to Damascus, to the city? Are there other cities and streets that resemble Damascus? Suddenly one is obliged to, create, to recreate Syria as a compromise. Another theme that I would like to address is the concept of nomadic artists. Uh, it's, it's really interesting because most of my Syrian artist friends consider themselves as nomads now. In tandem with the Syrians' dispersal across the globe, the term nomadic artist has thrived in the discourse on Syrian art. It is used both by artists themselves as well as practitioners, curators, and researchers, Syrian and non-Syrian alike. Uh, these artists call themselves nomadic, generally consider their new dwellings as temporary homes. Uh, when I did this research, I think now it might have shifted a bit because of the time lapse, and many of the artists have received uh, the citizenship of other countries. But for the majority of artists who were involved in these three projects, uh, uh, their new dwellings were temporary. They were not, in their mindset, they were not permanent. Um, as Samir Qadiri stated in one of our interviews, Syrian artists still seem to think of themselves as being in transit. Uh, another artist told me that we feel like we're in, a hotel, we're in an airport transit uh, room, smoking room in, a hotel, in an airport where we're waiting to go um, to the next stop. Uh, although many of them are now working uh, in new cities, they are not yet, they are not yet comfortable with, the new, with their new social uh, environment or new artistic tools. Um, the projects, their projects, most of the projects we talked about this yesterday are, not, uh, are never long term because of funding conditions and because of, uh, and so on. And uh, yeah. The Visual Arts Festival Damascus itself is a nomadic event, as we've seen. It moved through three different cities, not one, to follow Syrian artists. 
Um, when one compares the participating artists' locations at the time of the festival with their original places of birth, it is notable that all Syrian artists were living outside Syria in 2013, whether it was in um, Europe or Canada, or in one of the Arab countries that were politically stable at the time. Um, for other participate, participating artists, they had uh, either settled outside their countries or were in regular transit between their cities um, and other cities around the world. And I have to say here that m many of the artists I in that are involved in the projects are also Palestinian Syrian artists who have gone through uh, a Nakba twice. So this is their second dispersal after they were uh, kicked out of Palestine in 1948. Okay. So, maybe here it's a good to pause and speak a bit about the role of artists as social change uh, agents in the context of the Syrian question. So living in un undemocratic political systems for the longest time, artists and intellectuals in the Arab region and in Syria in particular have not traditionally been active agents in their societies. With the independent cultural scene left with no space to flourish, artistic work had little impact on communities. Uh, in addition, Syrian artists have been faced with another complexity, the pressure to align themselves along with either the secular or the Islamic uh, divide. Yeah? So you either stand by this side or on the other side. Uh, according to Basman Husseini, who is the founder of Action for Hope, which is an organization that offers, uh, that works um, in artistic development only with refugees, Syrian and Iraqi refugees, as well as Palestinians, Artists find themselves in the middle of this conflict, siding consciously or marked as so by media with the secular side. Yeah? Consequently, they are considered hostile to conservative Islam. Popular perception of artists and intellectuals belonging to the elite, are belonging to the elite, it's still in the Arab region, also contribute to their stigmatization. Indeed, as Husseini suggests, the image creates a class divide by suggesting that artists and cultural activists do not understand the hardships of the common man. These trends, trends changed significantly after 2011. The Arab Spring carried hope that it would be possible to create pluralistic and inclusive political systems, cultural systems, whereby motivating societies to reorganize. In the case of Syria, this discussion around the social and political role of the artist occurred mostly outside Syria and not inside Syria, among displaced artists. It's almost impossible to have these conversations in Syria. Uh, now, almost all the artist interviews in the context of the research view themselves as agent of social change, with strong ethical responsibilities towards their communities and toward other Syrian artists and art organizations. One thing that we have to remember also is the change in, pub in public. Uh, uh, another significant change is how public, uh, the perception of the public that attends cultural or is engaged with cultural in activities has changed. The majority of displaced uh, Syrians live in isolated refugee camps or in small communities outside uh, major urban settings. Uh, with few exceptions, most migrant communities have been isolated from the services and cultural activities provided by their host countries uh, uh, and or fellow migrants. Like in Jordan, you see Syrian refugees isolated in refugee camps where they cannot get out. I had an interview in a, with a kid in Al-Azraq refugee camp in Jordan, Syrian refugee camp, and he didn't know what a sheep was because he had never seen a sheep in his life. Uh, because he was contained inside the camp. Uh, so um, so this, is, this is really critical because artists did not only lose their, um, um, their context, but also their audiences. And the audiences uh, uh, lost also what they were used to. Um, I'm going to be, go faster so that we... Uh, one thing that is very interesting about all, uh, about all these, um, about these three projects and also other Syrian projects that I'm working and involved with is that um, none of them, unfortunately, could create direct or strong links with art artists inside Syria. And this is a problem now, uh, as we see that the development of artists outside Syria and the questions that they're asking and the way they're working is completely different than the artists, a few artists who remain in Syria. There exists a great polarization between the inside and the outside of Syria among Syrian artists and intellectuals that escalates day by day until now. 
leading to severe divisions that often amount to accusations of treason and estrangements and leave a kind of isolation from both sides. And unfortunately, this is also reinforced with the tendencies of funders, yeah, again to the issue of funders, who tend to support, to divide their financial support between the inside and outside of Syria, of course, or uh, in favor of the outside of Syria. Um, okay. Do I have time? Okay. I just want to end with concluding remarks to allow um, space for conversation. Uh, the permanency, impact, and creativity of the three projects um, that I talked about in this presentation can be, can be actually attributed to the strong dedication and determination of the people who directed them. Uh, artists acting as curators, acting as managers, who found ways to overcome limited resources and institutional support. Uh, it's, it strikes me as, as really very vivid and strong that most of the projects that I work with with uh, Syrian artists are, are actually continuing or succeeding, quote unquote, because there are dedicated people behind them, not because of the conditions. The conditions are really difficult and poor, yet there are dedicated persons behind them who have since the revolution realized that artists have a role not only to exhibit in beautiful galleries in Damascus, but to contribute to, to social change. Um, the Family Tijan project was uh, made possible by professional theater makers who are dedicated to social change and to working with immigrant and marginalized communities. And as we, pro we probably know, that there's a lot of racism against Syrian refugees and Palestinian refugees in Lebanon. So this was a particularly important uh, uh, tool is to integrate, um, uh, to, to not only address Syrian and, and Palestinian artists, but also local communities. Um, for the founders of the Pages Bookstore Cafe, personal and professional trajectories intersected, shaping the course of the project of its development, um, showing that at a certain point that there is really no division uh, between uh, people's choices and the political context and the professional choices that they make. Um, and their story is really sad. Um, and the insistence of the crea curators of the Visual Art Damascus Festival, who are uh, French and a German woman, by the way, who are not Syrian, uh, to go to Istanbul to insist with the 2013 edition, also in spite of limi limited resources, is also another testimony of the de dedication of the people behind the project. Um, Okay. The three projects further make it clear that these art initiatives have the intellectual capacities and strategic ambition to do far more than representing the plight of, of Syrian people. And this is very important to keep in mind. Uh, they are evidence of a high degree of resilience and adaptability to new environments, of an advanced sense of aesthetics and of access to professional networks and solidarity movements. All of these skills are called on to ensure that artists are recognized for their own merit and on their own terms, not because they perform as professional Syrians uh, and can be reduced to the political parameters of the struggle in Syria. The risk of becoming professional Syrians, that's a term that I've played a lot with uh, because we were professional Palestinians also before we got invited to events because we were Palestinians, not because we were good artists or good curators. And this, I've seen this also happen with, uh, with the Syrians. Uh, the risk of becoming professional Syrians will remain as long as the conflict continues and surely beyond uh, that time as well. But many artists and practitioners are already aware of this, uh, of this danger. As the value of their cultural contribution to their new host cities are being recognized, they will be able to better ne negotiate terms of conditions of their work. What matters now is to have platforms to continue this passionate, vital, and highly important debate among Syrian uh, artists and Syrians and artists and, uh, in their host communities, and also with um, funders and spaces associated with them. It is imperative that Syrian artists and art practitioners embark on an inner Syrian dialogue. This has been missing. There's a lot of dialogue and discussion among Syrians outside Syria, but with inside Syria, this is not happening. 
and that they develop their projects with a fine ear to the needs and desire of Syrian artists, practitioners, and organizations. Um, I'm talking here about an internal dialogue that includes Syrian artists and researchers who have chosen to remain in Syria. Uh, some possibilities may, resi may reside with long-term, careful, and multidimensional collaborations between support uh, organizations from Syria, the Middle East, and Europe, and Syrian artists and European art professionals. Together, and in support to the priorities identified by the Syrian artists and, and publics, they could invent and imagine new tools, different activities, and courageous strategies to help sustain and cultivate the attention currently given to displaced Syrians in order to cultivate a fertile field of practitioners, art practitioners outside Syria. The artistic movement that is being formed outside the country is creating a strong and independent artistic scene, one that embodies the, the spirit of civil society movement, uh, all, wa all uh, the while drawing on the strength of regional and international partnership. I believe that this movement could very well be instrumental to future reconciliation processes uh, within Syria. Thank you. Good morning. First, I want to start by thanking Fatin for today's talk, but also for yesterday's contribution in the workshop. And I want to mention some points that I really appreciated and what you have said, and uh, maybe move into a question to perhaps open it up for more discussions. So I want to start by uh, going back to something you mentioned first, uh, by talking about working in the cult in cultural sectors and unstable environments. And uh, maybe think about the importance of working in such environments to highlight the importance of art as a political practice, where in places where life is not guaranteed, then art necessarily becomes uh, a matter of life. Um, and you may, maybe mentioned that in relation to the, to a, to the revolution in Syria, um, through talking about the momentum of the revolution, but also escaping the revolution, or maybe maintaining the momentum by sharing effects or knowledge, knowledges. So I, what I appreciated in the projects that you have presented is this feeling of a political network that is rooted in art, artistic practices that connects the struggles that initiated the dispersion of these artists to the spaces that they left to, and uh, which I think they are a set of practices that you described as nomadic, and I think the artists themselves describe as nomadic. So I, I imagine that these trans transnational networks of solidarity in the face of interconnected and shared struggles offer a stepping stone to imagine or even into a world beyond the conventional national politics that upholds colonial structures through the appropriation of emancipatory, emancipatory labor into the nation as a neoliberal unit. But you already have mentioned some challenges to that where we start to see a discrepancy or polarization between the artists inside and the artists outside the spaces of conflict. And mainly this is due to funding structures in, uh, in the places where these artists go to. So mainly in places of non-conflict where art is considered to be a, uh, maybe at the border of politics. But the question that I would maybe also to mention, I appreciate the high, you highlighting the transitory aspect of these practices. And I, th I think it's really nice to think about this, the effect of uh, perpetual transitory time on the production of artistic practice, how this continuous moment of interregnum affects what is produced 
uh, and the politics of what is produced. But perhaps what I wanted to ask, and I know that this is an incomplete question, but does art in the confines of the nation have the same emancipatory potential as art produced by people in displaced and unpure belonging? Um, which I think you have answered this partly in your talk. Um, but we also had this conversation yesterday, and uh, I think it will be interesting to maybe hear what you think or what others might have to say about this. Thank you. Thank you, Claude, and thanks, Fatin. Uh, we have uh, a few minutes for uh, questions, and I guess Fatin might want to start with responding to Claude's comment. Okay, all right. Yeah, sorry. Um, so I will start addressing the issue of uh, the polarization between the inside and the outside. Um, this is a very important issue because it's, the polarization actually transcends Syrian artists and includes Arab artists as well and Arab intellectuals. And whereas the artists outside Syria had opportunities uh, to... Um, of exposure, of being able to speak freely without censorship, of actually mobilizing in civil society organizations for the first time in their lives, and also um, developing their own tools and practices and being exposed to new theories and so on. The artists inside Syria have not had these um, opportunities. So the debate is not only political but also technical now be because the, the, the two uh, people on uh, the, the artists on, on each uh, end have different tools of communication, and we see that as a mentor. I mentor sometimes artists um, doing the practical research and and so on, and I also sit as a juror on different uh, uh, funding grants for art, and I see the quality and the the presentation and the tools used inside Syria as, as very weak. So the problem uh, is not, it is political for sure. Um, we have to remember that there are a few artists who are not with the regime, but who come from families who have leverage and support from the re regime who decided to stay in Syria. A few of them, but really fantastic ones, who um, can speak against the regime, but with, with, with limitation. But for the most part, the artists who stayed are the ones who were affiliated with public entities. And, and that's, that's exactly what makes the discussion very difficult. And, 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 and I feel now that um, maybe it's not the right moment to initiate these conversations. I know these conversations are very important, but I feel that um, maybe more time should be given and space for artists to reflect before uh, a real process of conversation uh, happens. So it's political, but it also has to do with the tools that the artists have acquired outside Syria in the last 10 years. You want to ask? It was me. <laughs> it was me, I just. <clears throat> Thank you for this uh, very... Yeah, my name is Alexey Pins, and I'm part of this fine art project. Uh, uh, and yeah, some other projects as well, <laughs> uh, 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 and many more. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, just a uh, uh, question about uh, because your main um, uh, uh, it was a very very insightful uh, presentation, and I was really, by many reasons, of course. Uh, interested in uh, the topic, I was just thinking about uh, how this uh, uh, kind of war and uh, civil conflict, or you call it revolution, uh, somehow 
uh, brings definitely this tremendous amount of uh, destruction, negativity, loss, uh, kind of uh, displacement, all these things which somehow were even praised like two decades ago, like in postmodern culture, nomadism, uh, kind of uh, this sort of um, in kind of different cosmopolitan way, etc. But I was also thinking, does this somehow brings? Uh, of course, it's just this destruction, negativity, loss, etc. But at the same time, I thought maybe in a way we can look at this uh, from the point of view: what are those new elements co constituted by this situation? And you already reflected about this. So this, from being kind of inside of Syria, artists were somehow pushed to be more international, to create more international connections, etc. So even this extremely violent, negative, etc. kind of event somehow pushes uh, in kind of this sort of paradoxical way artists to be uh, more, um, more exposed to uh, this sort of international scene, etc. Et so, so I was just thinking about the strange effects of this. The similarly, for example, in terms of being kind of recognized internationally, being visible, etc. In the same uh, way, I was thinking about recent uh, kind of, uh, I don't remember the work of this probably Syrian artist who put this Ukrainian flag on the ruined wall of the building saying that in the light of current light of this Ukrainian devastation, war, etc., Syrian uh, kind of events uh, which were not as covered by international media were somehow became more recognized and visible perhaps. So this making these conne connections, etc. So again, this sort of extreme negativity and conflict uh, at the different part of the globe somehow brings kind of maybe dialectically to uh, kind of visibility and recognition some other. So I just was thinking about this rather comment and the question was thinking about this kind of connections and uh, strange uh, effects which are not necessarily negative but somehow create some new elements within the same art situation. Um, I won't say a lot except that uh, some, when I work on Syria and once, I'm sorry, I'm really sick today, so <laughs> um, uh, when I work on Syrian projects or Syrian related uh, research or articles, I have to refrain myself from also expressing joy. <laughs> yeah? yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, and when I was writing this piece, it's actually a small part of a book, of a chapter in a book by the European Cultural Foundation. The editor was, uh, was always, um, uh, Karen Cooney, as I think you know her, she was mentioned yesterday. She was always reminding me, Fatin, you're celebrating Syrian artists outside Syria too much. You're using terminology that has a lot of joy and celebration. Think of it <laughs> uh, once and twice, because in fact, in fact, in spite of all this intensity and loss and, and uh, new tools were created and new opportunities were open to to Syrian artists. And I think um, now, after years from the revolution and the, the hardcore violence, I think even artists themselves and organizations are more able to go beyond the destruction and see... Um, not to rejoice because there's no rejoice, there's nothing really happy about what happened in Syria, but I think artists are, are having more chance um, to reflect and to see the opportunities that were created, not only um, uh, for their careers, but also in the development of a civil society movement outside Syria, which never, which never existed inside. My name is Karen Vandenberg, and thank you again for your great talk. Um, I have actually two questions, and uh, one is uh, directed to the term of artists as uh, agents of social change. And uh, my question would be their um, social change of... Uh, of, uh, to whom is this social change addressed? Is it only addressed to the community uh, they are working with, or um, yeah, where where is the the dimension or uh, of this uh, idea? And my second question uh, is also related to this question. 
um, wh where's the network um, these projects are embedded in? Um, do they relate to other um, artistic networks or um, refer to a certain discourse? Um, I, I would really be interested in to hear about more about this. So artists for, for, um, as agents for social change, um, I think, and again, I'll focus on Syria, uh, because Palestine is a special case, since because of the Israeli occupation, artists did perceive themselves as agents of political change from the onset. In Syria, this was not possible. Uh, I mean, under the Assad regime, the whole discussion about freedom uh, was not really allowed. People disappeared. I have friends who disappeared for 20 years, and until now, no one could find them. So, um, so artists were actually writing and producing, but there were limitations that had to do with self-censorship and also uh, with the censorship imposed by the government. So in fact, and you have to remember that before 2011, there was no civil, unlike in Palestine, Jordan, and Lebanon, no uh, civil society movement was, was ever in, in Syria. You couldn't form organizations. It was just a bit, it's really, it was an extreme case in the Arab region, the Syrian regime. So artists themselves did not perceive themselves as able of creating uh, change. And if they could, they wouldn't speak about it. Yeah, they were very discreet about it. This changed post-2011, and I think um, really it depends, because Syrian artists, as I said uh, in the presentation, first they moved to Arab capitals, especially Beirut. Because Beirut is Beirut, <laughs> you would disagree with me, but it was for the longest time uh, a very important city for uh, contemporary Arab uh, culture in general, and then they dispersed uh, uh, around the world. So they are so they, they the artists that I work with on I interviewed for this research view themselves as artists for social change at the level of Syria, but their own communities. Um, for example, artists who work with uh, Syrian refugee communities in Berlin uh, perceive themselves as social uh, agents of change to their own communities. Uh, the same in Lebanon. Uh, many Syrian artists and non-Syrian artists are working with refugees. There are two million refugees, Syrian refugees in Lebanon. Many of them are living in poor conditions. The same in Jordan. So I think it has to do now with the context, whereas post the revolution immediately it was about, it was all about change in Syria. <coughs> now it, there are different contexts and the, the artists are living in, in different contexts. Concerning networks, um, uh, what, happened is, uh, what happened is that as um, Syrian artists became uh, more empowered in the Arab region, and more visible in the Arab region, new schemes were specifically designed to support uh, Syrian artists. New networks, new organizations like Itijahat, which is one of the biggest now uh, Arab cultural organizations that supports specifically Syrian and non-Syrian art artists, but Syrian artists. So there were lots of, of, of attempts of networking and solidarity. Now this is also changing because the, 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 the movement of Syrian artists is is now vast. And the networks, they're opening up to new networks within their own communities. Uh, in Paris, in Berlin, in New York, you see them everywhere. So, and, and I think until now, uh, there isn't uh, a framework that kind of, I shouldn't say unified because I don't like the word, but at least orchestrate and opens dialogue between these different networks. We can no longer talk about one network now. And this is the complexity of the situation. And, 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 and also it's because it's like Palestinian refugees who have, who deep inside feel, who live outside Palestine, that they will never go back. Yeah? So it's that they will never, they will never be, I mean, they've lost the chance to go back to Syria. And they're, you know, so they're building networks wherever they are. And there has to be some work um, to kind of, uh, uh, create synergies between these different networks. Um, all right. One more. <laughs> let's, let's have one, one short question and one brief answer.
question. Short question. <laughs> I'm uh, Maria Halaveva. I'm uh, part of this uh, fine art network and uh, director of BAC, Basis for Art Elegance in uh, Utrecht. Thank you, Fatin. This was fascinating. I have extremely difficult question, uh, which I struggle with myself, and I know, and that's an uh, upfront warning, I don't know how to formulate it intelligently and carefully enough. Um, that's why I want to I wanna operate through what you were saying, just to see. I mean, I would like to place it in the network of joy. I think that's, that this is the, the, the strategy of resistance or re-existence that we need to embrace. Um, I want to take your warning around the notion of time, that there is not, not every time is a good time to ponder upon certain questions. And I want to po pose my question in that framework. And the third uh, warning you made is the terminology that we're using contested terminology no matter what. We discussed yesterday that the only way forward is to, on whatever time scale, undo the nation state and the nationalism and nationalist populisms and fascism. So what would be a way that we do it in our conversations? Is there a way not to belong or re-belong the artists we talk to back to the nation state called Syria? Can we speak in other way so that we do not reproduce the nation state the way it wants us to be, to, to be reproduced through our radical conversations by belonging or returning the artists to national scenes? Is there another terminology? And I don't know, but I think we must find it to speak otherwise. And I'm fully aware that this is important for certain national liberatory processes, but maybe we need to overcome it in order to, to, to escape this capture by nation state that is killing us in their thousands. <laughs> it's so hard to respond to that, actually. Um, Viviana and I were talking yesterday about the concept of a nation state and its complexity for Palestinians, for example. Um, I am one of the few Arabs who vocally say that I'm against Arab nationalism because it's a form of fascism <laughs> and people don't like it when I say it, uh, of course. But um, there are different contexts. I think in the context of Palestine, um, it's a premature discussion because until Palestinians have liberation and their nation state, they're not willing to discuss beyond it. There is a lot of debate now about a two-state solution, and uh, there's a lot of resistance among even artists, Palestinian artists, because to be able to go beyond the nation state you have, it seems like you have to reach it, and then it, it seems like it's a process. So there's a lot of obsession, in, for Palestinians, I'm saying, in, 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 in having the national state so that we can dismantle it. Does this make any sense? Yes. But this is, this is part of it. With Syria, I think they have a better chance than us in this dialogue because of the fact that um, the artists are really dispersed everywhere in the world. Uh, and that um, there is... There is um, and they're now pondering questions, fresh questions that they did not have the chance to ponder in the, in the past in terms of their role to the state, to their country, to, and so on. I think they might have a better chance of discussing, uh, of being more open, uh, but I'm not sure. But I'm really not sure. Uh, I think the role of the state in countries like ours, excluding Palestine now because of the occupation, and I'm sorry, I keep on referring to you when I say the occupation. <laughs> that's, that's my mistake, so I apologize for that. Uh, really, I do apologize. Um, and uh, uh, like in Egypt and in, uh, in Syria, where the state is until now very strong and very present, and you have to remember that there's a lot of frustration post the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring turned into an Arab winter, people. 
Uh, I remember being in Ramallah, the overjoy of you know, the start of this movement and the optimism and the fact that we can challenge the, this uh, uh, undemocratic systems and the euphoria and suddenly, and suddenly it all collapsed and the revolution was hijacked. So I think people also, we have to remember, are drained. They're not fresh. I don't know uh, if you can, you know, comment on that. Um, I mean, even in Palestine, there's a lot of corruption with our government and people are not being willing to stand up because they're scared of the chaos that overtook the whole region uh, after the first few years of the Arab Spring. Everybody is anxious now. And this is actually inhibiting many uh, movements uh, to form. So I did not answer your question, but... <laughs> There is, there is going to be a panel at the end of the day. So, we'll, we'll, there will be time for, I hope. But we have to move on. So, so I think we'll, we'll go on with, with the, the program, um, but clearly there are many things we would like to continue discussing. And as I said, there's going to be a panel at the end of the day where I hope we can talk about things that uh, uh, remain unanswered uh, after each lecture, each talk. But our next speaker is uh, Margaret Elisabeth Olafsdóttir. She is professor at the Iceland Arts Academy. Um, Margaret is, specializes in, in uh, modern and contemporary art, also in digital and electronic art. Uh, she has a PhD from Sorbonne One, uh, University of Paris One, Sorbonne Pantheon, this complicated Parisian terminology escapes me, personally. Um, Margaret has been, for a number of years, very active in the Icelandic culture and art scene, writing and speaking for both uh, public and scholarly audiences. So, Margaret, please. And her respondent is Fabiola Fiocco, so she will come straight after her talk. Margaret. Yes. So this is, okay. uh, yeah, um, as you might have maybe guessed from the introduction, um, the questions of uh, socially and politically engaged art is maybe not what has been at the center of my preoccupation, so that's why I'm kind of uh, going to kind of talk myself through this, uh, through different cases, and a little bit in, uh, um, which was kind of, what did I do? Oh, I'm not doing anything, okay, <laughs> can you see that? <laughs> So there is, so, um, it has nothing to do with, really, it's just kind of a, so, um, um, <clears throat> I'm just going to begin with <clears throat> and use <clears throat> a classification that <clears throat> came across uh, in a text uh, written by Karen Vandenberg to frame discussion of a few uh, artistic projects uh, related <clears throat> to participation uh, to begin with, and then uh, to uh, what uh, can be uh, seen as socially engaged art. It is very difficult to <laughs> come after you uh, about your talk of, uh, of uh, the situation in Syria and the Arab countries. It almost seems like, uh, yeah, well. Um, so the <clears throat> cases refer to what I chose to call a space of action, uh, which uh, evokes uh, question of uh, both where the creative process takes place and uh, with whom, and eventually if and where the action or the result of the action takes place or is being displayed, 
And the space of action that alludes to the moment uh, of the duration of an action taking place within a space which may be physical or subjective space, or even both. And then this space of action is uh, maybe a space that embraces action and an interaction taking place between partners, collaborators, or participants over a limited or unlimited uh, or undefined period of time. So, uh, <clears throat> I hope that this is not going to get me kind of uh, off track or with time, but I uh, wanted to begin with at least like a kind of a prologue uh, because there was a performance festival in Reykjavik a couple of, ye day, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, there, there this artist, Alexander Almetason. Uh, had a performance at the Reykjavik Art Museum uh, called Pinst. Uh, it took place in an empty office space uh, in the museum building, and uh, which is not part of the museum um, itself. And uh, the festival guests were kind of invited to go into the space. And then the artist was standing like here on this kind of narrow landing, and like just dressed in his uh, casually in jeans and blue sweater, and he was kind of just being himself. Uh, and uh, but soon he began to speak, and it was to tell the guests that he had planned to have a soup. But somehow he had not gotten into the phase of preparing the soup. So she asked the guests to just imagine that they would ha have a soup together. And he also proposed that they would kind of uh, tell the others that had not been there that they had uh, ha joined this soup together. And then he asked uh, for help uh, to hang up. Uh, a few uh, posters uh, and photographs uh, which were uh, showing uh, people around gathering around the soup and like serving themselves on a buffet and like you see uh, this uh, connotes to an artwork you may be familiar with and then he handed yeah and then he encouraged people to take photographs of themselves with kind of empty soup dishes that they kind of this kind of few soup dishes and, and spoons that he kind of gave couple of uh, participants and uh, post them on social media and use his name as a hashtag. So my reaction and, ma and reaction of many people that were kind of uh, close to me was to laugh. This was kind of a, like a joke and uh, he seemed to be making a joke of uh, uh, relational aesthetics and the work of artists like uh, Rikri Tervania. And, uh, uh, but the performance did not really stop uh, there. It would have been maybe too simple. Uh, for those of you who know the work of Ernst Alexander Almetason, they possess a quality of inherent kind of failure to succeed and to desire to do so. And Pins, uh, in Pins, he failed to organize a truly participatory performance. He ins he's insistent that the guests were equal and as important as the artist, while in reality uh, he is kind of clearly trying to or pretending to manipulate and control the spectators' reactions and behavior. And to emphasize this, uh, uh, he kind of hang up uh, this uh, reminder, uh, which says um, in Icelandic, so I'm going to just uh, translate it. So this was kind of remem remember there was a soup and there was a meal, that we were all together. Uh, the work was about us being together, and that different groups came together, but we were all equal. And although Earth uh, was the artist, uh, there was no stratification. And uh, that you have never, uh, I have never seldom experienced a relaxed artwork, it was very casual, and so on. And then this was this encouragement to take photographs and, and post them on, on the social media. So uh, this was maybe, took maybe 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes, and uh, uh, opened up kind of, uh, what you, could you say, um, when the kind of laughter faded, uh, there was kind of an atmosphere of anticlimax in the end, and maybe a little bit of a deception. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> but what he managed to open up was a different layer of questions, like of what is equal participation in a situation like this, or any si similar situation of uh, what would be a successful term of an and what would be an successful term of an actual participation, like in eating a soup. Does a participation automatically annul the difference between the artist and the spectator and between participants with different social background and relation, uh, and relation to the art field, for example? And can social and cultural differences be annulled by a dish of soup? Another element of the performance that I thought was interesting was that it kind of addressed the role of a motivational speaker, which was kind of uh, underlined with the setup, uh, with, the mic uh, with the microphone. 
uh, a motivational speaker that may be uh, hired to lead a group of colleagues, for example, in a consulting meeting on deciding on a company's or institutional policy, where a democratic process of consultation is more than often undermined by directives of the motiv motivational speaker. So the performance pins thus raises questions and concern uh, about the nature and meaning of participation and engagement within maybe a, dem a democratic procedure. So from there I wanted to turn to uh, Karen Wanderberg uh, and her classification. And this image is uh, reproduced in her text uh, that I'm referring to. This shows uh, Sherry Arnstein's ladder of participation. And if you would like to situate the performance of Arne Alexander in this ladder, we might want to uh, put him you know, on the bottom of uh, the, on the bottom, uh, as he intended to manipulate us. Although it was more about the manipulation than an actual manipulation, as the degree of deception and failure automatically annulled the spectator's response to the artist's uh, commands and uh, uh, offer to participate. They were spa passive spectators for most cases uh, in a traditional sense, and um, <coughs> Uh, and maintained uh, maybe the option of becoming involved as active critics, which is kind of the uh, classical uh, position of a spectator uh, within uh, the aesthetic, the tradition of aesthetics. So the participation ladder is an interesting tool. It could be an interesting tool to use it. I feel like I'm drinking a white wine. Well. Uh, but it. Um, I may be reading a little bit faster, but I'm afraid that I will be too long. Um, so I want to elaborate further on, on um, Karen Vandenberg's uh, uh, different, different degrees of participation and collaboration within a framework with the uh, terms as topology, topology of political engagement, and which is based on examples of artistic projects that have appeared in recent years, and especially around the refugee crisis, which comes to uh, the talk of Farad. Uh, so uh, her terms are then uh, art projects that are about social or political issues and that often take place within traditional art institutional galleries. And then what she calls spectators art, and um, which is, uh, can be based on collaboration within an exhibition context and where the gallery is uh, sometimes transformed into a social platform, which is kind of maybe my translation of this. And uh, then the third would be collaborative projects which take place beyond the gallery and the museum nexus, and which may be uh, what uh, many of you are, are uh, interested in. But in the first category, just briefly, she mentions Ai Weiwei, uh, which she classifies as being about politics, and the main problem about this kind of work would then be uh, that such projects, uh, the artist kind of uh, puts or attempts to speak on behalf of mar marginalized groups, which itself does not have the voice in the say. And the second example in the uh, second category would be uh, the work of, uh, and I'm still uh, referring to you, the Green Light Workshop of Oliver Eliasson, which was shown at the Venice Biennale in 2017. And in this piece, the refugees are like a part of a workshop, uh, almost like a, like a performance setup, put on display in the exhibition space where the refugees or asylum seekers or others participating become uh, almost like an object of observation for the spectators. They are kind of put on stage, which is something that almost always happens, uh, I think, uh, uh, in participation art, at least when it takes place in the museum space. And this uh, comes to my kind of uh, knowledge of the, the digital art and technology. Uh, with me, it resonates with uh, interactive art and installations where uh, spectators become kind of uh, what has been called spect actors. And um, uh, they are, um, uh, this is a term that has been used to describe the role of a spectator engaged within an interactive artwork when he passes from being an observer to, be to becoming an actor in the sense that he or she uh, initiates an, actor, an action and, and an interaction within a work. So this particular work uh, that I'm showing here is called Knee Form. It's an installation by an artist called Samuel Biancini. And uh, uh, this work is only activated in the presence of a viewer uh, <clears throat> of this blurry image, uh, which comes increasingly sharper as he approaches it. Uh, but only uh, for the shape of the spectator's body, 
and uh, which uh, uh, reveals only a fragment of a group portra portrait of life-size uh, French riot policemen in full gear. And as the work functions, no one spectator can view the whole work alone, and if they come too close, they miss the larger picture. So a visitor that stands in a distance from this image, he can observe the other spect actors trying to figure out how to make the image appear, and the specta spectator has the choice to remain passive and look at the blurred image or become active and try to get the image into focus or even try to make it appear in full collaboration with other spect actors. And Neform is also about uh, 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 an image about power and poses the question of whether power can be easily displayed or if it <clears throat> tends to be elusive. And this piece is, of course, very different from Oliver Eliasson in, in uh, the Greenlight Workshop. But it does, uh, it does not involve uh, other, part participant, other participants uh, than those that are interacting with the image. It's not kind of a, with, this, with the others in the space directly. Uh, and it takes place within an exhibition space and uh, it offers itself to interpretation and questions about the display of, of this display of power. If you think about the role of the policeman, which uh, is to keep uh, the order, keep order, and, uh, for example, in a social or political protest, they stand there and they are prepared to step in if a crowd begins to behave in a way that where the situation might get out of control. Uh, so here the action is very dependent on the interaction of the spectators within the work and with the mu within the museum display and offer itself to critical reflection rather than a direct action or engagement or any social change for that matter, except within the work itself or interpretation of the of the work, so in that sense it becomes very classical. Uh, a different level of engagement uh, can be found, and that was something I, I was, yeah, uh, can be found in the work of an Icelandic artist, uh, Oliver S. Gislason. And uh, that is where this uh, title actually comes from, the space of action. Uh, which takes place out of the ex outside of the ex exhibition play space. Uh, Oliver Gislason has, for uh, more than almost three decades, made works in collaboration with a group, groups or individuals, which take place often over a long period of time. In his earlier works, he worked on site with different participant participation of the public, but uh, from. Uh, um, this uh, direct kind of participation uh, on location, he has developed a working method that consists of doing interviews, which is kind of uh, often on the core of his work, uh, where he kind of, uh, which he then uses and rewrites into a script to be interpreted and then filmed. Um, the films are neither feature films nor documentaries. Uh, they are uh, more like a script interpreted or recited sometimes by the individuals that he has interviewed, sometimes by professional actors or amateurs, or all three at the same time, like in a multi-screen uh, installation called Subjective Spaces. But Gislason first used the video as a medium in this installation and this method uh, called, uh, it's called Golden Bamboo from 2002. And it is based on an interview with a Vietnamese immigrant in the former East Germany who was a restaurant owner in Dresden. The video shows a palm tree being moved from the Vietnamese. We see the, the video is just uh, inside the, behind the door. And it shows the, a palm tree being moved from the Vietnamese restaurant to the exhibition space, uh, in, uh, which is also in Dresden. The transpa transportation of the tree served as a, this, is this exotic element, uh, served as a metaphor for the journey of the restaurant owner from Vietnam to East Germany and his ultimate adaptation to new conditions in a reunified Germany in the 1990s. So uh, Gislason has since continued to use this method methodology uh, to address different social issues. So it maybe is more about uh, maybe social, uh, yeah, social issues than, than uh, trying to kind of activate change. In another work which is called um, Fiat Theater Real, he interviewed uh, seven shopkeepers on the street in, um, in Hamburg um, that were under the threat to um, be closed because of the opening of a big shopping mall. The film was screened as a part of a stage installation in a retail space, 
between the store, uh, store pro involved in the project. And like you see, the image uh, might be a little bit dark, but the visitors kind of uh, entered the space. They had to go over the stage and sit in, in chairs behind the stage where they would look at the, the film, which was kind of uh, situated uh, up, uh, upside the window. And then at the same time, uh, they were looking out into the street. And then they were listening to this um, uh, conversations or, or, or to the shopkeepers expressing their thoughts about the community that uh, lived in the street or, or uh, was uh, frequent in this, uh, this neighborhood. So uh, Gislason's more uh, recent project uh, that are based on a long time collaboration with uh, has resulted in a multi-layered installation subjective spaces. And um, in this case, we are still talking about uh, something that uh, ends up in a museum space but this work is based on kind of a many years of um, engagement and relationship uh, between Oliver Gislason and the person who lives on a farm in South Iceland, and which is no longer farmed in the traditional manner. And the farmer kind of works elsewhere. He keeps few seeds on the farm. He cultivates woodland and uh, on his property, and he makes experiments with potato growing. And um, <clears throat> The work, uh, uh, final work is kind of largely based on uh, Gislason's interview with the farmer, uh, which the artist has then divided into uh, themes of discussion and uh, into six short films that are screened in pairs. And while the film is based on an interview with one of the individual in the script, it is acted by five people, a professional actor, uh, three local people which are the neighbors of the farmer, a young lad, a young man and a woman, and as well as the interview himself. And in each film, uh, we see two or three uh, of them together. Uh, they are all similarly dressed, and they actually kind of embody uh, the voice of the, of the farmer when they talk about subjects like uh, uh, they recall and recount uh, memories, uh, and they talk about uh, the experience of the farmer and um, his relationship with his parents, the livestock, the soil, and all subjects include his interest in, like, other subjects include his interest in, like, flower growing and knitting, as well as carpentry and um, afforestation, sheep, and cookery. So, uh, this uh, <coughs> theme have, has uh, manifold links with time and space according to whether they are memories, descriptions of interest of the farmer of li the farmer's life, to life today. And with this work, Oliver Gislason opens a window uh, into maybe a time space of social situations of the farmer, of the changes that have taken place, not only with this farmer's life, but in agriculture and farming and about the living in rural, rural areas in contemporary society. So here the space of action is the farm and its surrounding. It's the interaction that is based on the relationship between the artist and the farmer. The collaboration takes place outside of the museum nexus within, and, and the interview is based on what he refers to as the subjective space of the experience of the farmer, although it eventually translates into film and an installation, which is quite complex actually, and into a physical space uh, of the museum. So uh, the work does, um, <coughs> Uh, I think uh, not respond to, uh, directly to a need of a construction of a new social fabric. It more there's a more of a comment, commentary about uh, a current situation and uh, uh, current change. Uh, the construction of a new social fabric, though, uh, which is uh, yet a part of uh, this idea of social engagement and change, uh, it is very demanding, and I. I'm, uh, uh, referring to uh, Karen van der Berg again, and uh, it requires imagination and a strong sense of possibility and the sensibility for these emancipatory ideas. So then I would <coughs> like to uh, come to uh, another example. How this can maybe, um, uh, yeah, ha how, how this can ha happen. Um, in our discussion yesterday, there was also some mention of uh, social engagement uh, in relation to decolonization. So uh, that uh, responds to the, this, uh, my, uh, this is not the last project, but uh, yeah, the, um, yeah, it cor corresponds to this project. 
uh, which I've already uh, kind of written about. It's called Artist Perspective Initiative, and it was initiated almost 50 years ago uh, by a Slovenian artist called Marco Pellion, uh, and is, uh, engages uh, a, a group of uh, collaborators, so it's bringing us from Syria and Arab countries to the North Pole. <laughs> um, um, Pellion's work is rooted in his interest in telecommunication and his practice as a radio amateur during his childhood in former Yugoslavia. And in 1994, he created MagroLab, who focused on uh, telecommunication, migration, weather system research, and an interest in art, uh, science, uh, and engineering. Uh, in 2006, uh, Marco Pellion himself traveled to the self-governed territories of the Inuits in Canada, talking about nation states and independence, so. uh, which is called Nunavut. And uh, I'm showing this on the map because it's a, uh, um, yeah, um, it's, it's a huge uh, territory. And he uh, traveled to uh, this village you see on the map, uh, and you see also images from the village. Uh, it's called um, Iklulik. Iklul 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 uh, the first contact of this region with the Western world uh, is through science, science explorations in the 19th century, whose purpose was to gather sci scientific information and uh, authority over a land by claiming it without considering the status of uh, or the rights of the inhabitants, which are the Inuits. Nunavut means our country in, in Uktut, which is the language of the Inuits uh, of the North Canada of Canada. And uh, Nunavut had been their land for thousands of years before the arrival of the Western explorers. The exploration brought with them uh, the men's diminishing power of the inhabitants over their own land, which decreased steadily uh, in the 20th century, and it wasn't until the 1970s when the Inuits began to mark off areas of land and demanded to uh, get those marking recognized uh, that the revolution, uh, evolution was uh, turned around. The recognition was followed by a demand for autonomy which was approved in uh, only 1999. And to understand the delicate situation of uh, Nunavut region, it is worth keeping in mind that it's one of the most sparsely populated areas in the world. It stretches over 2 million square kilometers with a population within 33,000, so it's 10 times less than Iceland. So Iklulik is the fifth largest hamlet in Nunavut with the 1,500 inhabitants. Located on a small, small island just the north of what is called the Melville Peninsula, which belongs to the mainland Canada. The island is a part of uh, Fox Bay area, uh, which separates the Baffin Island, uh, which is in, in Nuktitut, called Quikitaluk. Uh, yeah, I'll show you that afterwards. Um, Pellion's work with radio waves and magnetic fields, um, which are, of course, visible but they are in the same, uh, all, all the same, a very real part uh, of a global and a social political system. And uh, this is also what drives uh, Marco Pellion's work. His interest in the North began when he heard of the Inuit's story of using uh, radio receiver system Nunanet, which played an important part in their strive for independence. The role of the radio transceivers as a way of communication did not end uh, with them regaining the territories, but remained an important, important during hunting trips and other activities. Uh, because another element was that the population of Nunavut, which had been pressured onto, to adjust to the south uh, when the area was occupied, was, uh, was pressured to adjust to, to the south when the area was occupied during the Cold War. Uh, then air defense system and radars were put up along the so-called district early warning line, the dew line which travels also through Iceland, uh, which ran through the Ikbik Bay area on this Iquitaluk, uh, uh, which is yeah, the, the Iquitut name for the Baffin Islands. Uh, after the installation of the army base, the Inuits were encouraged to give up the nomad, nomadic lifestyle which characterized their hunter society and settled down in the hamlets. The inhabitants were grounded and their dogs were killed and they were replaced by snowmobiles and slates and machine boats, which made the inhabitants very dependent on supplies and shipments from the south. And um, the grounding of the Inuits therefore played uh, a big part in kind of undermining this uh, newly gained autonomy. So Nunavut has again been placed in a political and geographical struggle 
and the project Arctic, Arctic, Arctic Perspective Initiative was um, uh, uh, intended uh, as a ground of an international and intercultural collaboration in researching the changes uh, of the Earth, Earth's atmosphere uh, as climate changes are tangible in the Arctic regions, where they affect the daily lives of people, uh, etc., and um, where there is a new uh, growing uh, interest in exploit exploiting natural resources, which have opened up and new areas of sea and new sailing roads through the Arctic. So this has led to new conflicts over these areas, and the inhabitants uh, need to be able to kind of keep on living there, but they also need to withstand the pressure that is being put on them because of those new interests. And the areas also need to be prepared uh, to face uh, interest within this e increased uh, independence. So originally, the intention of this project, Arctic Perspective Initiative, was to build a research station similar to MacroLab to be used in the area. But after Marco Pellian's first visit in 2006, uh, the idea shifted to a more elaborate project to empower the inhabitants by developing equipment that they could use uh, uh, to do their own research and gain an independence toward the scientific knowledge and technological superiority of, <coughs> toward the scientific knowledge and technological superiority, superiority of the South. So this was done in a close collaboration with the community, uh, which had already adapted several new technologies and considered it absolutely vital for their future to possess the same equipment as the mining companies and the government to stay autonomous. However, they can't develop such a technology without cooperation, and there is where, where this uh, Arctic Perspective Initiative project uh, stepped in. Uh, in this initial state, they uh, decided to develop a technology uh, uh, with a local, which uh, contained a no local network system, which could be connected to the global positioning system, the GPS, and which the inhabitants could use to collect data concerning environmental changes, for example, uh, in traditional hunting areas. And the images you see here uh, are with uh, Marco Pellion and his colleagues. Uh, this is in 2009, and they are, uh, kind of have uh, built this uh, kind of drone, uh, which uh, they were going to test on a, on a hunting trip. We see kind of this uh, um, the, the boat, and then the bay uh, that they have to sail through to get to the hunting areas. And even in this is in late summer and in August, it's already, it is still covered with uh, ice pack. And uh, it is difficult <coughs> for the local community to know if it's safe uh, to go through the sea passage uh, without information about the state of the iceberg. But the problem is that uh, the southerners, uh, they don't provide them with this kind of information in the summer. So, they're kind of, uh, so this was the idea that uh, this drone could kind of uh, be sent to the front of the boat and kind of film what was ahead so they would know uh, what were waiting for them. So. Uh, this photo is also from the, when they came to the Ikukutaluk uh, uh, on a hunting trip where they did also a few experiments uh, with this uh, drone. So uh, the space of action in this project was not limited to this hamlet of Iklulik uh, or not, not even to uh, this visit. Uh, it covered uh, other areas in the Arctic region, uh, both in, uh, in Nunavut, in Greenland and in north of Finland. And the aim was not to make an artwork for an exhibition, but to tie an ongoing relationship with different communities and engage in reciprocal dialogue, where the artists were listening uh, to and learning from the locals as much as trying to respond uh, to their needs. So this project, which is kind of a little bit crazy because it's super difficult to go to Nunavut, and it costs uh, a huge amount, amount of money, uh, requires uh, a dimension of imagination and fiction, in a long-term engagement beyond the austenius exposure uh, on the part of the artists. And uh, this is also, um, uh, yeah. Uh, however, uh, as this particular trip was made uh, and only could be made possible through uh, funding, there was the demand of uh, making an exhibition about uh, what had taken place. And uh, so, uh, the project has been uh, on display uh, in Hartwerk uh, Kunstverein in Dortmund, another exhibition, and this is a, an image, an, uh, an image uh, 
from uh, this uh, this project. So it is actually uh, I could say a lot more about this. It's, uh, it has kind of went through different stages and uh, with different uh, participants, and it is uh, still ongoing and. Uh, uh, but it is complicated because it's not kind of in the in immediate environment of the artist, but in this far away uh, regions. Uh, to end this, uh, I wanted to kind of uh, go back to Europe and uh, abort still another uh, uh, question, which uh, I uh, picked up, I think, from uh, John Roberts, but I did not do not elaborate on this, which uh, relates to the commons, because uh, actually, kind of this access, uh, one of the part of uh, the idea of uh, kind of building this communication system is also kind of uh, thinking about them as something that should be uh, accessible as a commons uh, and not uh, be uh, only uh, uh, in the hands of uh, big corporate uh, systems. But if we go back to the commons, on a maybe a more uh, uh, in a, in um, in a more um, how to say um, uh, in a ground uh, that is closer to us, so we can go back to Europe, and I want to take you then back to take you to Helsinki, uh, where in the summer of 2014 uh, a pixelic festival was held in Martisoari, which is an island located in east part of the city. Pixel Lake Festival was initially created as a festival dedicated to art projects revolving around uh, free and open software, but it developed a different, uh, dire into different directions and uh, uh, created a few versions of the festivals uh, around the question of the commons uh, as early as 2010. Uh, in 2014, Vartis Oari was chosen as a location for the festival as it was considered a demo to demonstrate early aspects of many aspects of the commons as an underdeveloped nature and uh, a recreation island in the middle of the suburban city. Uh, yeah, in the middle of the su suburban, suburban city sprawl, which hosts a numerous social and uh, so social and association run wooden summer and village retreats and um, has uh, certain special features. And this island at the time of this festival was under a threat of a full-scale residential development by the Helsinki City Planning Department, but an ongoing grassroots campaign uh, to preserve uh, the particular qualities of the island uh, with the involvement of artists and cultural protect, pro, pro, practitioners uh, kind of encouraged the choice of this, this site for the festival, <coughs> and in the, in, in, uh, which was, in, in this sense, uh, strategic. It provided a platform for this, the festival itself uh, provided a platform for discussion around Helsinki, com Helsinki Commons issues and other similar issues like bio, uh, bioculture and uh, knowledge uh, commons. And it was a very informal festival with a kind of open, open platform. They called it unconference because people could kind of just come and, and write down the uh, subjects they wanted to talk about. And this was all done. Um, on, the, on a camping site on the island, which is kind of a, a common camping site, and whoever can go there and, and put up a tent and, and stay there for a, uh, for a certain, um, yeah, for, to, to go on camping. Um, this um, project uh, is, of course, very different still, uh, as it uh, involves mainly uh, the artists themselves. Uh, it was uh, the participants were, were uh, the members of Pixel Lake, the collaborators, artists from uh, other places, countries in Europe, from South America, and to uh, participate in this kind of events. So, uh, as this was uh, took place uh, almost uh, seven years ago, I was curious to know what had happened uh, to this island, and uh, discovered that uh, actually there has been a halt or a pause in this urban planning. And although that it has not been kind of completely stopped, there is no uh, there is no building uh, construction buildings happening or building happening happening there, and um, it's kind of uh, still uh, uh, an open island uh, where people can not only go camp, they can go into into walks, so they can go swimming, 
and they can also uh, grow vegetables in uh, common gardens that are found in this uh, in the island, which is kind of uh, just the, from with a boat trip from the center of Helsinki. It takes maybe ten minutes uh, to go there. So. Um, the festival in, is, involves uh, uh, a certain action in space about the, the common uh, that is under the threat uh, of making the common territory of the island disappear and thus re reduce the space available to the inhabitants of Helsinki to enjoy nature, wooden land and access land with this uh, vegetable gardens uh, and uh, which, where it is possible to go also and bathe in the summer and to, like I said, uh, to camp and uh, as we did, uh, or they did, uh, to organize this uh, festival. So uh, I've kind of maybe um, touched upon uh, many different uh, subjects and I was thinking what could be the conclusion of this. Uh, uh, the projects that I'm kind of uh, been uh, chosen to talk about are more uh, as a way of uh, develop thinking, uh, a thinking process through, through these different cases. Uh, maybe it's a little bit of myself thinking out loud about this and uh, going from projects that appear or are uh, more conventional, trying to grasp uh, which cases might be relevant for the classification of this topology of engagement proposed by Karen Vandenberg, and where the space, or the, or, and also raise the question of where the space of action takes place uh, with artists, with group of artists, uh, which have abandoned the studio and stepped into the social sphere in an attempt to evoke <coughs> or even provoke um, actual change. So. Uh, if we would go back to the participation ladder, which uh, just we have to remember uh, what it looks like, we could go to the, uh, or we can show it, we could maybe go uh, to, the, to the top of the ladder and uh, ask which of this project uh, uh, would uh, classify us uh, uh, being um, uh, or helping uh, a participation that involves uh, partnership and sits in control of uh, a particular situation or particular land or some or, or place that uh, belongs to the to the commons. So this is the final. Thank you. Hi, hello. Um, this is Carrie. Uh, thank you, Margaret, for your talk, and thank you to Claude and uh, to Fatin for what has been talked about so far. Um, I'm trying to still like order the thoughts after after the talk, but I think it was really interesting uh, what you said about space and where processes occur and where the outcomes are shown, and. Um, you have talked about this dichotomy between the institutional and the non-institutional space, but then um, the first uh, work you talked about, there was this strong component of the digital realm as a space of marketization and this push to people to make pictures and share them and use an hashtag. And so one, one of the first things that I thought about listening to you was how to make this other space in the conversation. So the digital space as a space where people do not really engage with the work directly, but kind of experience the experience as is already happened. And how images are not just a documentation of what occurred, but acquire a very strong economic component and something to be sold and circulated and consumed. And in that sense, then I kind of collect, um, connected it to the ladder of participation, and I was thinking how to add new steps to this ladder that goes beyond the idea of uh, citizen power and tokenism, no participation, and kind of considers um, the way that people are asked to produce value in these processes uh, as participants, but also consumers, or this very fancy word of prosumers that has been developed in the marketing field. 
So um, this is something that I might ask you to elaborate if you want to, like what kind of steps can be added into this engagement classification mm, and how this might relate to this moment of gamification and interactive part that uh, kind of characterized the first part of the case studies that you, you shared. Um, and I will not delve too much into the digital because I know that there are people that know way better about it than I do. So moving on from that and kind of reflecting on the last uh, case studies that you shared, then I was kind of reflecting on creating another dichotomy that goes beyond the institution and non-institution and think about the existing and non-existing infrastructures because you really presented uh, lots of different examples and no matter where they were happening, there was this difference of spaces that were already exist, like they were already there and people were able to access them very easily and kind of um, avoid to think to produce the space per se and produce the infrastructure. And it was ve very, very interesting, the project that you talked about, the Arctic Perspective Initiatives and how it was important for the artists to um, produce the technology, like the artists and the people involved. So not only produce the knowledge, how to use the tools, but really produce the tools that need to be used against uh, someone else who already had all the necessary technology and was way ahead and had more power in this uh, dynamic outside of the art project per se. So this is something that I would like to ask you to maybe give some insights about, if it might make sense or if it's just me blubbing. Um, so to think about this difference and this importance of people having infrastructures and having resources and how um, socially engaged projects can become a way, as we were also talking about yesterday, of hijacking resources and schemes to give people resources to do what they really need and create the infrastructure that they need in their own place. And then also um, then how to maintain the infrastructures that have been created and who's going to take care of that and what kind of work is going to be created in that context. Um, yeah, those were my thoughts. And thank you again, Margaret. And I hope it's a nice conversation after this as well. Yeah, <laughs> did not take note, but um, I think um, uh, what uh, I know. I know this was a little bit kind of bits and pieces, um, and it was only when I uh, saw this performance uh, what we were talking about first uh, that I wanted to kind of include it uh, because even though it kind of felt like I said like kind of failure or something, it addressed these questions of. Uh, like what we do with this uh, uh, when we go to exhibitions and take photos and post them on social media is that you know a level of participation or is it kind of and then you are encouraged to do it by the p museums this kind of a auto publicity you become a publicity agency for an institution because you post photographs of an exhibition to kind of draw more people to it it's kind of a and what is that you know so it's kind of a very kind of low level almost kind of a Bus, <laughs> like a, uh, if you think about that as a participation, but of course it can be seen in a in a more uh, uh, positive uh, way. Um, I'm not kind of. I I just um, grabbed this uh, letter of participation from uh, from Karen's text. I'm not kind of studied it, but I think it's interesting to propose that it might be, you know, we may, might have different steps or different way of seeing it because it's already kind of uh, from the late 60s so uh, there may be uh, other ways to to think about this um, I was uh, when I when I decided to talk about uh, the Arctic per initiative perspective perspective initiative project um, it's because I, I was involved with it in a kind of a very tiny 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 part of it. So and I became completely fascinated <laughs> with this uh, kind of crazy idea of of going to this place and 
uh, and also because uh, with very different uh, history from uh, what you uh, uh, know from, uh, for example, the Arab region or the Middle East, uh, these kind of far away uh, places that have uh, uh, created kind of a lot of, um, what do you say, uh, nourished the imagination not only of scientif scienti scientists, uh, but also uh, of artists. Uh, so uh, one of the things that uh, I thought was interesting and did not talk about at all was that uh, uh, when people were, were searching for passages, uh, you know, through the north, there was this uh, uh, skip, uh, shipwreck uh, close to this village of Iklulik, and one of the famous paintings of Caspar uh, David Friedrich, which shows the ice caps kind of rising out of the sea. I'm sure, sure many of you know this work. Uh, it's it 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 uh, this shipwreck uh, in the ice uh, that took place there was what kind of. Uh, nourish the imagination of uh, the German artists. So it kind of also comes back in a, in a, in a different way, uh, something that's really, f like I said, very far away and, and difficult to access. And uh, one of the things that was uh, interesting in, uh, in this, uh, or, or what, for, uh, what I became kind of aware of in this, was my discussions that I had with a, uh, with a British um, historians of, of, uh, of science uh, that are talking about these re uh, regions, uh, about the role they play in kind of uh, creating the image of the heroic male that goes on an exploration and does not talk about all the things like his relationship with the women, women there and the, about the culture, etc. And then there's also, I think, an important uh, point to address because you... Um, maybe think when you go to this kind of this region which is really far away and say yeah you're going to bring technology to the to the community but uh, what uh, no, Marco Pellion was kind of uh, emphasizing was that it's not as this uh, uh, people do not know technology they have 5,000 years or more of culture and this involves kind of a uh, lot of knowledge about technology and techniques uh, which are embedded in their kind of culture and the, their use of the, the rated telecommunication system was kind of one element which was also something uh, which made it easy kind of to initiate the discussion and the talk about what was needed in the current situation and how it could be provided you know uh, because of course 33,000 people we know it here in Iceland we are very small but 33,000 we know this huge 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 territory it's kind of impossible and but one of the reasons why they could kind of communicate with telecommunication system is because it's a very the eyes kind of uh, kind of uh, the, the electromagnetic -manic, uh, waves, they travel really easily through the eye. So that's why it makes it possible to kind of use them. So, yeah. Okay. I'm gonna <laughs> yes. Uh, I was. Um, uh, it, thanks for presentation with mm, uh, a lot of visual materials and examples. But I'm more interested in the notion of participation you use uh, in uh, your paper showing this uh, uh, ladder of participation. So, like, as far as I understand, I didn't, it, it's an interesting idea that, as far as I understand, that it's uh, like from most primitive forms of participation, you are sent to kind of full kind of control democratic whatever it, is it, it if, if 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 i understood this correctly and, and i was just thinking that in socially engaged art it was a, one of those crucial notions of participation uh, uh, but this is political context so there is a kind of citizen participation but this is also kind of art theoretical notion of participation and they're kind of different but you can relate them so i mean but uh, because uh, I was always wondering, because when our artists and uh, theorists in social engaged art, they are using this word participation uh, so frequently, like, you know, children say mama, mama, and they say participation, participation. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, so, uh, like, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, as if this uh, word somehow uh, kind of resolves and explains everything. And uh, then Claire Bishop wrote about this, etc. But I saw that participation is um, kind of much more, how to say, beyond this political dimension uh, or uh, aesthetical dimension has much more kind of 
more protracted kind of theoretical genealogy. So in just a comment, I'm not so trying to kind of, uh, kind of to shake this ladder le of participation, you know, which somehow, somehow ascend to some kind of beautiful final point of kind of complete control and uh, some, I don't know, kind of uh, triumph of democracy. Uh, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'm just um, uh, uh, was thinking about this, uh, how much complexity is involved into this notion of participation. Again, I'm just serious, listening humbly to a paper and just trying to think my own thoughts and you know, sure, participate in discussion. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, uh, for, for, for example, uh, 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 maybe it kind of be, would be kind of quite surprising for Claire Bishop uh, that uh, actually the genealogy of the word participation comes to Greek word metexis, which uh, means um, uh, kind of in Greek, uh, ancient Greek theatrical performance means exactly this kind of involvement of the group into uh, sort of theatrical performance. So I think Nietzsche uh, also in his uh, early work on theater, he mentioned this kind of metexis uh, Kind of participation, so it means this sort of ecstatic uh, joining, this sort of experience, etc. So it has actually a kind of aesthetic roots, but also participation. Uh, Plato used the notion participation in his ontology because for Plato, uh, uh, I, uh, how ideas related to things, right? Big question, big question, and, and uh, it is related through participation because for him, for example. Uh, beautiful things, they are participate in the idea of beauty. So it's like a school example from everyone reads school text in Plato, etc. So in a way, participation is a kind of ontological thing which somehow uh, explains how our reality is constructed. So it's kind of very, very general notion in Plato. So And even there is a kind of moment uh, of violence in participation because everything should participate. You cannot refuse participation. So participation is rather not something we need to achieve, but we already participate in the world. So this is also not that something like a, a staircase, you are ascending to some beautiful participation, but vice versa, ontologically, we are already forced to participate. So this is kind of another twist and complication in this notion. So, so there is a lot of, I mean, this uh, kind of interesting, so there is even impossible to withdraw in communication and in contemporary society, we are somehow uh, forced to con participate like in communicative capitalism we are living, you are constantly uh, kind of inter, uh, how to say, called to participation. So my, again, I'm just trying to a little bit twist the things uh, from my kind of idiosyncratic um, kind of theoretical perspective <laughs> and comment on your paper in this way. Thank you. Oh, oh yeah, I, I mean, I, I threw it maybe in just like that, but uh, and from this uh, performance, because um, I think, uh, um, well, you, you mentioned that we all participate in, in some way, but uh, I think that my, and what I thought was, um, how do you say, uh, interesting in this uh, performance, and it comes also from my questions uh, around uh, kind of interactive, technologically interactive work, was this idea, maybe, which I did not, maybe not elaborate on, uh, that you in somehow become active in uh, creating the work. And if you have a technological display uh, uh, with interactivity, although maybe there are more complex technologies uh, available now than 20 years ago, uh, there's always some kind of um, um, a model uh, that is built into the participation that directs your uh, possibilities uh, to move within the participation. And that is maybe always the case. Maybe it's kind of some kind of ideological or ideal world where everybody would really, 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 really become equal participants. I mean, it's, it's very complicated if, you, if everyone wants to put in. And that's maybe the, uh, this, yeah, if, if that would be, like you said, the the ultimate goal of the latter that we all would participate we it's maybe impossible like trying to see whole, the whole world at the same time or and maybe we can at, at the same time maybe we are participating in a in a small way i don't you know that's a, yeah. no. or we should be aware of it No, it's more what, yeah. No, it's more um, what I saw in kind of a certain particular kind of works. It's kind of I, when I approach them uh, with the, 
where they were presented like kind of you had an equal part in participation. Yeah, well, yeah, maybe it's an ideal like that. Yeah. It's me. Um, my name is Viviana Kekia, and I'm a curator based in the UK. I'm here as one of the partners organization as co-director of Vassal. Can I ask to go back to the ladder? Would it be possible to have it on? Oh my God. I shouldn't have taken the ladder. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so my, say my question, about let's say that lies between number six and number eight, and it would be about uh, questioning the existence of the institution in itself. And I'll, I'll explain why I'm asking the question. Mm -hmm. As we all know, we are living a major crisis and there is a war, and the Home Office uh, UK has double standard. So Palestinian, Syrian, Yemenis, Somali, they don't have the same rights of other people, including Ukrainian people. And at the moment, there is a very strange system in which somehow citizens have been delegated to help out in the arrival of refugees. So you can apply to have someone in your own private home and to stay with you. But the home office is not directly recreating any sort of welcoming infrastructure or shelter. So it means that any of you, like if based in the UK, could actually be in control, in full control, because you are giving your own house for a period that you don't even know how long it is to help out other people, other citizens. Now, if we imagine that that's a good thing, which I don't know if you believe is a good thing or not, that is the government is entirely de-responsibilized and the citizens are in total control, then what would be the premises for the government to even exist in the first place? Why do we need them? So can, can we translate these in the conditions in which we are? If the citizens are in control, why do we need the intermediators of it? So why do we need the art system? Why do we need the art institutions? Why do we need the university and everything that happens in between? So how would you see the articulation between the partnership, the delegated power, and the citizen control? <laughs> That's an interesting question. I, uh, I, I think it's very difficult to, uh, this, if this is an ideal, uh, and then we are hurt with reality, and uh, you always realize that maintaining some kind of equal uh, basis when everybody's kind of doing, pitching in, it's difficult. That would be, you know, my, I, I don't know if it's possible. I don't know. Is that it, there is something for me there that is quite crucial. Mm -hmm. If we are really devoted to social engager practice most of the time, it means we are bringing social issues as well as context, as well as people within the framework of institutions. So there must be a reason why we do that. You know what I mean? Like, are we trying to really increase citizen control by doing what we are doing? And are we prepared to do that? Because otherwise we are inviting people in, into a system that is already a cul-de-sac, and they are going to do nothing other than help us to tick boxes because we reach out broader society, but they are not invited to participate. They are just invited to make the numbers grow and grow mm -hmm. for different institutions, you know, for us to claim that we are contributing in citizen control, but we are not really. I think it's a very important question. <laughs> 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 because, uh, uh, and I don't know if I have really the answer to this, but uh, yeah, no, I don't. Thank you, anyway. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sure this is one of the questions we can continue with later on, maybe in the panel. Uh, but we take a lunch break now, so we'll meet again here uh, in just over an hour at half past one. And thank you, everyone, for a great morning.
Sorry, sorry for the delay. We we have to wait for a hope not more than a couple of more couple of minutes more.
So, hello, I think we should get started. Uh, sorry for the delay, but um, as we all know, uh, we all know what's, most imp what, what's the most important thing at conferences. It's the breaks, obviously. And in this case, uh, we had not planned wisely enough for the break, so participatory empowerment has occurred, and the conference has reorganized itself and postponed the, we have, we have decided to postpone it for half an hour. So everything goes back half an hour, which is no big deal. We'll have everything as planned just half an hour later. So um, I'm really pleased to, to introduce our next, well, speakers or, or uh, performers. I, I don't know whether speaker is the correct expression. Uh, that's Ruan Krupa from uh, Indonesia. Uh, a non-profit organization uh, founded in Jakarta in 2000 by a group of artists which began as a contemporary art ecosystem and was uh, developed uh, from a non-profit work model and has advanced artistic ideas in urban context and within culture through exhibitions, festivals, art laboratories, workshops, research and by publishing books, magazines, and online journals. So today we have here Ajang and Marwan. Please. And we have a, a respondent as well, of course, and that's going to be Sophie Maxram, who is going to come up after they finish. So please. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ajeng, and yeah, uh, I'm Mirwan Andan. Uh, we're from Ruang Rupa, a collective based uh, in Jakarta. Uh, and uh, as also, we want to introduce. Uh, maybe some of you already know uh, Sophie, Sophie, who will who will comment our presentations. Uh, no, yeah, actually, we it's not it's it's not it's not really actually a presentation, but it's like a sharing. Uh, well, or telling the stories of uh, uh, what we've been doing. Uh, I, I use the tenses perfect, present perfect continuous tense because it's always in the process making. So yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, but maybe before we start the, the sharing or the hanging out, uh, we want to play some video uh, from Ruang Rupa. So yeah, please enjoy. I hope the video works yeah. well, yeah. Seniman terlebih dahulu lebih, lebih memahami konteks nasionalisme. 
who help Gerobak Bioskop program could as well maintain such of the programs that suits to, the, to them as a part of the local issues and local context that being put that also have a, put in a strategic meaning in, 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 in the socials and and, so, uh, and, 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 and it's gathering in, 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 the, in the public space but not only concerning about the public space and also the screening but Gerobak Bioskop have another content which health the most important thing is about the education through literacy of uh, visual culture and the development of the visual in their own local context and in based on the local necessities Gerobak Bioskop has put uh, lots of uh, exchange through knowledge not only into visual cultures and in and also the development of the visual itself but also in the, in the sort of context in the local area they, they really could contribute and also cross exchange idea not only through the Gerobak Bioskop program but through this program in the communities itself so the sustainability within the Gerobak Bioskop not only about the screening about the media literacies uh, about the spreading of the information and also development of the visual but also this Gerobak Bioskop has been a, a simple compound for locals or within the uh, range of the neighborhood and several in the remote uh, place that near to the community who held this Gerobak Bioskop program it's a part of the, the way of getting alternative or short of a uh, alternative chain of uh, cinema <laughs> So yeah, thank, thank you. you so much. 
mengundang 19 seniman bro karena juga jadi ada 19 seniman ada 19 karya juga can be stop the audio ya yeah. yeah, thank you so much thank you and hope the video is not uh, boring uh, so <laughs> yeah uh, it was actually the 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 feed the it's, it's we, we we've been trying to summarize all the activities uh, and all the ideas uh, we've been doing since the beginning up until now, but it's always uh, sometimes hard to compile them in one short video. So uh, yeah, it's 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 always uh, it's always difficult for us. But but uh, that was the one that we we, we had uh, so far. There are some edited version. Uh, there's there's always edited edited and revised version, but uh, we didn't find it. But this is the one that we we have. In YouTube. Uh, in YouTube. <laughs> so yeah, maybe uh, we can start first to uh, uh, share a bit stories. Uh, start with the space, our our space back in Jakarta, and uh, the one that we are looking now is actually uh, our uh, old space uh, in Tebet area in Jakarta. This is our uh, multifunction room. Sometimes it can be a gallery or uh, for discussion or for workshop or also for screening and some uh, uh, music uh, performance. And just uh, to give uh, a bit context, uh, if we back to the year of 2000, because I think that year is kind of like the transition era, yeah, Bang Andan. So, uh, because before in 1998, it was kind of like a uh, uh, a big moment in Indonesia when the new regime uh, fall down, and then uh, through with this transition, uh, 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 many uh, like people in in the art scene or uh, some activists they uh, uh, use this moment to to form a group or a space and uh, do uh, the expression of what their practices. Uh, Sophie, you can go to the next one, and yeah, and then uh, yeah, like this one is uh, also we invite some uh, uh, fixi community, so they they have an activities in uh, in Ruang Rupa. Uh, our space is very open for everyone as long as it's uh, aligned also with what we 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 support, and yeah, this is a, a exhibition from street artist called Bujangan Urban. Uh, this one is part of the division support and promote. Uh, so we, we support the young artists uh, and promote them. Uh, like we have six times a year during that time, six or seven, seven times to have the exhibition in our gallery. Uh, and yeah, this uh, for a music event and then uh, you can go next, Sophie. Yeah. So basically, uh, like during the time, uh, most of the most of the community or the the art organization they start the their own space from the uh, a, a house or a small house or uh, a medium house. So they change it uh, like the function. For example, the living room they change it as a gallery. And maybe like the bedroom, they change it for like they they works the the, the space for they works like for the office, for example. And uh, it's also mostly it's in the residential area, so it's very close to the neighborhood. Uh, and the price also the cheap one, <laughs> so the affordable, yeah, affordable one. So yeah, uh, and they start from the private space become the public space because mostly they're open for 24 hours, the space. Uh, so you can come every time you want. <laughs> and every there must be someone there, like welcome you or maybe just, I don't know. <laughs> Bring some tea. <laughs> Bring some tea, yeah. And uh, because of also it's in a neighborhood area, uh, it's uh, really affect what we uh, uh, do with our programs. For example, uh, we can go to the next uh, slide. This, uh, this is the first uh, event of the Lonely Market or Holy Market. Uh, and 
we, we, we did it like twice every year. So uh, we invite artists or uh, friends uh, that have uh, something to sell, like also their, their artwork as well. Uh, you want to add? Yeah, yeah. yeah uh yeah, as, as, uh, maybe just keep on. Uh, so as we can see on the images, uh, that uh, if uh, it was already mentioned that it's always started from a living house. So this is also can answer questions that why we mostly most of most of uh, arts and cultural practitioners in Indonesia can it they always combine the daily life and the, the art practices because it's always started from this. A living house, a living room, and then uh, where they organize uh, the 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 public programs. So what is actually private, what is public, somehow it's uh, some sometimes it's uh, sometimes it's blurry or uh, sometimes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You want oh. to join? <laughs> hey, join us. <laughs> want Hi. to join the discussion? <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so, so yeah. The the and it's not only it's not only the it, it is not only the art and cultural practitioner who do, who did this. It was already mentioned that uh, we there was an, an authoritarian regime that was started in 1965 and then it was it was taken down in 1998 and it was lasted for 32 years and soon after that in any places in the world that. In after the post-authoritarian regime, there is always transitional era, and then early 2000 was the the, the year when Ruang Rupa was started or was initiated. It was actually part of this transitional era from authoritarian regime to the openness uh, that uh, swept out the, the archipelago. So yeah. Uh, yeah, and not only the arts and cultural practitioner, but any organization like. Uh, any NGOs uh, that works for human rights or environment or uh, uh, gender issues or uh, ecological issues, it, they, they always started their office. They call they always call it an office after a house, a living house turned to be an office. Uh, because why? Because all the, all of these uh, uh, activities, including uh, what Rang Rupa did, that it was also always started from. Uh, the people who come from uh, mid middle class, uh, uh, middle class, who were, who, who studied, for example, in universities or art school, but uh, middle class to lower uh, class. So uh, mostly they cannot really afford a fancy building to 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 to, to or to purchase a, a building or a house to be to be an office. So yeah. This is maybe I think can also. Yeah. So uh, after like we're moving from one space to another space from 2000 until 2007, and the last uh, image that we saw is actually from the last uh, uh, space uh, since 2007 until 2015. Mm -hmm. So in 2015 we moved to this what we called. Uh, uh, the start of the collective of the collective because uh, the idea is the conversation during that time uh, we're thinking how to uh, how to make like because the 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 rent the rent uh, price uh, the rent cost of the house is getting higher and it's make us kind of like thinking uh, or uh, 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 start to the idea to join together in the one space and make a new ecosystem together with the rest or together with other collective based in Jakarta. So in 2015, uh, 2015 and 16, we start to move this uh, to this warehouse. Uh, it's called uh, Gudang Sarina and we put the ecosystem uh, behind the, the names. So actually Gudang Sarina, Sarina is one of the legend of the shopping mall in yeah. Jakarta. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the warehouse is in uh, South Jakarta. It's not so far from our uh, old space, and uh, actually, it's a big, a big warehouse. It's six thousand meters square. So it's different, totally like uh, the opposite from what we 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 do so far uh, in in our with our old space. Uh, 
and we joined together with uh, two entry uh, uh, Jakarta based collective during that time and the idea is to make it uh, as a uh, public space as well and uh, we have some we still run our own program like each program but we also start to have a joining program together and because of uh, we also need to change uh, before maybe we only we only manage uh, 50 people or 100 people but now we need to manage maybe a thousand people in in Gudang Sarina it was actually also an, an experimentation or a, an effort to it was not uh, an effort to level up, but it was an effort to experiment uh, to form what is called the collective uh, of a collectives. Uh, so as Ajung mentioned, there are several collectives that we've been working with uh, for years and then we discussed the war, but if we move into this warehouse, it's actually, it's, it's actually literally a warehouse. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a warehouse uh, owned by a state-owned uh, state State on enterprise, uh, uh, and the warehouse is uh, very huge. I just already mentioned that when we, from a living house to a huge three buildings like this, it's for us it's it was overwhelming. Yeah. So the experimentation of this uh, collectives of a collectives is also an experimentation of uh, to sink ourselves in an overwhelming situation in a in a huge. Uh, structure like this in buildings like this but yeah we'll 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 tell you more about this that how we how we finally decided to move and then left uh, this warehouse yeah yeah and with uh, when we moved to this uh, warehouse actually uh, it's also the start the starting of what we call this with lumbung uh, lumbung uh, concept yeah. uh, or lumbung approach and then uh, because of like uh, Actually, around 2012, we already we already have this what we call uh, like a unit business. This is also a join uh, 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 with another collective based in Jakarta, and then with Gudang Sarina ecosystem, it's become uh, it changed. Before maybe it's only for like. Uh, how to say it like uh, 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 services that we 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 do like do the exhibition or as a art consultant and so on. Yeah. But now when we move to this Gudang Sarina ecosystem, we really we really uh, do with this uh, the uh, space. Uh, yeah, like it's an effort to uh, profession professionalizing and also yeah. like like the pr the property business kind yeah. of like that. So it's very challenging for us uh, very challenging yeah in, in the beginning it was wrong rupa when it was started it was uh, soon registered as a foundation yeah. but when we moved to gudang sarina uh, yeah. and then we felt that maybe we need to do something else which is uh, also a registered company uh, but together with other yeah with, uh, with uh, by practicing the collectives of people from another collectives to to, to and providing uh, services uh, based on the activities uh, we've been doing, like uh, organizing exhibitions or uh, uh, publishing, and so on and so on. Yeah. Uh, Sophie, can you go for the previous one? Sorry. So yeah, this one is uh, the the sketch of the first scheme yeah. <laughs> for uh, uh, how it's connect uh, to each other. So we have this uh, what we call the unit business is uh, Ruru Corps uh, or RRC and ACC is the art collective compound. It's uh, the entity from each uh, uh, collective and they they the one who running the programs and the activities uh, daily and also we have the radio. So basically everyone everything is connecting and we put together in the in the middle is the, the Gudang Sarna ecosystem, uh, which later soon will become the, the Lumbung. Yeah. So, yeah. And next, yeah, this is the, ins the, the inside of the, the Gudang yeah. Sarina, the warehouse. Uh, we have like li library, public library, uh, studios, and uh, print printmaking studios, and uh, uh, open kitchen as well. And yeah, and, and we rent the space for many uh, events 
exhibitions, uh, uh, music, music concert. Uh, Even there were two biennales were organized. Two Jakarta, two editions of Jakarta Biennales were, were uh, organized uh, in this warehouse. And this one is uh, sorry, the previous one. This one, uh, the f like a flea market. Yeah. Like a holy market, but with the large scale. Yeah. We call it Tumpah Ruah, yeah. so it's around Tumpah Ruah means a uh, uh, landslide, like a... Yeah. And yeah, this is also some exhibitions, and uh, you can continue still. So before, like, when we, uh, like for the OK Video Festival, before we al always use the National Gallery, uh, or the uh, Gallery National Indonesia. Now we do it in our own space in in Gudang Sarina during that time, and this is for the radio station, the Ruru Radio, and yeah. So uh, it's only two years in Gudang Sarina ecosystem yeah, because it's a state-owned enterprise uh, buildings, and then the price is increasing, and then there was a time that they, we 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 couldn't really afford to continue. Yeah, also, uh, so until 2018, then we have an opportunity to move to another uh, space. And it's also a uh, conversation with the other about uh, what kind of platform that we want to have right now. Like, because uh, based on this con uh, the conversation, we realized that we already uh, uh, like working together many years and sharing everything uh, many years. So why why we don't make a new platform that focus on the alternative education, right? Yeah. That's why we 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 make a good school, the Contemporary Art Collective and Ecosystem Studies. Is also uh, to have the open open space uh, for everyone uh, to to share. <laughs> And also, we can learn from them, and then they can learn from us as well. And with this good school, uh, the Contemporary Art Collective and Ecosystem Studies, actually, there's a two: uh, the ecosystem itself, and then the the good school study collective itself. So, with the good school study, uh, you can. Yeah, this one is uh, there's a two programs: the one years program and the short program what we call so short course and with the one year programs we have this uh, 11 subject that we uh, uh, share to the participants and yeah this is the good school right now in Jagakarsa it's uh, how to say it sup, sup. Yeah, uh, it's not really outskirt but uh, a little bit uh a little bit, uh, not, it's not an obstacle, but not so close from the center of the of the capital city. But it's also part of the capital city in the in the southern uh, part of uh, the city. Yeah, and uh, when we have when we found this space, we uh, there's still another like uh, a land beside our space, and then we asked the owner, "What? What if if we join or work together?" So because we also would like to generate income to our uh, collectives, uh, so we make this uh, good site. Uh, this uh, studios actually, uh, and it's uh, rent for artists or uh, anyone, can anyone, including us from Ruang Rupa. We yeah. also like some of us in Ruang Rupa. Uh, who never had uh, any, because as you saw that all the all the all the spaces they had uh, shared before, which were uh, living house, where we we didn't have any rooms in. I mean, we do, we didn't have our own rooms or our, our working space. We can work everywhere, but and then uh, when Good Side was started in 2018, and then uh, there are some rooms, and then it was offered to we we created it, we made it, but also. We need to rent it, like uh, some of us from Wang Rupa, Ade, me, Reza, Indra, we have, we, we rent uh, rooms to be our, to, can be anything, can be studios. Library. I have my own personal library that I turn to be a public library for anyone who want to come to 
sit, read, and then uh, stay even or watching movies there. Yeah. Yeah, and this is the people of Good School Ecosystem. This is when we uh, have our uh, first majlis, majlis, yeah. majlis, first majlis, yeah. or assembly, or this yeah meeting annual uh, monthly meeting. So yeah, we have this uh, also kind of like multifunction room. <clears throat> yeah, and with this with Good School, when when we start Good School, actually there uh, the the development of the Lumbung itself. So. Uh, we start to when when we start this uh, uh, join together with the the other collective. We also it's include everything like tangible, intangible. Like uh, so, everyone who has like programs or idea, human uh, equipment, but less of money actually. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, but it's okay. So the lumbung uh, or it's directly translatable as a rice barn. Uh, actually, it's kind of like a collective pot, and we put our surplus in the in this lumbung to distribute to every uh, uh, collective that needed based on yeah what they need. Uh, yeah, maybe Andan would like to. Yeah, uh, actually, lumbung as may, may, may uh, as maybe some 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 of uh, some of us in this room already know that is a. Uh, is a uh, is a word which is now associated with Documenta 15, uh, uh, the project that we've been working since 2019. And Lumbung itself is not a is not a theme, it's not a theme or it's not a concept that we yeah sometimes we call it a concept, but we are more interested to call it as a practice, uh, a practice which are part of the daily life uh, of Indonesian people. Then and uh, and also it, uh, it it's it's a practice that we've been doing in Ruang Rupa since the beginning and then and then uh, that's also the reason why we can sustain for 22 years. Next April April and uh, next week will be our 22 years anniversary. So yeah, uh, and these pictures illustrate how Lumbung applied as a way of sharing resources, working together. Uh, working together and also uh, this is in a, one of the uh, in, in, a, in a village in South Sulawesi in Indonesia uh, where there is a gathering of uh, people who help their neighbor who's organizing a marriage a ceremony for their uh, children yeah next yeah this is a lumbung one of as a structure as a structure as a building there are many kind of uh, lumbung structure. Uh, there are many kind of lumbung structure or lumbung building in Indonesia. Uh, as you may know, that Indonesia is a is an archipelagic country. It's an archipelago with uh, with uh, seventeen thousand and five hundred twenty something islands, and then each places which there are around two hundred different languages uh, with uh, two hundred more than two hundred million population throughout the archipelago. Any culture, they sometimes they have their own uh, lumbung. Uh, this is one of that. Uh, the, pre the previous one in Duri, it's called Landa uh, in Duri and Rekang, uh, South Sulawesi. And then you can also how it's also uh, mixed with the technology in modern life, where there is a parabola antenna, and then uh, uh, but it's 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 not a living house. This is the place where they put the seeds. This is the this is the place where they put the seeds after harvesting, and then this landa can contain and can keep a seed, a very specific seed, which can only be planted in this area, and then it can it can keep the seed for more than a hundred years, uh, called mandoti. It's a very specific, a very specific rice seeds. Uh, this is maybe also uh, if you uh, this is also since we are in Scandinavian. Uh, since we are in Scandinavian countries, maybe this is also can uh, ring a bell with what people are doing in Svalbard, in Norway, where they, there's a seed fold. Uh, but yeah, this is maybe the same idea, but the one in Svalbard is much more uh, high technology and then can contain more than, uh, as far as I understand, there are around 100,000 varieties of seeds from all over the world. Uh, yeah. And also the structure is uh, under the how to say it? the lumbung <laughs> it's always like 
a, a space for people can hanging out actually for meeting so it's always uh, mostly like that uh, for the lumbung that's why it's it, yeah yeah uh, it's uh, yeah it means that it uh, is a place to store the seeds it's also a place as a shelter yeah. as a shelter to see to hang out to sleep and to yeah to meet uh, to drink and to eat Yeah, this is uh, when we we try to connect or in the context of Documenta 15, we also thinking Documenta as a, a yeah for this uh, sharing 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 resources, uh, right? Like for this lumbung. And this is uh, the three pillars. The, the scheme that we use in a good school ecosystem, uh, the above one is actually the how we uh, think for the, our soul sustainability and the art collective compound is more into the artistic uh, way and the good school is for the, the, the sharing knowledge and everything is connecting and it's give the, the contribution for the Lumbung and Lumbung also will contribute back, uh, yeah. And this is the, uh, the some values that we think have a similarity with the the lumbung practice and the collective practice. Uh, there's a humor, generous, curious, independence, efficiency, locally anchor, uh, and yeah. There is also, but it's not in there. Transparency, uh, regeneration, reg regenerative, yeah. So there are actually seven uh, values we indicate in lumbung. Uh, since also we are, there are also seven deadly sins. So, so the seven seven values we try to uh, to indicate that uh, what lumbung is, uh, how to how to indicate that uh, how lumbung it is uh, a practice uh, or a concept. So yeah, and this is Ruru House uh, in Castle. So during the Documenta 15, actually, this is what we always do as well as the Ruang Rupa mm -hmm. uh, with our practice when we do our uh, projects. Uh, we want to have like, uh, we want to know the stories of this, the place itself, like the stories from human and, and non-human. So, so this uh, Ruru house, we always uh, kind of like make a kind of like a living room in there. Mm -hmm. And so people can come and yeah, uh, uh, just hang out or just uh, have a- Cook, cooking. Cook together yeah. and- Barbecuing. Yeah, or just sitting around. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, this is Ruru house. And yeah, maybe we can skip this. Yeah, and uh, actually, like the collective process, also very important in this context of documenta. That's why we have this uh, uh, fourteen uh, lumbung members. With this, we built this lumbung networks, and also with the artists that we have right now. And yeah, maybe next uh, image. Yeah, and then you. Yeah. Uh, so actually, uh, the. Uh, the, 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 the the stories that we're telling now about uh, Ruang Rupa is actually based on two things, uh, which are uh, spaces that Ajeng already show us from a rented living house to a warehouse and then to uh, to an ecosystem called Good School. Uh, it's a it's about the spaces, and then uh, the second thing is about the humans. Uh, so we can start from this image. This is the space. We had in the previous one, the living house we rented, uh, we organized uh, a residency program inviting uh, kids and also artists to work together uh, and then painting and then drawing on the wall. Uh, next. In the same room also, in the same room, there are also, uh, in, in the very same room uh, with the image, uh, the previous image is where we organize uh, music gigs, uh, small ones, uh, but uh, it's a full house. Uh, next one. Uh, the same room also we organize an exhibition, uh, a regular exhibitions. We, at the same time also we call it as Ruru Gallery. Uh, next. At the same time also we organize the workshop on curatorial uh, 
workshop on writing uh, and we sometimes we organize a, how to say a public speech by inviting a professor from universities that we've been working with uh, like this one uh, Melani Budianta a professor on cultural studies that we've been working uh, many times uh, to we invited her to talk about uh, how uh, cultural studies history and then urban issues entangle each other or link each other uh, next this is a national gallery uh, uh, that we turned to a polka dot. Uh, that we, 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 we put the polka dots in the uh, front wall. Uh, uh, this is the. This is actually the OK Video Festival, a festival that we organized since 2003, and then we always uh, we always use national gallery as a. Uh, main venue uh, along with the venues until we the move to Gudang Sarina um, up until we move to Gudang Sarina and then but uh, yeah this national gallery is that uh, a national gallery uh, that we can talk and we can discuss to we can discuss to uh, the people who be, who are part of this is a this is the installation of the facilities owned by the government but we always find ways to talk to the government on how to and it's really different, maybe it's really different context with uh, what is National Gallery in Western context, uh, or what is National Gallery, or what is National Museum in Western context. But in Indonesia, there, there are always ways uh, to, to approach and then uh, also to use the National Gallery or the National Museum, and then including to speculate by polka dotting the front wall. Uh, and the theme during that time is comedy. Yeah, the theme the theme of this okay video because we always have a different theme each each okay video. Before there was a subversion militia. The time it was in 2019 there was a presidential election, and then we realized two years before we pro we prepared this okay video, and then for us for us it was a comedy, and then uh, yeah we we use the comedy as the theme of this okay video that time. Yeah. Uh, this is in the. <coughs> the old city we, where we work with the students uh, to organize a public uh, art event. Yeah. Next. Yeah, you know, this is also nine of us, ten of us uh, who are so called work for the Documenta 15. Uh, yeah, uh, actually, this, when it was started, Rang Rupa was started by artists. That, that's the reason why it was. Always mentioned that it was an artist initiative, but later, after it was started, uh, two years after it was started, and then there was an awareness that it was impossible to do this with only with the art projects, only with the artists. So people from many different backgrounds uh, started to join, started to hang out, and then they didn't realize, and then they part of the collective. Uh, two of us, uh, Ajeng was trained uh, as a journalist in university. Uh, me myself, I was trained uh, in a couple of uh, disciplines from Islamic studies to French literature to comparative political science. I didn't work as a video journalist before, and so none of us artists. Uh, I mean, none of us went to the art school, but some of us in Ruang Rupa went really went to the art school. But there was this awareness to work with people who don't have a background from the art school. So it's actually to enrich the ideas, to enrich uh, the activities, and also to, exp to expand uh, the, the outreach, uh, to expand more audiences. Uh, yeah. I think that's yeah. yeah, and let's, next. OK, that's it? OK. Yeah. Uh, actually, we, we'll, we'll, we'll love, we, we, we'll, we love better to converse rather than like a one direction talking like this. So looking forward for the conversation. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. And then Thank hope you so it's much, Sophie. Thank you so much for, for this very generous and kind of overarching um, explanation of your practice. Um, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm thinking, do I want to kind of summarize? Maybe I'll anchor a few kind of terms or ideas that were coming out of it. And then I know that you wanted to kind of actually ask other people and we can really have a bit more of a conversation. Um, so things that you kind of talked about was the, the importance of space and humans. 
and almost them as that that is the ecosystem within which your practice exists. There was a very strong emphasis on practices of daily life. So art not being separate from, and in fact, neither of you necessarily coming from a kind of formal artistic practice. And in that sense, Lumbung is both a sort of specific cultural practice and a concept and a method for you. Um, the idea of Lumbung kind of coming from an ecosystem and coming from your learnings um, so that you started from living room, private space, public space, expanding into thinking about ecosystems, expanding then into thinking about Lumbung, and now bringing Lumbung also more into the international space. And something that might actually be interesting to come back to is, of course, in the context of Documenta, what that relocalization or delocalization or how you're, how you're relating the different localities of your practice as you kind of begin to, to work even more extensively abroad. Of course, you've also worked at Sonsbeck, you're also working with Buck. There are other ways in which you're already doing that. Um, and the other, maybe a key theme that would be of interest to some people in the room is, of course, this idea of collectives. And like, what does it mean to work as a collective, as a collective of collectives? Um, so yeah, those are, those are the kind of pieces that I, I picked out. Um, but maybe I want to hand it back to you. Are there things you'd like to know from the audience or invite out? Yeah. How is everyone? Are there questions? I see one from Gabor in the back. Thank you for sharing. Hello. Um, my name is Gabor Ehrlich. I'm an artist, activist, researcher currently a trainee at this fine art program. I'm originally from Eastern Europe. Um, and I have been, as an artist, uh, I have been working within a collective, so it's good that you mention collectives, because my question is, it's really, really amazing to see that there is a collective working together, even expanding over the span of like 22 years. It's almost unheard of, and it's definitely far from, from my experience. So my question would be about, how do you guys work your community? How do you manage it? And especially, how do you address issues of like burning out? Or how do you nurture the collective so it keeps going? Thank you for the question. Actually, we learned a lot from, a from music bands. Like Metallica, it was started in the 80s. When they're, still <laughs> doing, they're still around. Uh, they're still around. So 22 years, it's actually for us. When it was started, uh, uh, the, when it was started, they say that uh, the the founders were oh, it's it's not it's not going to be long. So maybe only a year, and then we will be disbanded, and then everyone will be busy with their own. But but uh, the reason why of the reason why that uh, uh, for me from inside to see why Rong Rupa can 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 sustain for 22 years, and then we can have more years to come. Is that because everything is always in the process making? Uh, yeah, I think that we mentioned this yesterday that uh, we always uh, we, we 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 do not really we never really had a, a a hardcore target that we need to be like that we need to be like this and then we need to really achieve that and we really need to achieve there. So, but it's it's more in it's it's more like uh, everything in the process. Uh, uh, why everything is in the, everything is in the process? Because we like to hang out. We like to hang out, and then we like to have a table. We have to. We like to have a majlis where we sit and then share everything, like uh, food, uh, uh, even money, even even context, or books, or knowledge, tangible or intangible, uh, tangible or intangible uh, objects, non-objects, uh, jokes, humors. Knowledge, uh, anything, uh, gossips, and, and ev everything. Uh, that's uh, that's that's even uh, for us uh, make us uh, really thinking that with this process making, uh, it's uh, we always we, we we always enjoy the moment. Uh, we don't burden ourselves uh, to the future. I I I, 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 I agree with. What Maria said yesterday that uh, let's do not really look into the future, but let's pull the future into the present. Uh, this is really a very beautiful metaphor on uh, what, 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 what what we do. Uh, another friend in Australia, maybe maybe some of you know him, uh, Nikos Papastergiadis. He even told us that uh, 
we this he said that we we endure the present so uh, as a as a as an art theorist nikos has a has an argument for this that maybe we need to ask him why did he say that we endure the present so yeah i maybe want to yeah i just want to add a bit uh <clears throat> there's a uh yeah there's a kind of like how to say like life cy cycle when uh, we also see if this as an organization there's when you 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 uh you born and then there's like a trap and then there's a, a time when when you have many challenge challenging time and there's a time that maybe you uh, died but then you reborn uh like rebirth so this is also what uh i think what happened or what uh, we we in our journey as a wrong rupa because actually me and andan was not in the very first generation of ruang rupa actually maybe i'm third you second <laughs> so yeah so i'm uh, yeah, we're not like not, not in the first uh, generation of uh, ruang rupa but then uh, we, we we still can as long as we still can uh, sit together and uh, uh, talk together. I think it's what makes us also can uh, 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 until now we can like yeah we, we can stand until now. And then there's also uh, the things is maybe it's also different if now we only like ruang rupa self because in the journey we we start to join with other collectives. That's that is part of the the transition. Do you know what I mean? Like it's like maybe. Uh, some some uh, organization they also uh, change, so they not really stop, but they just change the uh, maybe the same practice, but just change the people who who is in the org or in the organizing. So yeah, I think that's part of the why we can stand until now as a ruang rupa or as a good school ecosystem. So yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Martet and I'm Askapur, one of the uh, PhD students. Um, I really appreciate your uh, presentation. I'm really curious. I got the opportunity to visit uh, Ruru House last year mm -hmm. and I know it's been a challenge to, to navigate also this conversation with Documenta. Um, I'm just, could you maybe reflect or share some of your experiences, some of your experiences or learning of this process? Uh, because you have a very particular practice and I'm sure there are, you know, some, um, some challenges that you have to come to terms with in that negotiation. And I'm maybe also particularly interested in um, this aspiration of, of sharing the resources and and how how you navigate that particular conversation with 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 documenta about money for instance but i know that you have a broader conception of of resources as well yeah uh, when we were invited or when we were emailed to send to send uh, what was called as a like a short proposal or uh, whatever or uh, expression of interest to be the to be the artistic director of documenta 15 the invitation we re responded with the invitation back to documenta so we said that thanks for our invitation but we here we invite you back are you going to work with the practice that we've been working on for 22 years which is called what we call lumbung is a sharing resources is a sharing resources is uh, is a is a, a practice that uh, people can access resources they already been in there, uh, stored in there. Uh, not only uh, those resources in the f is not only to to be accessed during the tough situation during the crisis, but also uh, it's also a practice uh, to enjoy or to enjoy or to celebrate uh, the harvesting, uh, and that's why we need to share. And then that's how it works. That's how it works. And then they say, okay. Uh, and then we also explain later that if if 
people always see uh, a mega event or a mega institution like Documenta is the only resources and then we tell Documenta that we are also resources. We are resources of human resources, we are the resources of networking, we are the resources of knowledge, we are the resources of network of not only in the southern hemisphere of the world but also with the with the context of networks we have in the northern hemisphere of the world if you want to work with this uh, binary uh, hemisphere of the world uh, and uh, yeah that's that's how it works and then we follow all the protocols we came to the interview and then they they uh, it was announced that we we are going to be the we are the artistic director of documenta 15 uh, actually, at that time, we, uh, we 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 have many. We have the same question: that uh, how do we work? How do we, uh, as uh, as uh, Sopi mentioned, is is there the the localizing or localizing some uh, concept? Uh, and uh, we came to Castle the first time when it was announced. Uh, we didn't we, we didn't uh, soon thinking about what we want to do. Who are the artists we want to invite? What programs you want to formulate, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, what we s what we said is that we wanted to hang out. Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> maybe maybe also I remember when we we got <clears throat> uh, invited. Uh, the things that were talks very firstly is because we just moved to good school and we just start the good school ecosystem so it's really take a risk of us when if we decide to say yes to documenta because yeah it will take our energy and our mind or our life <laughs> very much so but then <clears throat> uh as, as long as it's uh, still uh, again still align what uh, with what we do or what we achieve in our ecosystem as a, a, a to build another uh, networking with lumbung approaches so that's why that's uh, our our proposal or our invitation to to documenta back so yeah that's so yeah uh, i hope it answer but also but also uh, soon after it was announced we really understand and we really realize Ajang also already mentioned it how do we work on our context how do we how do how not to lose our context while working in a con in a European context which is documenta uh, however documenta is always associated with castle it's in Germany it's in Western Europe uh, different culture different language and everything and so there was there was we really question ourselves we really challenge ourselves are we going to take it or not uh, uh, take it or leave it. That's that's the question. To be or not to be. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, we said, okay. <laughs> Just one more thing. We always like imagine uh, we're nine of us, and it's still kind of like a very exhausting thing. And we can imagine the previous one that only maybe have one or at least two artistic directors. So yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we tried. Uh, and then okay, we f we decided okay, uh, we take this, and then but uh, say uh, we take this, b but we really need to still work on our context. That's why that uh, ten of us uh, in, the, in the artistic uh, team uh, from Rang Rupa, uh, only two of us uh, finally started to live in Castle from 2020, 20 in June during the really hardcore pandemic situation but we decided actually there were uh, the early idea three of us but and finally it was decided okay two of us uh, will be there but in the rest of us will be shifting like i think this is the uh, it's been since 2019 there were many times we coming back and forth from jakarta castle uh, it's even more uh, f uh, far from for me because i live my family is in makassar and then makassar jakarta and then it's always uh, those three locations, uh, but yeah, uh, we make it up until now. Uh, so far, so good. Uh, we're still alive, <laughs> still in one piece, and then, <laughs> and yeah, uh, hope we can also uh, make it uh, up until the opening, and then up un until 100 days, and then yeah, hope so, and then uh, yeah, uh, and soon after it was announced, we. We came to Castle and then we invited uh, some of our friends from uh, some corners of the world to be the artistic team. And then we call it uh, Ruang Rupa Extended. Uh, we invited uh, six of our friends from 
from many places that we've been working with many times, or we just know, but uh, uh, there is a sense of locally anchoring. We, we, we asked two friends from Castle to be part of this uh, artistic team. And then the same, with, uh, we, when we asked them to, it was a very short, uh, it was a very short notice, we invited them to come to Indonesia. Uh, to hang out in a camping ground next to the forest. And then we said, it's up to you, you want or not, uh, but if you want to come, we're very happy. And then, uh, God sei dank, all of them came. And then, uh, uh, all of them came, we hang out for a couple of days, and then we tried to hang out, and then discussing about what we're going to do with Documenta 15. <laughs> and then, yeah, we tried to... Uh, discuss about the Lumbung concept, what we've been trying to, we, what we've been practicing, and then that's how it goes. Uh, the thing is that we are we are not going to be unidentified flying uh, object coming to castle and then doing exhibition for 100 days, and then after that left, leave, uh, fly fly away to somewhere else doing something the same thing. But what we want to do is to really have the sense of castle as a locality. Uh, castle or as a locality, uh, castle as a locality, but also at the same time bringing all the sense of the world that into this place, and then what castle also give back to the rest of the world. Uh, so what's and it's also make it possible because of documentas duration of preparation is three or four years, with the with the approach of uh, this practice of lumbung. We don't think so. It works. Like let's say this 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 approach of lumbung <laughs> is practiced in a biennale, which is only the preparation like a, one year and a half, or maybe a year, or even less than a year. It doesn't work. But because documenta have more spaces and duration of preparation, so it makes sense. That's the reason why we we experiment with many ways. Like uh, we are always asked that uh, how does it work? Uh, how does how does it work with the different culture? With a different situation, with a different structure, but the good thing is that we really we, we know that uh, in German language uh, there is a concept which is called Ausnahme, uh, the exception. So we really like this concept of, of Ausnahme that even though German is well known with a very structured uh, society, very structured language, always sometimes it's a stereotype that German people are uh, the sense of humor is different, but. We find we find that it's it's you know it's uh, we 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 organize rural house as a place of these things to have jokes to have humor to cook the to hang out with our with our fellows German friends or our friends from many uh, places of the world. When we organize to uh, announce the name of the artist, we didn't do it in a luxurious hotel with the uh, with the uh, with the lamps or a camera shooting us. But uh, we organize it by working with the street magazine called Asphalt, and it's fine. Uh, and then also, we have we experiment what we call as a mini majlis, where the artists are invited. All the invited artists are we 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 discuss with if, if, with with each artist to be in this mini majlis, like a small group, to discuss each other, uh, because as we know, the any events like art events. Each artist only know each other, all of artists only know each other during the opening. There was no process of knowing each other or sharing resources, sharing knowledge, sharing experience during the preparation. And Documenta make it possible because the duration of preparation is longer. So yeah, uh, they, they, this is also a way of practicing and experimenting of sharing resources and uh, working together toward into something that we, we hope can sustain uh, not only 100 days, but in the more years to come. Yeah, sorry if it's too long. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, uh, Ajang, Mirwan, and Sophie. Um, our uh, our fourth and final, well, fifth actually, and final speaker is uh, Thomas Paus, uh, who is an artist and researcher uh, living here in Reykjavik. Uh, Thomas Thomas's transdisciplinary practice explores 
alternative ecologies and unforeseen interactions between life forms, technologies, and media. He also writes critical essays and fiction. Uh, Thomas is director of MA Design Explorations and assistant professor at the Iceland uh, University of the Arts and will be artist in residence at the Laboratoire Modulaire uh, this coming year. So please, Thomas. And the respondent is going to be Bilke Hastemir, who is, like the others, one of our ESRs. Thank you so much. Um, can you hear me okay? Great, okay. Yes, uh, very happy to be here. So thanks for the invitation and uh, thank you for the talk just now, super inspiring. Uh, I, uh, I entitled my talk Collective Ecologies and um, the exact topic hasn't settled yet. So, um, and uh, I think it's uh, <laughs> actually probably will never settle. But uh, I was going to talk mostly about uh, ecology in my practice um, as, in, uh, as a topic that I'm dealing with through projects uh, and different, dealing with different ecosystems. But after discussions uh, and some really sharp questions from uh, Bilke, I, I've decided to ask myself uh, another question in regarding to, uh, to ecology. Uh, which is uh, what ecologies am I participating in in my work? Uh, because I've been moving around and working in different countries and uh, landscape, uh, sometimes uh, on my own, sometimes with collectives, uh, sometimes as an educator. And uh, so what, are, what ecologies am I participating in in my work and what ecologies am I building when I'm making a project? Because uh, I think... Uh, one of the conclusions after looking at, at my projects through this angle is that maybe the aim of my work is actually that, just uh, what uh, relations are happening with the uh, people I'm working with, the institutions I'm working with, the ecosystems I'm working with, and uh, what is the legacy of this work. Um, for example, a lot of the projects are uh, temporary, for example, or ephemeral, if you take a natural metaphor, um, and uh, is that uh, something that has also a legacy to be an ephemeral project, uh, as a, you know, opposing to being a long-lasting, more institutionalized thing. And also another thing which comes from my training in design uh, is uh, that I'm always interested in the technologies that make uh, projects possible and also the technologies through which we uh, relate with the environment. So that is, I guess, a uh, sort of uh, underlying question. So I've divided the talk in two. Uh, one is I'm going to talk about projects which relate mostly to food ecologies uh, and uh, vernacular and accessible technologies in relation to the production of food uh, through uh, three specific uh, projects. And the second one would be uh, more than human ecologies, which is uh, a topic that I've, I've been more recently getting more and more involved in um, through uh, my work, um, and also the sensing technologies which are making it possible. So I'm starting uh, with the food ecologies, and I'm going to talk about three projects. One is a, a book called uh, Revisiting the Community Shed. Uh, which was made in collaboration with allotment gardeners in London that are these shared gardens where people grow food in the city. Another project uh, was made with a collective called Evening Class uh, in London, which is a self-organized group, um, and it's called A Living Almanac of Appropriate Technologies. And the third one is a more, uh, as a frame which is uh, more institutionalized, it's a residency at the Delphina Foundation in London called The Politics of Food, um, where I was in residence and uh, working uh, and then producing some text for this uh, publication. So, yeah, the Revisiting the Community Shed is a project that uh, I, uh, I did when I was in London. I was living in London for 12 years. Uh, studying there and working there uh, before doing a master in design. And uh, what interested me particularly uh, in the allotment gardens, which are these gardens which uh, 
are called also workers' garden or uh, shared gardens in, in the UK, there's similar uh, models in Paris and other countries, uh, was the, the sort of, that it's a space and a landscape which is uh, collectively built, so there is not like a, a design of it, which is prior to people actually uh, making it happen. And uh, it's also, in terms of ecology, uh, immediately this gives like a very collective sense to the word ecology, as in all the decisions are taken collectively. Uh, and uh, people are very conscious of, of each other's environments. And so I, I basically I was documenting uh, allotment gardens um, when I was in London, and also myself uh, growing vegetables. And um, when I started studying design, I was really kind of... Uh, it interested me that there was this, uh, you know, uh, aesthetic uh, version of things that were happening in allotment gardens in a more sort of uh, organic way or for more uh, practical reasons, such as recycling. So, you know, it was a huge thing about um, this style of design when I was studying, um, which was, you know, aimed at galleries, um, but using exactly, you know, very similar sort of aesthetic that what you would find in allotment gardens for totally different reasons. Um, Another example of that, of that was uh, when I was in London, the, uh, the trend of like uh, good bread started, which was great, because for a few years the bread was horrible, but then it was starting suddenly to realize that you, know, you could actually bake really good bread and uh, sourdough bread became huge and a uh, similar thing happened in Iceland recently. Um, and then, you know, a lot of people had access, if you had money, to very good bread. And then on the other side, in the allotment that I was um, Visiting, there were also these communities of uh, people baking bread from different countries. Uh, on the right side is like a bread oven in allotment in Brixton. Um, but these these spaces and this kind of bread was not valorized as much uh, as the the one which is uh, on the left. And also, uh, for example, in the allotments, the communities that were baking bread were also uh, experimenting with like ancient grain and growing ancient grain. So uh, uh, basically having a much uh, deeper sort of uh, uh, interest and work in the actual uh, ecology around, around bread. So anyway, I was very basically documenting these different uh, technologies in relation to food production in allotments. And I was particularly um, fond and uh, entangled, let's say, in a place called Manor Garden Allotments. Some of you might have heard of it. So it's... Uh, it was an allotment garden in East London, which was very multicultural uh, and had existed for 80 years. And uh, at the time was unfortunately uh, in a spot where uh, the Olympic Games were about to be built. So the Olympic Park in London. And um, there was no, no, absolutely no reason to not, it was basically a road that was gonna go to the Olymp Olympic Park um, that was going through this space, which could have gone another way. But uh, basically, these uh, gardens were uh, destroyed, and the gardeners were <coughs> evicted uh, from the garden. And so this became a very, uh, very personal topic for me. And I, I uh, started working on this project called Revisiting the Community Shed, uh, which was uh, basically interviews. Uh, it's a publication archiving a collective ecology through a survey of temporary spaces built by allotment gardeners. And I made some interviews with the gardeners um, using actually uh, a sort of format of interviews which, was, which is used normally when people are, are delocated from a place. So sort of using this formal language of the questionnaire for people who are delocated, uh, but turning it back and trying to uh, give a voice to this, uh, this community. And I gathered all the interview in a, in a publication which had uh, some practical information, but also a lot of stories and memories which uh, uh, were basically embedded, embedded in that particular uh, site. Um, yes, and the second part of the project was uh, a rebuilding of a particular uh, part of this garden, which came back uh, in a lot of the interviews as a sort of central uh, part of this place, which was, I guess, the kind of uh, lumbung of the allotment, <laughs> which was the community shed, uh, hence the title, which is where uh, everybody was gathering to take decisions about the garden, uh, talk about the rent, talk about, uh, you know, the, uh, who was responsible for uh, different tasks or um, uh, 
uh, things that could be shared, etc., etc. So this community shed was uh, basically this uh, very important place, and um, I rebuilt it more uh, faithful to the spirit than to the actual look of it. So it was made with re recycled material, and uh, I was myself a student at the time at the RCA in London, so I rebuilt it with recycling things from my environment, and it ended up looking like this. Um, and uh, it was uh, outside for, uh, I think, uh, four months, and uh, I invited the gardeners to come there and have discussions with uh, my colleague students in design and architecture, and sort of creating this uh, space for discussion and um, uh, an exchange between these uh, communities. So in a sense, that's the, the ecology that sort of came from this project. So you know, mixing gardeners, designers, architects, and planners um, in this temporary building. Uh, and um, the legacy of that was the contacts that were made. And uh, for example, some students in design started to design uh, you know, um, uh, flyers and things uh, which were related to the campaign of the allotments. So there were some, uh, you know, affiliations that happened uh, a bit informally through this, uh, this temporary project. So this was the first project. And um, I'm jumping between countries because uh, we're in Iceland and I, I feel like I should also mention things which I'm doing here. So uh, as was mentioned, I'm, I'm teaching at the Aston University of the Arts. Uh, and when I, came, uh, when I came to Iceland, I was... Uh, I was lucky to be asked what sort of uh, topic I was interested in teaching, and, and I decided to uh, talk about food systems and, and, and started or one of the courses I was responsible for was food systems uh, in Iceland, which is a really interesting topic to dig in uh, with all the, the challenges in terms of food production, the weather, the, um, <clears throat> and the distance for things to be coming to Iceland. And uh, so Doing this course, a lot of projects were happening, really interesting things from students about you know, um, possibilities in terms of growing food, different technologies uh, were uh, invented uh, and tested by the students. And, but the thing is, there was not really anywhere to go for this project. So it was a bit uh, depressing to see all these really good ideas to transform food system in Iceland. Um, ended that you know in a crit <laughs> and then uh, disappearing or if some of them were existing uh, they were actually quite often recuperated by uh, um, another sort of uh, possibility where, where you wanted a project which was this, this startup culture so you know and becoming immediately you know sort of startups uh, in terms of uh, which enters a totally different ecosystem of, of, of making money and etc but some of the projects could not, you know, were not about this. And so um, I uh, was talking to friends at the Agricultural University and they had this greenhouse which was uh, abandoned basically, uh, not too far from Reykjavik, about 10 minutes from here, and uh, it was ideal. So uh, as a space that we, we thought could become uh, a place to continue these projects that came out of the food system course. So uh, a sort of incubator, if you like, <laughs> if you use the startup uh, language, but where students could continue working with waste or, or developing a certain type of uh, plant or something they were interested in. And so we uh, got a grant, put the three universities together, including uh, Howie, because um, one of the person in this Corpa collective then uh, was studying environmental science. Uh, and so I'm going to just read the description of the one of my colleagues just kindly sent me the description two minutes ago because I lost it. So there you go. What is Corpa? Corpa Studio is a suburban farming club initiated by a collective of designers, agricultural scientists, um, Sorry. Agricultural scientists and environmental thinkers near Reykjavik, Iceland. The project is based in a disused farm and greenhouse at the site of Korpa and prototypes new modes of commoning, uh, knowledge sharing, and food centered social activism. Our activities are based on local need for an alternative way to grow food and relate to food in a context dominated by intensive farming and imported products, Iceland. 
From our various backgrounds and practices, we have identified the need for a new type of shared space with an open-ended agenda and an interdisciplinary ethos. So um, it's very uh, difficult to summarize um, everything that happened in that space. Uh, one of the things was, of course, uh, we were eating great food and sharing meals uh, with other people, and as well as testing, uh, as I was saying, different types of uh, crops, uh, and also what to do with uh, waste, like fermenting, etc. Um, some of the projects that were conducted there were uh, research on growing alternative crops, such as quinoa and samphire, some material studies on how to use agri agricultural waste to make biomaterials, fermentation of local grains to make sake, really good sake, collective outdoor fire cooking events, lichen and fungi observation and documentation workshops. So um, it was a really um, short project uh, which lasted over two summers uh, plus you know the year in between um, and uh, but nonetheless i think it was uh, it acted as a catalyst and a sort of proof of concept that uh, a space like this was uh, spaces like this could be necessary in iceland um, and uh, the the space now is unfortunately uh, been closed down uh, due to the building being uh, having some asbestos but um, Again, the community, that the ecology that was created uh, is still talking together. So what happened there is, has a legacy in that sense. So a lot of uh, friends from the agricultural science are working with designers, designers working on food-related projects, um, etc. So that was the second project in terms of uh, food systems. So yeah, the value in these ephemeral projects is to act as a catalyst or relay for alternative ecologies, they promote a communal use of space for local food growing and a different experience of time. Um, so after these two projects, I uh, was invited, and, and some other ones, I was invited to uh, be a resident in uh, the Delfina Foundation program, The Politics of Food, uh, which um, is inve investigating uh, markets and movements. Uh, over 12 weeks, artists, curators, and thinkers were invited to in investigate the production and distribution of food and explore complex and urgent issues, including but not limited to agricultural labor, seasonal migration, development of biotechnological food sciences, food sovereignty and heritage, from grains to recipes to production methods, how food features in radical collective political movements, as well as the increase of individual consumer choice and its impact on the wider global food economy. And uh, when I was invited to, to go to London, uh, my, uh, of course, first um, uh, instinct was to go back to the allotment gardens and uh, my people, my community there. Uh, so I went back to the same places that I was uh, uh, studying when I was uh, at the RCA, but looking at it through the angle of climate change and, uh, and pollution and this kind of environmental fa factors. Uh, so a lot of allotments were of, are also subjected to floods, uh, are also subjected to pollution, uh, soil pollution, for example. So it's a sort of microcosm of what is happening uh, globally, if you like. And, but one of the things, for example, this, um, this map is from a, a project called the London Earth Project which is basically comes from like a survey of soil pollution um, in the UK. But the thing is, uh, the resolution that you get is, is, is too big to know exactly um, the pollution in your individual garden. So uh, this question of the scale and also the, the kind of access to, to the sensing technology itself uh, became part of my project. Um, and um, in order to... Um, develop some, uh, some possible accessible tools to monitor the environmental uh, issues in, in, uh, in the allotments. I organized some workshops uh, with the gardeners and some uh, biohackers. So there was a space in Hackney called the biohacking space at the time. And so um, it was, the idea was to take these two communities and see how they could uh, help each other. Uh, so it was, these were workshops was called Invisible Gardening. Um, dealing with all the invisible factors in growing food. 
and uh, we were making prototypes of accessible tools using mostly uh, Arduino technology for, uh, for gardeners. And uh, it was a bit of a utopian idea. I mean, if you think about the community in these allotment gardens, it was, there were a lot of pensioners, um, so people that might not, you know, really want to get into learning Arduino. Uh, but um, we, the idea was, again, to create a connection with others that can do it, yeah. Um, and then, and so one of, one of the legacy of this project was uh, some, uh, some articles <laughs> about this, these possibilities, as well as, uh, as well as the workshops themselves, again, where people were uh, exchanging knowledge. Uh, and also uh, the publication Politics of Food, which uh, regroups also all the other projects of the resident. Uh, if you're interested, it's a really, uh, really amazing archive, actually. Very political stuff. Um, and uh, an exhibition at the Victoria and Albert Museum. Yeah, and I will come back a bit later to the actual technology of uh, sensors and this idea of democratizing environmental data. Um, but uh, now I'm going to move on to the last project in this food um, ecologies, uh, which is, was made in collaboration with a collective called Evening Class, which is a self-organized collective in London. Uh, different description. So Evening Class is an experiment in self-organized education that has been active since January 2016. It's a space where we can cultivate common interests, develop research, and collectively decide the class's program. Our program takes the form of public workshops, talks, and debates. Anybody knows Evening Class? Not been in London, no? Uh, in, yeah. Yes, public workshop talks and debates, reading groups, radio, bro radio broadcasting, performances, walks and publishing. And uh, so this collective is, uh, the idea was that they were all uh, designers and then they all had to work uh, for a living in London, in, generally in some advertising agency or something similar but they still wanted to uh, learn other things and question uh, modes of production, etc. And so they basically self-organized their uh, master, if you like, uh, education. And when they invited me to, to come and do a workshop, I, um, I was uh, at the time really interested in uh, this uh, particular um, time uh, when uh, technolo uh, technology and ecology um, started to sort of, um, or, or questioning technology and, and question around ecology started to, to merge together um, at the time where the whole Earth catalog came out. And um, I luckily uh, stumbled upon the entire collection of the Whole Earth Review. I don't know if you know this magazine. So the Whole Earth Review, this is one of the, one of the um, uh, review on the left there. Is, uh, was a, a catalog that, that was started by Stuart Brandt and um, a lot of uh, people that were involved in early computing and uh, developed the development of early technology relating to computers, but really thinking about it in a sort of democratic way, democratizing technology at the time. Uh, but also they, they were hanging with a lot of uh, ecologists or early ecologists. And so the, the articles in there for me were really relevant today. Uh, and so I, I found an entire collection of this catalog and we decided to um, make a sort of a best of with the uh, evening class, which uh, happened in a workshop, uh, which was quite um, uh, in itself a really interesting uh, sort of uh, editing time with discussions of what we thought was uh, the most relevant today in these articles. And uh, <clears throat> done very low tech with a scanner and, and just uh, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of work, reading and uh, and discussing, and so the outcome of this was uh, one we had this uh, whole collection bookmarked with a, a very clever system of uh, topics and uh, and colors, and we had this for in display in different uh, places, 
And then we got the budget through the Arsenal University of the Arts to, uh, to publish the actual uh, best of, so uh, to make a publication from this, this article. So these are the theme that we managed to <laughs> narrow down, if you call it narrowing down, that we were uh, interested in and thought were more relevant in terms of ecology uh, uh, today. And uh, so this is the publication which happened with evening class. And um, that was the third one in the food ecology project. Can you remind me how, how long now do I have? Because I got a bit lost. Well, No, yeah, yeah, no. officially. You can give up a few more minutes, maybe. A few more minutes, okay, good. Uh, good. I'll go until five minutes, something like that? Yeah, okay, good. Um, so now moving, so I'll go very quickly in the last, in the last part. Um, modern human ecology. So again, it's like how, you know, in some projects, this sort of modern human uh, actors started to become part of the ecology of the project. Uh, and the first one was a residency uh, in India uh, at the NCBS, which is a research center for uh, biological sciences. And there I was working with uh, researchers that are studying pollination. Um, and I, pollination, for many reasons, I think is an interesting topic. Um, and uh, these particular researchers were thinking about how can we improve pollination in greenhouses. So. Uh, Many, a lot of uh, crops are not grown in greenhouses. A lot of greenhouses are uh, dependent on pollination from uh, pollinators which are imported. And uh, unfortunately, they don't want to pollinate sometimes uh, the crops they should be pollinated. And so these scientists are trying to understand why and if they can uh, seduce them, if you like, into uh, pollinating certain crops. And to do that, the, the fundamental research is to uh, understand what attracts this, the insect, the pollinator, to certain flowers. And uh, particularly, they, uh, so they, are, they were gathering data by observing, and then they wanted to develop a VR um, version, a system where they could uh, have pollinators experiencing different things in the VR and study what attracts them more than other things. And so I helped them with this project. Um, and the the virtual reality involved also uh, scent and uh, air pressure and different things. So it's quite a complex uh, um, system. But uh, I was particularly working on the, the flower itself. Um, and they really hired me as a designer, which, um, which was uh, great to sometimes you know, have a very sort of uh, specific role. But the, the lab itself, uh, we're going to talk hopefully about collaboration uh, in a bit, uh, was very, very interdisciplinary, and uh, the scientists were very provocative. So um, it was a very interesting experience to work with them. And uh, when I was working on this, so the, for me, the idea of like taking data, transferring it into a form of a flower um, seemed a little bit sort of uh, too uh, easy and too simple. and. Um, there are actually a lot of texts which are questioning this idea, you know, that uh, everything is functional in nature. I'm not going to have time to go around it, but if you're interested, there is a, a really nice one called Involutionary Momentum, which is basically a um, feminist uh, a reading of, uh, of Darwin and uh, his experiments between uh, bees and orchids, so pollination. And just to be short, uh, these authors uh, question this idea that, you know, um, uh, you can that every form in nature is responding to a certain function and wants to reintroduce play and other aspects uh, of interactions in um, in the interactions in ecology. So um, yeah, I'm not going to talk too much about the the results of the <coughs> of the project, but more this idea that um, if we have to think, yeah. So this is the. If you like the ecology of this of this uh, project was flowers, pollinators, humans, and machine in capsular ecosystems, and maybe I will just finish on that. Uh, so this uh, term capsulary ecosystem, capsular ecosystems, uh, is taken from um, a philosopher that I worked with called uh, Segolen Guinar. So we made a pub publication about the non-flowers project, which was. Um, including some critical views on this idea of uh, this, on the experiment itself. And uh, uh, Segolen, she's describing this uh, 
capsular ecosystems or capsular communities, which uh, include you know, greenhouses for food production, uh, as well as experiments in making biospheres, uh, as well as some fantasies of you know, where we will leave uh, Earth for other planets. But I think her uh, take on it is very interesting, and she is not um, uh, Manichaean or saying that we should not uh, be developing this artificial ecosystem, but more that in these ecologies that we are building, in these ecosystems, we need to uh, also uh, strive to create unforeseen interactions. Um, so within capsule communities, could we invent technologies and practices that would maximize the possibilities of encounters between humans and non-humans? and make space for untamed, unexpected, and unforeseen interactions, which actually constitute the texture of life. So, um, yeah, um, should I finish now? One more project? I don't know, you just tell me. I, I, I'm not sure what time I'm supposed to finish. What time am I supposed to? One more, okay. Because <laughs> we started totally late, so. Um, yeah, last one. Maybe that's, that's a good one to finish with. Uh, so the Swamp Pavilion, that was... Um, sorry, should be a video there. No. Uh, it was at the Venice Architecture Biennale in 2018, uh, which was uh, a pavilion that uh, questioned this idea of like, having like, a national pavilion. Uh, so they didn't want to uh, have it for a particular country, but to base it around international group of people that was working on the topic of swamps or wetlands. And um, it was a really interesting group, a very varied group coming from uh, art to activism to ecology to um, <clears throat> many different areas. And um, everybody was uh, working in this uh, sort of space which was in Venice uh, towards um, uh, specific task and the idea was to create sort of symbiotic sort of discussions between the different actors of this uh, swamp pavilion and my particular work was on coastal plants um, and uh, I researched uh, a plant which is on the coast of Venice as well as on the coast uh, of France and the UK uh, which is called samphire and which is basically a, a sort of natural barrier for um, erosion and um, <clears throat> the, uh, the project uh, became um, quite provocative in the sense that I was trying to describe the plant as an architect in the Architecture Biennale. And there was a series of open lectures to, um, to present this plant as an architect. So this was the Swamp School. And this idea of like basing a school, if you like, around an ecosystem or a specific type of ecology is something I'm quite uh, intrigued by and, and thinking about here. So I'm, currently um, designing a program for the Academy of the Arts, the University of the Arts, sorry, and uh, one of the ideas to make it really specific around an ecosy ecosystem uh, which is in Iceland. And so this, uh, this Swamp Pavilion experiment was uh, in a way very formative in, this, in these ideas. And uh, if you want to read more, so there's an, uh, one article which came out from this research was published recently in a performance philosophy journal called Making Your Own Land and Internet Intertidal Aesthetics. And um, it will be also published in an extended way in a book called Swamps and the New Imagination uh, sometimes this summer. Yeah. So I'm going to stop here. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Milge. Thank you, Thomas. Um, they are really inspiring projects, and maybe better to call some of them experimentation, experimentation with new stories, sensibilities, and calling for thinking and feeling in terms of the place we call inhabit with the other living species, incorporating human and non-human life forms, environmental situations, events, technologies, mediations, and diverse flows of materials and also energies which also involve entanglements between technosphere and bio biosphere and the different aesthetic, um, aesthetic responses to the environment. And I see your practice resonating with the demand, um, demand, with, uh, demand of thinking with, um, abandoning pre-existing assumptions and inviting us to open ourselves to yet to be discovered 
um, ways of looking at the world and constructing kind of diversified knowledge of other species beings with which we co-inhabit on Earth. And this knowledge is inevitably founded on observation, so fluid, and never final, comparative, empathetically verified, but also uncertain sometimes. And in connection with the uh, cross-pollination of art, design, science, and ecology in your practice, my starting question would be, what are the potentials transdisciplinary practices hold, and what kind of resources and infrastructures are needed for long-term collaborations? Um, and also adding to this, um, as you are also using sensor technologies for, for field observation and uh, gathering sensory and environmental, environment, sorry, environmental registers, is there perhaps a way in which the environmental data recorded initially for artistic and aesthetic purposes become more political and lead to a change, like social change and environmental change? Um, I, and I'm also thinking in terms of the knowledge, past, uh, knowledge of past, present, and future that the data gather. Maybe I can just stop. And... <laughs> Yes, like this, yeah. So thank you, Birger. Thanks very much for the question. Um, so to the first question, I think uh, this idea of like, what are the infrastructures for uh, interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary collaborations? Um, I think, at least in my in my own uh, experience uh, as a practitioner, I think I've been. Uh, in a way quite lucky uh, with the collaborations. Uh, for example, I'm going to be very specific with the uh, collaboration with the lab uh, of scientists in India. As I was saying, um, uh, you know, there is, because there is currently quite a lot of sort of projects dealing with art and science or design and science, um, uh, as well as it's, it's actually an economy, you know, there's like this art science galleries popping up and it's like a huge field. Uh, but generally, it's, it's, it's kind of one way, or, or it can be one way that, you know, the artists or designers sort of uh, use the scientific uh, knowledge to uh, uh, anesthetize it in some way, maybe with a critical lens or something. But uh, it was ab absolutely the opposite for me. So when I worked in the lab in, uh, in India, um, maybe that was kind of my, my hope that I would, could do that, you know, get something really cool and turn it into a piece of art. But actually, the, the Dr. Olson, who is the, the one running the lab, she uh, saw through me and she directly said, you know, I'm not interested in this kind of collaboration uh, because there's nothing in it for me. So I'm going to tell you what I'm working on. I'm going to give you a, a question and you're going to go in your studio and work as a designer on that question and come back to me and maybe I can use it. And for me, that was, you know, um, I was really, I was really grateful in a way, like uh, <laughs> that I was, uh, it was reversing uh, the sort of flow of, if you like, um, or like making more of a dialogue in the project. And uh, so that was a very positive. And I mean, in terms of infrastructure, that was again a very specific case. So the NCBS, it was a research lab which uh, was funded for a um, certain amount of years <clears throat> and which had quite a sort of um, uh, open sort of program. And they were basically, their policy was to hire researchers uh, to work uh, because uh, they thought these researchers were interesting. Uh, and not to have these scientific projects which were basically uh, sponsored and sort of depended on specific results, if you like. So there were, for example, researchers working on questions like, you know, do bees dream, you know, uh, things like this. And they, they had this sort of, you know, funding to do that. But, you know, this was very also like a very... Uh, in some way, uh, short-term precarious uh, institution. They thought that it would not last very long. <laughs> So, um, yeah, but I mean, for example, now I'm working, I didn't get uh, that far, but uh, in the residency I'm starting in France, I'm also working with um, scientific institutions and as well as uh, citizen science projects. So, which is something which I think sort of makes a bridge between this idea of like access to technology and, and, um, and my aim is there, there is to uh, basically work with this citizen science project, but to uh, equip them with uh, tools which are generally not accessible, so which are used by scientists, 
you know, like uh, really cool tools like hyperspectral cameras or things that allow you to read the landscape in a way that, um, you know, normally would be only by a, a certain um, category of people that have access to the money. So I think I see kind of my role sometimes a bit as, you know, creating this or making these bridges between um, the means of production, you know, uh, knowledge, <laughs> and then also I would like these tools to be used by groups which are already, you know, um, sort of uh, ecological activists in a way, already going to the to this ecosystem, which is a beach in uh, in, in France, uh, but to basically uh, just uh, allow them to amplify their their work by having better technology, basically. Yeah. Hi, Thomas. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Noah. I'm a PhD candidate at Zeppelin University and working uh, within the uh, Fine Art Network. Thank you so much for the um, really interesting talk. I'm, uh, I'm a bit wondering um, around two notions of publics and activism, um, kind of in the light of the really persistent sometimes Sisyphic work of, um, of movements um, and associations who work for ecologic, I mean, who basically want to fight um, climate change and, and, and corporate um, um, devastation of our, <laughs> of our world. I'm, I'm, I'm interested to know maybe what is your personal and artistic approach to their work um, and 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 how do you position yourself and your practice um, um, what what is maybe the proximity between your practices to to per se activism right um, yeah, thanks for the question, Noah. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's a question that uh, maybe now I'll, I can I'll speak more about the the first part of the talk. So uh, when I was working on this uh, with these allotment uh, gardens, um, my actual aim and interest in terms of research was about. Um, yeah, this landscape. So I studied philosophy initially before doing design, and I was interested in, <laughs> in theory of landscape and, and things like that um, in France. So I guess that stayed with me. And how this landscape was created, and also how through memory you could basically, um, through this, making this publication, through these interviews, sort of um, allow this landscape to live a bit more, you know. And then, as I said at the time, this particular garden was destroyed for the Olympics. And so immediately there was like a huge political, you know, uh, discussion going on uh, and all the people I was working with for my projects were involved and I ended up being also, you know, I would say not not dragged in, but invited. I was really happy also at the time to, <laughs> to a lot of things which became like anti-Olympics, anti, you know, um, and uh, but which were not maybe my aim at uh, initially. And I realized that uh, quite soon, <laughs> and uh, so I, uh, I decided to, uh, yeah, to basically try to, um, even though there was an intersection, to to make it clear that you know, uh, I didn't want this to become my, you know, because a lot of artists at the time, and you know, there are artists was probably still doing work about this particular <laughs> Olympic thing, but you know, that really became their practice, you know, that they were anti-Olympics, uh, and that was not my. I was interested in, you know, memory, landscape, uh, <laughs> creating a space for a, uh, for this garden to exist further. So, um, yeah, so that was that particular case. And um, now it's a bit different in uh, in the residency I'm, I'm starting because, um, uh, well, essentially this is a really nice example which um, somebody uh, gave me when I, I was in France uh, meeting the people involved in this residency. Uh, I don't know if you heard about the the ZAD in France, which was this um, area, uh, which uh, uh, in the south of France, where they were, they were going to build an airport, and then it was occupied for many many years, and then um, you know uh, artists were moving there, and uh, <clears throat> so it became a sort of you know uh, 
a huge it was a huge uh, fight for and it was always on the news and uh, but uh, anyway there, there was uh, one particular thing that uh, um, people were doing was uh, these botanical expeditions so they were like uh, basically with scientists going out and recording like all the species that were in this area and all the sort of uh, biodiversity that was there and um, and then one artist, uh, Bruno Serralon, who's like a, who's a photographer, he made a really nice book, which is about these uh, botanical expeditions. And uh, and actually, these botanical expeditions, I think, uh, were one of the things that were the most um, influential in changing people's perception of that place, you know, and sort of in a way, even people who were polarized politically about, you know, the type of groups that were, you know, maybe hijacking this sad thing to for their own agenda, because that happens also, right? I think this idea of seeing the biodiversity there and seeing all the, you know, this, uh, these things that was going to disappear would kind of bridge and, and reach out to a lot of different political uh, uh, ideas, people who had different, you know, political agenda. So... I guess in that project and, and, and uh, in a way ecology kind of is, ma is maybe a means to, to, uh, yeah, to speak maybe directly to people about things which are beyond you know, s other divides, let's say. Thank you, Alina. Thank you, Thomas. So it's a fantastic presentation. Maria Hlaveva, I'm uh, artistic director of Bach in uh, Utrecht. Something that browses through my mind at this moment. A couple of years ago, I um, co-edited with, co -edited with uh, Rosie Breidot this gigantic book called The Posthuman Glossary. And um, I remember nearly an existential threat that editorial work posed to my being in this world because I had to undertake a series of what I thought at the time were expansions of my vocabulary. So from social justice to ecological justice that would kind of encompass social justice, from genocide to ecocide, from, I was preparing, from human rights to rights of nature. And although at that time I experienced it as kind of series of expansions or extensions of certain vocabulary, I a kind of to encompass that idea of more than human cosmopolitics that you that you um, uh, so beautifully described through your project, it didn't stick with me because I think it absolutely lacked capacity to grasp the catastrophe or catastrophes such as war that is ongoing at this very moment. And so here my split personality and why, I'll, why I called it uh, threatening. Because within the fine art network we operate this term socially engaged artistic practice. So I'm very curious whether you could react to whatever I now said uh, and take this prism of socially engaged practice, whether it's something that is what you operate within your work or what's your, what's your take on this notion. And again, that uh, the capacity to, of the vocabulary we're developing through various practices around the notion of uh, the posthuman or new materialism, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you know, venging into this field of, uh, of uh, ecology, ecocide, and what have you, how in return is it capable to grasp what's happening, for example, at this very moment in Eto Ethiopia, Sudan, and of course Ukraine? Thanks, Maria. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's really, really a question that uh, has been, you know, <laughs> haunting me since uh, I was asked to uh, come and participate in this, uh, <laughs> in this seminar. <laughs> so I guess it had to come. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and, um, okay, so at least uh, two things I can think of. One is more like uh, this idea of, like, uh, you know, ripple effects and sort of long-term thinking and um, also what agency you know uh, do I have being where I am etc <laughs> and so um, let's talk about pollination for example 
you know, and this project with the with the scientists and uh, in India and and it's highly debatable. I mean, it is uh, often in, in different contexts. Uh, it's uh, really criticized in terms of ethics. You know, how can you subject a bee to some experiment in VR and stuff? But uh, anyway, pollination uh, is uh, you know, as I was saying, like a really essential sort of you know. Uh, tool for uh, growing food. I think it's 70% of crops that you know require some kind of pollination. Sometimes it's wind, sometimes it's um, other insect, but let's say, um, and then, you know, food and access to food is really something that will, you know, increase uh, the divides and the, and the political divides and the struggles and, you know, uh, is already actually, you know, uh, creating a lot of uh, geopolitical uh, struggles and even more now with Russia and for example, wheat, you know, grown in Russia is something that will affect African countries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think, in that sense, I, I relate, you know, at least the work related to food system directly to, you know, having an impact in, you know, social uh, well-being. That's just one thing. And then the other thing, which I think um, it's, I guess, a bit more like a. Uh, Something I was going to talk about after this, actually. But recently, there is a book that came out called uh, "The River That Wanted to Write," and it's a French book. It hasn't been translated yet, and it's uh, there's a river in France called the Loire, where there's good wine, uh, which runs like sort of you know north uh, through <coughs> uh, near Paris and Brittany and stuff. And um, it's uh, the the project is that there was a parliament that was created called um, the Parliament of the Loire River. And that's a project that was quite low-key, um, but still it was basically gatherings and hearings, so really like using a sort of a very sort of political format to... Uh, and the, 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 the question was, you know, a bit naive and... and, and uh, or you could call it naive. Um, can, we, can we give a voice to this river? Can it be a political actor in, you know, what's happening in that region? So it was quite localized. And what I like about this project um, is that, you know, as you were saying, you know, it's, it's something that is being discussed a lot and, and this non-human, post-human, it's, it's a whole, like, you know, array of vocabulary and, and, and theories and, you know, it's uh, uh, a lot of people are basically uh, running on this, on this. But what I <laughs> love in this project is that uh, they make it clear in the, in the introduction that they, they, the question of can we make a river a political actor uh, it's, they're not talking about, you know, uh, some kind of condescending idea that, yeah, you know, look, this non-human entity could also be like, like us in a way. The question is much more practical. It's like, now we have the technology. We have, in terms of sensing, in terms of interpreting data, in terms of to really sort of understand what's going on in an ecosystem. And that can really give us some clues about what to do in terms of politics at this local level. Um, and so politics of the landscape at least, um, so maybe that's not including, um, let's say, social struggles in that example. But the be most beautiful thing in that book is like, so there's all these hearings and they invite different people and um, uh, so it's a, it's a nice read. But at the end there's like a series of drawings of this like, what kind of new institutions uh, could that, uh, would that need to include, you know. Uh, and, you know, maybe some of them are uh, will never happen, it's not possible, but just this fact that this makes you rethink uh, how decisions are made and, you know, these processes of decision making, for me that's something that could be, you know, at least the question is uh, of questioning the way, um, you know, social uh, society is organized through this. For me that's the, um, this is the value in this, all these things about interspecies and post-human, etc. So I don't think in itself, you know, some of the projects are very far out, etc. It's more that it makes you rethink how things are uh, organized now. Yeah. Thank you, thank you so much, and uh, thank you to the organizers of the of this conference for having including including you on the panel because I think you cannot talk about socially engaged art without talking about the relationship to what we in the Western world called call nature. Uh, my name is Raluca. I'm from Bucharest. I'm uh, working with a partner organization in this project, and currently I'm developing 
a new project that is called the Experimental Station for Research on Art and Life. And um, it's like I have more of a comment on what you uh, said generally and what Maria was pointing towards. And um, we are using the term life, we are bor borrowing it from the activists in uh, countries of Latin America who never use the term nature, you know, or environment. <clears throat> they use the term life because they say, if you destroy nature, you destroy life itself. <laughs> and I think it's, it's really beautiful how you, how you operate with, uh, on, on these borders and on, on the like bridging, as you were saying, these communities, because there is so much effort right now into, into preserving these ecosystems, into engaging so many different uh, professionals from so many different uh, backgrounds together with local communities and with the, those who produce food, but also they, they reproduce a lifestyle that is kind of valuing life um, and uh, yeah I mean um, I would have millions of questions that I hope we, we can discuss about later but I just wanted to you know to uh, really uh, and deeply thank you for your work. <laughs> yeah thank you I uh, thank you we can discuss later of course uh, in two minutes um, yeah thanks for bringing South America in in there um, because that was something we were discussing, and uh, <laughs> okay, I'm gonna make a total mess out of it. Because uh, of course, I'm not a I'm not a scholar in South American uh, ecological theory. But there is a, a Viver Vivero de Castro, right, and uh, Maria Prig de la Casa, for example, and this idea of perspectivism, which I think is is uh, is very interesting in that sense. And uh, so um, yeah, so one of the things that they say, just to be short, is like. Uh, you know, Western uh, societies, we have been operating basically with a lot of different cultures, but we kind of share one idea of nature, in a way, what nature is. Whereas what they are, when they are looking at, um, from this anthropological point of view, at uh, places of South America, is that there, there are these cultures that have these multiple views of nature, uh, what it is. So this idea of like perspectivism, and in, in a sense, I think, you know, including non-humans is, is one perspective, you know, it's not like the answer to, <laughs> to all the problems. But uh, yeah, so I think it's, uh, yeah, for me, I link it to, to this perspectivism from South America. But um, great, I would love to hear more about this. Thank you. Thank you. So, Thank you, Thomas and Pilke and, and everyone else for, for the uh, lectures and comments and questions. So we're going to take a break now. There is coffee over there, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and we'll gather again here at half past four to, to have a, a, a final end of day panel with, with all the, the speakers and, and, and more. <laughs> okay.
Can you stand there? So, uh, could I could I ask uh, could I ask the uh, the speakers? Could could I ask the speakers to come to the podium? Uh, and and of course you, John, and and Karen, and Martin, I believe, is going to be with us here too. Aisa. Aisa. Another picture. <laughs> okay. So, um, great to see everyone here on the podium. So we are now going to have a, an hour or so of, of panel discussion. Um, uh, moderated by Aisa Sigurjansdóttir, our colleague from Art Theory and, and Art History here at the University. So I'll just give the floor to you, Aisa, and you'll take over. Okay, thank you. Well, hello, everybody, and uh, thank you for inviting me for this uh, panel discussion. Uh, first, I will introduce myself. Uh, I think I have met some of you, but all, not all of you. And. Um, so my name is Aisa Sigurjansdóttir and uh, I am an uh, associated art uh, professor here and um, 
Uh, I'm running the curatorial uh, uh, program also. We have a curatorial MA program quite recently, and uh, uh, we also have an art collection. Uh, so you see, we are in uh, sort of uh, we have sort of many uh, yes, uh, many aspects that, uh, of this kind of art field that we are studying here. Um, I see that many of you have already uh, been uh, introduced to the uh, to the public, but not all of you. And you don't have any name tags, I noticed, on the table. So uh, I was wondering <coughs> if you should uh, have a very quick, uh, again, because maybe also there are some new people in the audience, uh, we should have a very quick uh, uh, introduction of all of you. But first, I just want to uh, uh, say a few words, because uh, while I came in here as a guest, and I the first uh, talk I uh, listened to was uh, yesterday in a workshop. and. Uh, it was uh, the talk of uh, Dimitraki, and uh, I uh, was quite moved by that talk. And uh, I think also we have been having a kind of an emotional roller coaster here uh, today, especially with this morning with Fatin uh, Fahad with your talk from Palestine, and uh, of course addressing all sorts of uh, uh, political issues, issues of violence, issues of uh, nationalism, of trauma and loss. Uh, I would also like to bring uh, the uh, discussion now a little bit back to this, back to nationalism, uh, back to also back to violence, even though uh, uh, it is not maybe the, uh, uh, the thing that we really want to be talking about, but I think we cannot uh, escape it. And uh, artists in war, that was something that was addressed here yesterday and I think also this morning. And also the possibility or the impossibility of art in war situation. I, 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 uh, I thought that was an important, important thing to address. And uh, we know also, if you sort of historically, if you go historically back in time, uh, there have been, uh, I mean, we even had, uh, in Britain they had, or maybe they still have, uh, they had war artists. Uh, so art as a healing process, we have also uh, heard quite a lot about this, and this is also important. Uh, and finally, also, it was very, um, uh, of course, wonderful to have uh, Ruan Grupa here, and we are all very, very happy to have you, and uh, thrilled about hearing about your project in Documenta, because I'm sure that many of us have been to Documenta several times, and are planning to go, if uh, that will be possible. And uh, uh, so I thought that your... Uh, 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 presentation was uh, was really captivating, and um, uh, I am also interested in your uh, way of uh, I would call it kind of uh, decolonizing uh, the Western concept of art. I think we also mentioned that uh, yesterday, and I uh, maybe that is my interpretation. Maybe that is also something that you, we could uh, discuss. Uh, that in fact uh, uh, your uh, uh, your method, your tools, are also a way of uh, decolonizing uh, documenta, which is a very institutional, and uh, I am very curious to see how you can uh, 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 use these uh, tools in castle, which is such a, which is such a historically charred uh, city. Okay, so please, just a very quick uh, introduction of, uh, <coughs> you say, just your name and your uh, affiliation <coughs> and, uh, and uh, maybe your uh, connection with the project. Yeah, um, I'm Professor John Roberts. I'm the manager of the Fine Art Project. Uh, I'm, I'm Karen Vandenberg <laughs> from Zeppelin University and I manage the training program. Uh, sorry. 
<laughs> sorry aja. Sorry, sorry. Eh uh, I'm Andan from Ruang Rupa. I'm Thomas Mausch, I'm a um, assistant professor at the Essen University of the Arts. Uh, my name is Martin and I'm one of the ESRs, one of the PhD candidates of the program. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, uh, there are quite many, uh, maybe some of them have already left, but there are quite many artists here uh, in the audience and uh, I would also very much like to, uh, uh, to give them also a little bit the floor and make them uh, interact with, uh, with uh, our, uh, our topics. Uh, I think the first, uh, the first topic I will address, and uh, uh, it is uh, this, uh, uh, maybe a little bit the elephant in the room, is nationalism, and uh, like uh, Dimitraki spoke of uh, yesterday, how nationalisms are maintained as a form of management of populations. Uh, she also mentioned the idea of the nations and how we are always uh, kind of coming back to this. Uh, of course, now it's, um, it's a very difficult uh, problem and situation uh, with this uh, new war situation in Europe. Uh, and uh, the nation is also, uh, of course, uh, uh, written into the constitution of most nations. Uh, and this is also how art and art identities and uh, uh, cultural identities are very much constructed and they are still very much constructed around this idea of the nation even though we have been going through all this uh, process of uh, uh, deconstructing the, uh, the, uh, the idea of the nation and the, uh, the, national, uh, the national discourse. Uh, so uh, I would uh, like uh, to open this panel with uh, Discussions from with questions from the audience uh, related to that uh, related to that subject. I think there were already this morning there were some questions that uh, uh, were kind of on a waiting list. <coughs> yeah, is there a microphone here somewhere? <coughs> Um, I've seen this together. 
maybe also the Vanderbilt is Said Academy that is in Berlin. Um, and and I'm, I'm thinking around this is this kind of projects involve more the active participation and, and I see them as kind of like taking into our own hands. Finding mutual solutions in the here and now in our in our immediate localities. And I wonder what you think about them from your perspective. Um, and then maybe against them kind of like more uh, projects that are maybe more representative of the very justified um, suffering, oppression, uh, and unjust conditions <coughs> that Palestinian um, live in today. That's like a Ten questions in one, but I will try to respond from my personal experience. Um, this might sound surprising, but you're the, the first Israeli citizen I see in years, because as a person who lives in Ramallah, I only see the settlers and the army. Uh, and it, after all these years, I'm almost 50, I'm always quite uncomfortable uh, for obvious reasons. And it's always very difficult to try and um, remember how angry and frustrated I am, especially by Israeli civil society in particular, <coughs> because society is becoming more on the right, as we all know, and frustrated and at the same time <coughs> trying to keep things in perspective. And this is the value of aging. <laughs> I, you know, I, I can take a step back. Uh, my mother was imprisoned in the Israeli <coughs> prisons for three years when she was 29. My brother was for one year, and my cousin was for nine years as well. Um, I lost many friends, of course. I imagine you might have lost other people to the conflict, and um, there are no easy ways to address this issue. Uh, what I can tell you is that at the beginning of the peace process, because I belonged, I was uh, an activist with the Communist Party, it was one of the first who initiated dialogue with Israeli civil society organizations. I no longer do that. I was among the first, and I was a pioneer, and I felt after a while that this is it's not my responsibility as a Palestinian to educate Israelis, society, or to work in addition to facing occupation of making change inside Israeli society. Especially that often we felt that we were left out, especially with the second intifada in 2000, which was very violent and we lost lots of friends. So I think <clears throat> that was a turning moment for me when I felt that I shouldn't be living under occupation, fighting occupation, and raising a family, and also, uh, you know, educating um, Israelis and changing Israeli society. This should be the responsibility of um, Israeli left and Israeli civil society movement more than uh, my role. And I also, uh, as I got older, I became uh, more realistic. I don't believe that these projects actually work, honestly, and I tried them. Uh, I'll give you some impressions. At a certain point, these uh, projects were um, sponsored by German and Austrian governments for obvious reasons, the issue of feeling guilty because of the conflict. And <clears throat> I was engaged in some of them, and I never felt that uh, the power of the occupier and occupation and the, the occupier and the people living under occupation was very, very strong and was very uncomfortable. So I do believe that reconciliation at this level has to come after at least Palestinians feel that they, feel they fulfilled uh, part of their uh, inspirations and were at least ready to the process of reconciliation when the Israeli occupation of Palestine stops. Uh, this is not to say that I'm, um, of course, I'm against dialogue with state-supported uh, initiatives. And this is something uh, uh, the BD, I, I imagine a lot of you know about the BDS movement. Um, and which comes in handy as we talk about Ukraine and Russia now. Uh, how, do this, how, how far do we go? Uh, what do, how, how do we work with, uh, also with the, uh, with the conflict in, in, 
in Europe, but I find it really, um, uh, I don't think firsthand that unless there is a political statement, I don't think that these projects, the common projects, are very real or dynamic. Of course, there are exceptions. We have to remember that there are two million Palestinians living in Israel. It's, it's, a, it's a complex uh, geography, so I'm a West Banker. Uh, I don't speak the language, I don't have direct interaction, but I have friends who grew up in Nazareth and in Haifa who speak Hebrew, who studied at Hebrew universities and, 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 and carry Israeli passport as well. That's co completely different. The rules are a bit different. But um, I'm not a pessimist, but I'm more of a realist. I think Israeli artists have to work within their own society to change their perception about occupation. Uh, that's their duty. They have, they have more, uh, they have an ed advantage over us uh, having to fight uh, and live our daily life under occupation. So, uh, but yeah, about the elephant in the room, yeah, for me, until now, after all these years, I, I, it's always confusing when I see an Israeli that who is not a settler or a soldier in the room, uh, in the same room with me. Uh, I'm almost 50, and it continues to make me also feel uncomfortable at the beginning, so. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I think, Oliver, you wanted to... Yeah, and... <coughs> yes? <coughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> We're recording and scre screening. And that's going to limit our conversation about these difficult matters, but that's an obsession of the art world and of uh, academic world to broadcast ourselves to the world. But this is a tough conversation we have to have. And um, I want to challenge our accountability uh, when it comes to calling one another to be responsible for national politics. And I know how difficult this is, but that, is, that conversation is to be had. I believe, Fatin, your gesture was wrong. That's my personal position. I was in a conversation with a, with a, uh, a representative of the left in London who told me we need to boycott the Russian artists because they didn't do enough to stop Putin. And my question to him was, what did you do to stop Brexit? And thus, the challenge on locality and the language of nation state that we willingly or unwillingly, consciously or not consciously reproduce because we call the artist Dutch artist or Syrian artist, etc., we reproduce the standing power game in the world. I really genuinely believe it. <clears throat> and I am fully aware of my privilege that there are not bombs falling on my head. Mm. I just want to recall the, uh, uh, Angela's second point of yesterday, the politics of visibility and invisibility, the council culture. I think we need to be very careful. And um, to abstract this conversation, I want to go to the question of locality. <coughs> Interestingly, uh, and then you stress locality, you talk about the locality of Castle. Well, when you announced the when you announced the artists for Documenta, you did not identify them with their locality. You identified them in their position in time. You still use Western Greenwich system, which is the Western linearity of time. So you still position artists in time within Western hegemony of linear, linearity of time. But I thought this was a fantastic uh, attempt to <coughs> unpin us from Google Docs and um, uh, imagine the world otherwise and try to actualize it. And I want to plea for this to be our response ability. I don't talk about neoliberal responsibility, but this to be our way of responding, uh, responding uh, to the world or, or playing out the ability of responding. I felt uncomfortable, Fatin, at that very moment, and I, I want to speak about it. Mm -mm. Um, because that we must. I'll leave it here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Or, 
Ah, there are many here now. Uh, so uh, <coughs> we'll talk it. I want. Yes, we want. Yes. Ah, <coughs> oh, I have to take a deep breath before I respond. But this is a typical answer from someone who has. I'm sorry who hasn't lived 80 years under fascist occupation, where uh, it's not, I'm sorry, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's where the land is not uh, occupied for a month or two in a conflict. In fact, uh, the whole population, most of the population was dispossessed and dispersed around the world, and it's been since 1948. And <clears throat> with the failure of the internet, I mean, now we see the world is moving, of course, to stand in solidarity with Ukraine, and that's wonderful. But uh, to be, uh, to be uh, neglected completely for all these decades, and then to expect us to open dialogue so that this is absolutely, <laughs> it's absolutely, it's actually it's a bit offensive as well, because, um, because really, unless the pressure is exerted for Palestinians to be treated with justice and to end occupation, all of this just would make non-Palestinians, especially Europeans, comfortable. Um, and really, I, I, I find it actually op offensive and insensitive to the sufferings of the people um, the, of my nation for decades. Um, Again, making a reference to the fact that at the beginning of the peace process, I was involved in these dialogue groups, and they don't work on ground because the power is the same. We are in the same room, and there is the person living under occupation and the occupier. Even to meet in Jerusalem, I would need a special permit, whereas an Israeli can come freely. So to detach all this reality and to talk about the nation state, and it's... it's it's a bit offensive, actually, and it's, it's insensitive. Yeah, okay. <laughs> we don't want to. No, but then, yeah. I'm trying. It's very technical remark. Yeah. yeah. If I offended you, I apologize. No, no, it's not you. I lived 30 years under the yeah. current system, but we are yeah. not in a position to compare who suffered most. No. I would never get into, into this conversation. Absolutely not. What I'm talking about is what can we do through our practices to move out, this, out of this impasse? And the proposition yesterday I was kind of trying to, to forward was what if, we, what if we thought of the solidarity of the oppressed all around the world? We would get another, another pathway, not out of the crisis because that's here to stay, but another pathway towards a livable life together. And again, this, this may sound like big words, but I am just genuinely trying to see, can we think with one another without offending? Can we imagine without one another and then with one another change the world? Because we must. And, and this again, my apology. I think we need to do something that Okay, <laughs> so the next uh, one, the next uh, question, <clears throat> please. Hello, hello, uh, okay, sorry. Uh, first of all... Remember to uh, introduce yourself. <coughs> Yo, sorry. Yes. <laughs> first of all, <laughs> my name is Olaver Olafsson, I'm a visual artist uh, from this island, from Iceland, from uh, this time zone. Um, <coughs> And but I live in uh, and I and I collaborate. I'm a, uh, I work with uh, Libya Castro. We are a duo or a collective for 25 years now. And uh, um, first of all, <coughs> talking about uh, nationalism and so on, I, I I just can't understand that there are two Icelandic flags here inside the room. I find it so weird to have it have them there the whole time. Okay, fine, the university flags, but I just, when do we witness a, a, a conference or an art exhibition with the Icelandic flags inside the museum? It, it's like so, I'm talking about elephant in the room, there are, you know, for me this is another, and, and just for, still also I find totally 
absurd and kind of trivial to be talking and putting forward my thoughts and, and questions after um, such yeah, immensely uh, sad story being addressed, you know, that of Palestine and, and, and you know, for me this all kind of feels trivial, but still it's the same symbols, it's the same, you know, it's nation states, whether they're big or small. Um, another thing was about locality, and there was in, when you were talking about artists of Syria uh, moving out of the country and whether they should go back or not, and so on, that was when my question uh, arose. arose. Uh, and for me, clearly, both is needed, you know, like, uh, it's not a question of one or the other, uh, because it's so obvious that there are other um, things possible and impossible uh, uh, from working in Syria, you know, uh, and and working outside of Syria, and I would say just both is important. And uh, then I wanted to bring it to a very local, uh, um, tiny, tiny uh, situation, or to situate it again in, in in Iceland. That actually, you know, me and Libya together with a a collective uh, called the Magic Team. We have been working for years on a project that's called In Search of Magic, uh, uh, a proposal for a new constitution for the Republic of Iceland. And uh, the, re the most recent part of it is that we are collaborating with this university uh, on an open meeting. It's, not a, it's not, a, not a seminar, not a congress, it's an open meeting that will be similar to this, but different. And we asked for, uh, <clears throat> we thought it was very interesting to have to have uh, this talk that is a continuation of a performance we did and then an exhibition in this, actually in this very space, like how the, as the director introduced this this morning, that it's a very important space, this literally this space in the history of the nation building of this nation state, Iceland, and how it's a core, um, as he introduced it himself, it plays a core role in the history of the country. And, and we asked through the, uh, Museum department, uh, museum studies department, with a professor, for this place to hold our uh, seminar, and uh, the answer from the rector came a little later. The the one that opened the talk this morning, uh, that uh, as our artwork was addressing <coughs> politically debated topic in Iceland, and also, uh, yeah, then then then, uh, and this. And the university did not take stands in uh, political matters. Uh, we could not be granted uh, a permission to work or to have our presentation in this space. Actually, it was also about socio-politically engaged start. We are contextualizing it in a, in a larger thing, in a larger context. So, uh, and we also actually asked for having an artwork on the facade of the building. But I find it is like it, I can't. It doesn't. Can't. I, I can't leave the thought how interesting it is then that the very same rector that says this to an Icelandic project, talking about locality anchoring and so on, uh, is more than happy to, to, to host and to celebrate exactly the same or exactly very closely to related, you know, because I mean the Icelandic constitution was written in the aftermath of the crash 2008, uh, the Arab Spring started with, a, with an Icelandic autumn we could say, you know, and then the Arab Spring and then the, and so on and so on. So it's a very important for us that it's a, that the Icelandic, the post and pants revolution and the, and the constitution that was written after that takes place in this global moment. You know, Iceland certainly played a role or was taking part in global socio-political events. And, and, you know, so we, but we are not allowed to speak in this room, uh, to use this room. I and mean, we were offered another room of the university and they offered us money. But just to put it in a context, you know, that we're talking about socio-political engaged art, mm -hmm. so, uh, and I wanted just to, you know, bring that in, that, and, 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 you know, I find it quite interesting when talking about locality and local, global, and so on. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is also touches up on this uh, kind of uh, how spaces are uh, charged with, uh, with meaning, and uh, this is, of course, this uh, place here is, this space, this room is very charged. And uh, is anyone who wants to react to uh, all of us? Uh... I want to. Yes.
Okay, so we have a... was not my only reaction, but yes. I just wanted to say something about the nation state and um, maybe we can think a state without the nation and uh, the whole idea of this way how to imagine communities that works in this nationalist way. Um, and uh, my question would be, uh, in a way, um, as a German, I would say, um, nation is a concept under erasure, or it's an obsolete concept. Um, and that's easy for me to say that. I know that. Um, but the problem with this concept is that we don't have a concept that could uh, maybe take the place of the nation state. Um, and there's a very interesting text uh, or dialogue between, it's, it's already quite old, between um, Spivak and Butler. And they are talking about the um, idea if there could be a state as a ab ab very abstract legal construction so without this uh, imagination of the nation and all the narratives. And to me, the question is, what can art maybe contribute to that? Uh, how, I, and I don't think that art can contribute to this uh, legal construction, but maybe it can contribute to, to replace this nationalist imaginations through other imaginations. Because we all know um, that we cannot cope with uh, the planetary emergency on a na national level. Uh, but uh, we also know that, and we are also always talking about communities, uh, collectives, and uh, we, we heard uh, from Ruan Rupa what it means to, um, to um, develop from a group to an uh, infrastructure and maybe also to a movement, maybe that works. Um, but what we need to maybe inspire such a movement is imagination. <coughs> so I think this is what maybe art can contribute to, um, to this development and to the replacement of the nation state. Um, and then I would say from the legal side and from maybe other sides, it's to, to, to do the work on an ab abstract idea of the state. So that's my statement. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh. <coughs> Hi. Um, please remember to say or introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm Claude Nassar. I'm an ASR in this network, uh, researcher. So I'm going to start speaking and hopefully lead into a question. Um, but as a continuation to the conversation that we've been having, I think the Palestinian cause is not necessarily to be considered a national cause per se. I think due to the inter intergenerational dispersion, but also the upper side against the Palestinian people, whether by the Israeli state or by other Arab states as well, within itself, the Palestinian cause is accordingly not a national one per se. Um, <coughs> and I imagine that the 
through Palestinian resistance, there's also resistance against the formalized state of Palestine, if I'm not wrong, and maybe you can correct me on that. Um, and I imagine as well that within this resistance, there is a resistance of the idea of a neoliberal state itself. And I think it's a bit hard while we're here talking, which I agree with the critique of the nation state, and I think in Lebanon this applies, but I think in Palestine there's a different conversation to be had uh, because of this association, not necessarily against the idea of critiquing the nation state, but because the nation state itself is understood differently due to the dispersion of the Palestinian people around the world. I don't think there a Palestinian state will be an neoliberal state the way we understand it as a closed border that is strictly separated between according to nationality. Um, Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and you spoke that because my comment was not about the Palestinian case, which I will always support. My comment was how do we, in pedagogical situations like ours, address an Israeli national And so my comment was about this and not about the Palestinian. And I want to make sure that the meaning do not shift too quickly. Uh, because my comment was really about my discomfort, about how in the pedagogical <coughs> situations we will refer to one another. Can I, uh, can I say something in relation to that? Uh, I think the, um, the, uh, the real emancipatory struggle in relation to these questions remains um, the, struggle, the struggle and critique of ethno-philosophy. Because the question of ethno-philosophy um, is, is not simply, uh, ethno-philosophy is not simply constituent of, of reactionary positions. And in, in, I, mean, uh, I mean, for example, I mean, the, the current uh, inter-imperialist inter uh, rivalry between Russia and Ukraine is, is a clash of ethno-philosophies. And in a way, um, the, the, pal the Palestinian struggle is, is, a, is a clash of ethno-philosophies. So, um, um, one has to dis one has to sort one has to disentangle um, um, the um, the national struggles of peoples from the um, the the suspect um, collapse of these struggles into ethno philosophy and to switch the um, or to expand the debate um, um, into the domain that we are here to talk about socially engaged art I think socially engaged art around this question of ethno, uh, ethno philosophy has an important part to play around issues of non identity and um, um, the de the, the deparochialization of struggles um, once they once they bec uh, become separated from from national borders. Anyway. Thank you. Yes. So, anyone want to react on that? Well. Uh, yes, Sigrun. Yes, uh, I just have a short comment. My name is. My name is Seyrun Alpa and I'm a curator and four years ago I curated an exhibition on uh, Iceland's 100 years of sovereignty uh, at the National Gallery with uh, participation of different artists, for example, Oliver and Libya. And I just wanted to draw your attention to that, that Iceland has only been a sovereign state for uh, 104 years. And we were under the Danish king until 1944. And this is, well, it's, it's funny because I feel uncomfortable of seeing the flag on the floor. And, I, <laughs> and it surprises me because I go for no borders and 
of course, all refugees should be welcome and people should be able to live and wherever they are. But there is something, obviously, that maybe it's because we, have, we, we, we can't count on to be independent forever. And of course, no one can, actually. So that's just a comment. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I mean, I have many comments, but this comes in, in direct response to what you're saying and about this age of most uh, uh, states that are, you know, actually, it's, there is this big difference between a state that emerged from an empire and a state that emerged from a colony. I think um, we need to, to always refrain from asking the same set of questions to both of them in the same way. Um, and uh, I, I, I would like to uh, uh, remind you of this, uh, this comment of uh, Dan Perzhovsky, uh, this Romanian artist who uh, some many years ago he was commenting on, on how he was uh, placed, identified by, by, uh, by uh, different, in, in different moments in this, uh, in this last 30 years. So after having been identified as a uh, part uh, like a, a part of this uh, former um, uh, Eastern um, bloc, then uh, East European, Balkan, Southeast European. The, the definition always changed with the context in which he was presented and introduced. And uh, his his response to this constant. Uh, impossibility to, you know, to place him somewhere, to identify to him to a, a locality that uh, people could understand. He, he, he replied by saying, uh, I am not exotic, I am exhausted. This, this was one of his most famous lines, I think, and that we so often identify with. Just very recently, uh, last week or so, there was this um, reporting in American media on the, on the current war in Ukraine, and they were showing these maps. I mean, not only American, also French, I think. And they were showing these maps, and there were three different maps in which, uh, in one, Romania uh, had invaded Hungary, so basically, <laughs> uh, corresponding to, to Hungary, uh, it was written Romania. In other, um, uh, I don't remember exactly, but it was uh, the same situation with Bulgaria, only that Romania disappeared. In each, uh, in each case, it showed that uh, there is an ignorance of these specific uh, regions, specific localities. It's like today I was looking with, with Maria, one of the ESRs in, in this program. We were looking at the map uh, to see a specific place in Russia. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the moment, uh, in the first moment I didn't realize that why was, why was I seeing Lithuania so close to Russia? And it was just because the map was upside down. And <laughs> it, it had no correspondence to, my, to the mental map that I used to have. Um, so um, um, if we go back to this question of what can we uh, uh, learn from the artists, uh, I think we can learn a lot. And for example, it's been a while since we don't identify, in, in, let's say in peaceful countries, yeah? We don't identify the artists with the nation. We don't talk about Dutch artists and Romanian artists. We talk about artists based in Utrecht or in Bucharest. We, we hardly ever talk about American artists, yeah? We talk about artists based in New York or, and so on, you know? When, when we can afford it, we avoid this identification. And um, we are used to this global art world where artists are sort of pollinators themselves, you know? They, are, they move from community to community. They are able to permeate a uh, different kind of, you know, stuck situation and prejudices and, and so on. So, um, of course, there are, there are solutions and they are so much at, at hand, but it's, it's a question of when can we actually enact them? When can we... Um, can we have the privilege to, to, to reformulate them, to, to change the vocabulary and so on. It's, it's really, you need the context to do that. And in other times, you just have to be humble and to, um, to listen to those who have other problems, like really survival is, is um, uh, something you cannot lecture on. You, you know, you cannot lecture to, to these people. You just step a bit back back or you know aside and and listen because 
I mean, yeah. Otherwise, this this power power relation never changes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would like to uh, continue a little bit, and uh, I would like to pick up this uh, because I think there have been two things in, that have been said that are interesting, and uh, 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 I would like to address uh, this to uh, the uh, Rwanda group, and uh, it's a question of. Uh, the pedagogical situation as these, I mean, uh, very delicate pedagogical situations, I mean, uh, is there something that uh, you are integrating in your documental project? And uh, could you uh, maybe speak a little bit about that, uh, what kind of tools you are using? And uh, both for this uh, pedagogical situation and, uh, and also maybe the uh, non-nationalist uh, imagination that uh, Someone mentioned. I think this. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, we, we we want to start from uh, uh, the tools. Uh, the the main tools we use is uh, storytelling. Uh, storytelling is uh, for us is powerful. Uh, 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 and sometimes we are asked that are we uh, not comfortable with theories? No. Uh, we we are nothing against theories. Uh, theories are also. Uh, tools uh, in a different uh, way of uh, using it, but for us that uh, storytelling is that uh, everyone has a stories, everyone, uh, every entity has their own stories, and then everyone, every entity, any places, they have their own way to tell the stories. Uh, it's not a uniform, it's not, it's, it's not uh, only one side, uh, as we also know that history is not singular, uh, history is always plural depends on who's telling uh, the stories, uh, the histories, as well as the stories. Uh, so, for example, there are some uh, projects that we're, we, we're, we're preparing that, uh, we're, there are some stories that we're preparing, uh, sorry, uh, pro projects or programs that we've been preparing uh, by involving uh, the stories. As you may already know that uh, since April last year, uh, we organized an online uh, public program called Lumbung Calling. This Lumbung Calling uh, is a seven, uh, a serial of seven online conversations uh, inviting uh, practitioners, can be artists, uh, can be artists, uh, academics, uh, activists from the southern hemisphere of the world uh, in and and uh, telling us uh, the stories of their practice. Uh, and then how it's uh, related to uh, the Lumbung values that we indicated. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are locally anchor. For example, for the for the locally anchor series, we we invite uh, uh, a natural farmer activist uh, from South Sulawesi, Indonesia, uh, and we paired him with uh, 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 scholars on cultural studies. Yeah, also, it's also important to say that uh, uh, this, this Lumbum practice is also uh, strongly inspired by the practice of uh, natural farmer who do not use uh, toxic uh, materials, who do not use pesticide, who do not use fungicide, and who do not use uh, uh, herbicide. As we know, that all those three materials are not only harming plants, but also killing humans. Uh, B b very destructive to the soils. Uh, so, this is also the very, very interesting in Lumbung that uh, we, 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 we've, we've been trying our best to, to practice a way of working which are not uh, toxic. So, yeah, so because as we know that any, anything that toxic is destructive. Uh, and then, as we know, if it's destructive, it's anything that it's not going to sustain. Uh, if if it's distracted, uh, so you know, and also this Lumbung calling also inviting a historian. Uh, we had a, a series about uh, locally anchor sufficiency, transparency, generosity, uh, independence, uh, regenerations, uh, all those seven values, uh, and then all of them uh, tell the stories of their practice. Uh, I think maybe you want to. Okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, so so that's the the answer about the store uh, the tools we we use mm -hmm. the, the the stories. 
about the localities and then what also Maria coined earlier that uh, we're yeah in when we announce the artist we do not uh, mention the artist based on the home countries where they belong to but it's based on uh, the time zones and why the time zone is because uh, we appreciate of our friends who are how to say which are uh, we can call it still on the road on the road means that this morning he can be in paris but in the afternoon he can be in bangladesh or somewhere else that so because yeah as we know that now the 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 the, uh, the mobility of a person based on the activities is very easy well there was a corona that uh, avoiding us uh, to travel but and then now it's, uh, we can travel again so this is also that uh, we uh, some 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 question also uh, came to us that uh, uh, why do we use these uh, time zones? It's, it's because uh, this mobility of uh, of the people that we we mentioned their names or their collectives uh, in this lineup of uh, artists and uh, collectives in the uh, Documenta 15. Uh, there are even like arts collaboratory. Uh, we mentioned that we do not mention any. Uh, specific time zones there but we just say that uh, various time zones because they come from different uh, time zones uh, uh, yeah I think that's yeah just to add a bit uh, in regards of the time zone I think also because the process of the uh, uh, conversation with this uh, what we call Lumbung members and artists uh, because we're from different uh, time zones, so we make this uh, mini majulis uh, based on this time zone because sometimes in maybe in uh, uh, Colombia it's 8 a.m. So, but in Indonesia it's 8 p.m. So they cannot meet. So uh, that's why we we make a, like a mini majulis or a group based on this time zone, so they can talk, they can they can uh, uh, meet and. Uh, 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 discuss about the collaboration that uh, possible uh, that they do, and then so this idea is uh, also when we mention or we announce them in the uh, 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 in the official announcement, we think uh, uh, rather to have the alphabetical way. So we why we don't use this mini majlis group as a as a things that we to announce them. So. Yeah. There's one question. Also, also, sorry, also yeah. during uh, during the process that uh, because it was mostly uh, we did in Zoom, which we didn't need passport when we want to sign in in Zoom. So there's no recognition of where we come from, uh, which state, and then which passport we hold uh, when we sign in in Zoom. So that's also kind of metaphor that during the process we are stateless in terms of we're in a digital uh, platform. Yeah. Yeah, when, uh, I've, I've got a question to Ron Rupa and also to Thomas. Um, because when I listened to your talks, I was wondering um, on which scale you're planning to work. And I was also uh, curious uh, to hear more about what happened, for example, to Ruan Krupa when, they, when you expanded your group. And uh, you, you said that you um, professionalized yourself and uh, founded a company. And um, I was also, also asking myself what happens now after Documenta or with Documenta to the group, um, working on not, not, not anymore in those, this community scale, but now on another scale, on an international scale. So what does it mean to the group? How does it change your work? And also, um, Thomas has been asked the question, um, yeah, what can actually art uh, do in, or what, what's the role of art in, uh, in a planetary emergency? Uh, so how, how can art contribute? And this again has to do with the, the scale on, when, uh, on which we are planning to work. Um, so yeah, maybe you can both react to that. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's uh, actually, Actually, maybe uh, professionalizing uh, was not the right word to mention uh, there, that, but, but it's actually like a leveling up, leveling up the capacity, uh, leveling up the capacity because it's always, 
Uh, I'm, I'm not going to preach about Indonesian history because it takes uh, three semester to or maybe even six years of like uh, to tell of this Indonesian history. But, that, but I want to say a very short sentence that Indonesian history is also that uh, it's a matter of uh, it's a matter of uh, uh, there were 32 of uh, authoritarian regime that we we live in, and then there was uh, the access. Uh, to the resources uh, was limited only for specific uh, groups, peoples uh, who have an access to uh, or part of the uh, cliques. Uh, so, but after uh, this authoritarian regime fall and then there are openness and then that's also anyone can just start something including it's in, in order to access the resources, you know, in, in order to access the resources to sustain uh, in order to access the resources to expanding the capacity. Uh, so uh, when it was started, it was a foundation, but and then later uh, we started a so-called registered company uh, because some, some actually some, some projects uh, require this. Uh, not, uh, it, was, it was not really like a commercial, a commercial project, but it's, uh, it requires uh, and also, it's we always saying a word siasat uh, in working. Siasat, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, yeah, uh, but we call it, siasat is a strategy. We we're, stra we're we're always strategizing, strategizing to sustain uh, because uh, because sustaining for us that uh, we we've been witnessing many initiatives like uh, like uh, starting and then dying, starting dying and then. Uh, and then we've been witnessing that if we sustain, there are many things we can do. There are many, there are, there are, if it's, if we, if we sustain and regenerative, uh, uh, there are always new things happen. There is uh, also a very good notion that we learn uh, from our culture that, uh, I come from a culture called Bugis people in, in South Sulawesi, Indonesia, we call it Matola Palalo, means that we are really happy if we see the young people can achieve something much better than us. Uh, but also at the same time, we learn a lot also from uh, Bruce Lee's, Bruce Lee, uh, the martial artist, uh, who said that uh, a teacher is a teacher who can protect uh, his students from his influence. So, yeah. So, 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 so this, that's actually... Uh, that uh, uh, it's actually strategizing, strategizing in order to sustain and then to to be regenerative. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, also to add, and then uh, actually, what Ruang Rupa uh, with with when we make this uh, like cor corporate legal or something? Yeah, corporate legal is th this is not something new in 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 uh, uh, I mean what we did is not something new because uh, previously there's also uh, actually one of the collective that now joining in uh, with us in Good School Ecosystem uh, called Serum. They're the one who earlier uh, 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 do with this. They have this uh, 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 legal like corporate legal as their. Uh, 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 main income to sustain their practice in their collective, uh, their focus in art handling. So and they're quite uh, uh, very uh, professional art handling in in Jakarta or Indonesia. So uh, that's also kind of like inspiring us to why don't we have also our our legal uh, beside because. If we only have our like NGO uh, or uh, foundation legal, is have many uh, uh, limited things that we can do. But then we also want to uh, uh, experiment with what uh, other other uh, uh, potency that we can we can uh, uh, use, for example. And then that's why we 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 join with other uh, uh, collective, and we also decide to have this. Uh, 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 Corporate legal or, or, or business legal to to use this as one of the uh, the the to generate income then to sustain our practice as well. And also to answer about that, what is going to be after Documenta? Because uh, it's another level, it's another context, and it's another. Uh, actually, uh, <coughs> uh, we've been discussing what we always call beyond Documenta, beyond hundred days, because Lumbung is a matter of sustain. 
So uh, that's also a challenge for us. That's also a challenge for anyone, anyone in the Lumbung process, anyone who's been part of the process, that uh, let's question ourselves after, are we doing this Lumbung only for the sake of documenta? For us in Ruang Rupa, no. We want to sustain, uh, we want to experiment how, how it's going to be uh, in the future. Uh, how how uh, we want to experiment uh, we want to experiment all the metaphors that we've been we've been discussing uh, both on paper uh, during the process uh, when we discuss and so on and so on uh, uh, and uh, when it comes to internationalization uh, that, that's also uh, that's also Actually, in, uh, maybe some of you already know also that in 2016 we work uh, as a do curator for Sonsbeck uh, in our name, Netherlands, and and uh, uh, and some some of our uh, interaction with the international scenes they were started I think from 2002 when we were invited to Kwangju Biennale, and then uh, later after that there was Faru Island project where we also where we also participated. Uh, Istanbul Biennale, Sao Paulo Biennale, uh, Asia Pacific Triennale, Asia Triennale Manchester, and all those events. That that and that's also like a, that's also like a, uh, we don't want to call we don't want to call it as a training, but we call it as a as a as a room to experience, as a room as a as a as a as a time as a space to experience uh, what is called internationalis interna internationalization internationalized. Because also in the past time, our, our like uh, all, 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 in Indonesia was actually uh, started by people who uh, who also uh, when when somewhere else uh, in terms of different country and then uh, thinking about the independence of uh, this the, the, this this entity called Indonesia that was colonized by the Dutch and uh, uh, and. Uh, and we, we yeah we we're also we we also learn a lot from this uh, that in terms of uh, uh, internationalized it's not a historical it's not a, 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 a historical in our context but it's already in there as part of our history yeah mm -hmm. uh, yeah maybe also uh, uh, in the in the in the process of documenta fifteen when we <clears throat> when we uh, like invite the, the Lumu members or artists, uh, the first thing that we also uh, uh, explain is that, or we, we, we imagine is this is not something that just finished or not just only for the 100 days, but also something that can have impact in their ecosystem on their local. So that's kind of like, uh, w w maybe we cannot just, uh, uh, and also we have this many uh, collective projects during the, the Documenta 15, the, the process. And this one is something that we imagine that can uh, uh, in the uh, stay in the long term. So yeah. mm -hmm. that's that's maybe uh, we cannot just, we, we, we actually we don't know what, what will happen after the Documenta 15, but hopefully with this collaborative project and also with this, uh, 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 like the process right now with the artists or Lumbung members that they do for the for in the context of documenta, but it's can uh, it's still relate with the, their local, so it's still, you know, like uh, uh, can 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 sustain until the documenta 15s uh, ends. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. yeah. Sorry, Thomas. If you talk yes. to you. No. Maybe Martin. Martin. Maybe. I, I think we have only time now for. Uh, one uh, comment or one question, or because uh, we have to leave soon. That's right. And uh, there are some drinks outside. Thomas, okay. Yes, ask a question, please. A question for Thomas. I think, yeah, or at least I, I, I heard something. <laughs> yeah, so quickly, uh, two words, planetary and locality. Uh, yeah, I can answer me quickly around that. So um, I think at least in my uh, field of research, which is looking at, you know, uh, ecosystems and 
ecology <coughs> in different ways. Uh, there is this idea of planetary sensing, which is you know um, that we have the technology uh, to basically uh, gather information, which is not you know uh, depending on a certain uh, nation or a certain you know country, which is information which comes from you know sensors which are all around uh, the world, and this information can help us to take decisions uh, then locally in terms of what should be done for climate or biodiversity or other pressing issue, food production. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, and then the other thing, which is, uh, I think it's also, uh, because my, my point is not to be like a super techno optimist and to say that we should surrender all, you know, <laughs> all decisions to uh, sensors, but um, uh, there are projects that go in that direction. For example, a project called Terra Zero, which is about self-managed forest, um, which is quite interesting if you want to look into it. But uh, so this idea of maybe how do we keep, you know, the, the local knowledge of people who are living in, in, in specific regions. And uh, as I was preparing for this, I asked uh, Vikram, one of our students, to help me to look at projects which were similar to the Swamp Pavilion that I was mentioning, this sort of school around swamps, uh, international, and if he could find other things, but maybe from his kind of um, like uh, where he comes from, which is India and stuff. And so he was showing me this project, which is uh, um, this school Hills. It's like a school which is basically uh, based around this uh, glacier that's been started by an Indian um, inventor. Uh, unfortunately, I forgot his name, but I can find it. But basically, his idea is really to, uh, he was realizing that all the knowledge was being lost from people from that area that were going to universities. Um, and so this sort of local vernacular knowledge about, you know, how to deal with nature um, <coughs> was being lost. So he wanted to start a school that would, you know, gather this. But, for example, if we were to start a school in Iceland revolving around glacier, then I think our uh, interlocutors would be probably, you know, people from that school in Tibet. Uh, so I think this sort of other ways of connecting, you know, um, locality uh, and, and the planetary um, is possible, I hope. Yeah, so that's it. Yeah. Yeah, can, can I, can I uh, add to that? Uh, could you talk a little bit more about your understanding of um, uh, uh, citizen science and the possible relationship between the, the eco practices you're engaged with and socially engaged are? That is, what kind of contribution can citizen science make to socially engaged are? Perhaps with, with reference to some of... Um, the issues that one of our children, sort of Santos, has been engaging with yeah. epistemologies of the South. Yeah. So um, we yeah we didn't really get to that uh, in the in the presentation, but um, I think uh, yeah it's one question is because citizen science is basically. Um, help to get you know to gather and Jennifer Gabris who's uh, uh, from Goldsmith has been researching uh, this topic a lot um, and so how can this go beyond you know um, being just a gathering of data you know only distributed through the technologies that people have and how can that sort of promote a different you know awareness of the environment and maybe different practices I think that's the question and I mean art in, in that in that sense I think can um, can also be a medium or a a form of uh, um, where the material gathered by uh, this uh, citizen science can 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 take a new uh, new forms and and have more impact, if you like. So uh, that's one thing I'm also wondering: like, how can I work with citizen science as a designer artist, and how can this material be more than you know the gathering of this scientific data? Um, and particularly, um, I don't know. I'm at the moment quite interested in uh, things like sonification of data. That is a very small, like the form of the da what the data takes, um, because apparently uh, we have a really interesting uh, research lab at the Aston University of the Art called Intelligent Instruments. And I invited the, the uh, Thor, who's running this lab, to, to come and talk about data sonification. And uh, he told us that there were studies that were made that said that, um, for example, if you hear like the sonification of um, natural phenomenon, like that he was working on earthquakes particularly, um, you would sort of understand it, of understand it in a different way than if you were looking at a graph, you know, about... Because our visual sense, you know, we are used so much to... Um, to seeing graphs and also, you know, seeing disaster images and seeing all this. So, uh, in that sense, sonification of data maybe 
getting data from citizen science uh, can have a more powerful uh, effect on people and you also remember it more uh, if you hear something um, so anyway that was just maybe one technical point of view but this idea of just sonifying you know uh, things from uh, natural disasters for example um, uh, could have more effects and listening to it than you know reading it so that's just just some mm -hmm. points there yeah okay thank you uh, well Jon Hey. Okay, so, so, so I, I mean, thank you for uh, inviting me to this panel. At first, I thought it was absolutely um, uh, thrilling <laughs> to uh, be here and uh, very interesting to. Uh, hmm? All right, thank you yes. very much, Asa, for uh, moderating this panel. This has been a very interesting discussion, and of course, as the whole day. So I hope we can continue the discussion over refreshments outside. We have some time for that as well. And yet, yeah, I just want to thank everyone. Let's give ourselves an applause. One thing. I, al I always forget the most important thing. So uh, I wanted to make one announcement before we quit. We have actually uh, an event on socially engaged art at Hapnarhuset on Thursday with uh, Greg Cholet. So those of you who will still be here on Thursday, it's Thursday evening at 8 o'clock in Hapnarhuset, downtown Reykjavik. Okay.